Introduction to Saxons in England, a History of the English Commonwealth to the Period of the Norman Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Bjornsson. Saxons in England, a History of the English Commonwealth to the Period of the Norman Conquest, by John Mitchell Kemble. Dedication, title page, preface, new preface to the revised edition. The Saxons in England, a history of the English Commonwealth to the period of the Norman Conquest, by John Mitchell Kemble, Master of Arts, Fellow of College of Physicians and Surgeons. A new edition, revised by Walter de Grey Birch, Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. To the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, this history of the principles which have given her empire its preeminence among the nations of Europe is, with her gracious permission, inscribed by the most humble and devoted of her servants. Preface The following pages contain an account of the principles upon which the public and potential life of our Anglo-Saxon forefathers was based and of the institutions in which those principles were most clearly manifested. The subject is a grave and solemn one. It is the history of the childhood of our own age, the explanation of its manhood. On every side of us thrones totter, and the deep foundations of society are convulsed. Shot and shell sweep the streets of capitals which have long been pointed out as the chosen abodes of order. Cavalry and bayonets cannot control populations whose loyalty has become a proverb here, whose peace has been made a reproach to our own miscalled disquiet. Yet the exalted lady who wields the scepter of these realms sits safe upon her throne, and fearless in the holy circle of her domestic happiness, secure in the affections of a people whose institutions have given to them all the blessings of an equal law. Those institutions they have inherited from a period so distant as to excite our admiration, and have preserved amidst all vicissitudes with an enlightened will that must command our gratitude. And with the blessing of the Almighty, they will long continue to preserve them, for our customs are founded upon right and justice, and are maintained in a subjection to his will who hath the hearts of nations as well as of kings in his rule and governance. It cannot be without advantage for us to learn how a state so favored as our own has set about the great work of constitution, and solved the problem of uniting the completest obedience to the law with the greatest amount of individual freedom. But in the long and checkered history of our state, there are many distinguishable periods, some more and some less well known to us. Among those with which we are least familiar is the oldest period. It seems, therefore, the duty of those whose studies have given them a mastery over its details to place them as clearly as they can be before the eyes of their fellow citizens. There have never been wanting men who enjoyed a distant insight into the value of our earliest constitutional history. From the days of Spellman and Selden and Twiston, even to our own, this country has seen an unbroken succession of laborious thinkers who, careless of self-sacrifice, have devoted themselves to record the facts which were to be recovered from the darkness of the past, and to connect them with the progress of our political and municipal laws. But peculiar advantages over these men, to whom this country owes a large debt of gratitude, are now enjoyed by ourselves. It is only within eight years that the ancient laws and ecclesiastical institutes of the Anglo-Saxons have been made fully accessible to us. Within nine years only, upwards of 1,400 documents containing the grants of kings and bishops, the settlements of private persons, the conventions of landlords and tenants, the technical forms of judicial proceedings, have been placed in our hands. And to this last quarter of a century has it been given to attain a mastery never before attained over the language which our Anglo-Saxon ancestors spoke. To us, therefore, it more particularly belongs to perform the duty of illustrating that period whose records are furnished to us so much more abundantly than they were to our predecessors. And it seemed to me that this duty was especially imposed upon him whom circumstances had made most familiar with the charters of the Anglo-Saxons. 
the history of our earliest institutions has come down to us in a fragmentary form. In a similar way has it here been treated. In chapters, or rather essays, devoted to each particular principle or group of facts. But throughout these fragments a system is distinctly discernible. Accordingly, the chapters will be found also to follow a systematic plan. It is my intention, at a future period, to lay before my countrymen the continuation of this history, embracing the laws of descent and purchase, the laws of contracts, the forms of judicial process, the family relations, and the social condition of the Saxons as to agriculture, commerce, art, science, and literature. I believe these things to be worthy of investigation, from their bearing upon the times in which we live, much more than from any antiquarian value they may be supposed to possess. We have a share in the past, and the past yet works in us, nor can a patriotic citizen better serve his country than by devoting his energies and his time to record that which is great and glorious in her history, for the admiration and instruction of her neighbors. J. M. K. London, December 2nd, 1848. Preface to the New Edition The original edition of this monumental work, having for a long time been out of print and of enhanced value, a great demand has arisen for the issue of a new edition, and the welcome opportunity of amending a number of oversights and typographical errors, and of verifying a large number of references, has not been neglected. The book itself is of so standard a character, and was so well digested in the first place, that no apology is needed for its republication now, more than a quarter of a century after its first appearance. The principles laid down, the deductions gathered from the array of recorded facts and examples, are as true and incontrovertible today as they ever were. The work, therefore, does not labor under the disadvantage of becoming obsolete, inasmuch as the researches which have since been made in this branch of literary and historical inquiry have not tended to weaken or destroy, but rather to support and strengthen the arguments applied by the author to the gradual unfolding of his theories of the growth and consolidation of the Anglo-Saxon commonwealth and the royal authority in England. It is worthy of remembrance that one of the chief authorities for the views advanced in this history is the celebrated Codex Diplomaticus, the printing of which occupied nine years of the author's life. The re-editing of that great work, under new arrangement, with collations and incorporation of a large quantity of newly found material, has now so clearly become a necessity that steps should be taken to republish the enormous collection of documents relating to Anglo-Saxon times and Anglo-Saxon history. No one can read the summary of Kemble's investigations, which is contained in the concluding chapter to the first volume, without feeling bound to acknowledge that its pages contain the heartfelt convictions of one who has spared no pains to mature his own knowledge of the inner springs which actuated the conduct of our forefathers' lives and advanced their culture, nor failed in his endeavor to impart to his readers a correct view of these important elements to our own manners and customs. In Kimball's own words, the history of our childhood, the explanation of our manhood. W. de G. B. London, September 11, 1876 and of the introduction. Book One, Chapter One of Saxons in England, A History of the English Commonwealth to the Period of the Norman Conquest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Bjornsson. Saxons in England, A History of the English Commonwealth to the Period of the Norman Conquest, by John Mitchell Kemble. The Saxons in England, Book One, The Original Settlement of the Anglo-Saxon Commonwealth. Chapter One, Saxon and Welsh Traditions. Eleven centuries ago, an industrious and conscientious historian, desiring to give a record of the establishment of his forefathers in this island, could find no further or better account than this. About the year of Grace, 445 to 446, 
the British inhabitants of England, deserted by the Roman masters who had enervated while they protected them, and exposed to the ravages of Picts and Scots from the extreme and barbarous portions of the island, called in the assistance of heathen Saxons from the continent of Europe. The strangers faithfully performed their task and chastised the northern invaders, then, in scorn of the weakness of their employers, subjected them in turn to the yoke, and after various vicissitudes of fortune, established their own power upon the ruins of Roman and British civilization. The few details which had reached the historian taught that the strangers were under the guidance of two brothers, Hengist and Horse, that their armament was conveyed in three ships or keels, that it consisted of Jutes, Saxons, and Angles, that their successes stimulated similar adventures among their countrymen, and that in process of time their continued migrations were so large and numerous as to have reduced Anglia, their original home, to a desert. Such was the tale of the victorious Saxons in the 8th century. At a later period, the vanquished Britons found a melancholy satisfaction in adding details which might brand the career of their conquerors with a stain of disloyalty. According to these hostile authorities, treachery and fraud prepared and consolidated the Saxon triumph. The wiles of Hengist's beautiful daughter subdued the mind of the British ruler, a murderous violation of the rights of hospitality, which cut off the chieftains of the Britons at the very table of their hosts, delivered over the defenseless land to the barbarous invader, and the miraculous intervention of Germanus, the spells of Merlin and the prowess of Arthur, or the victorious career of Aurelius Ambrosius, although they delayed and in part avenged, yet could not prevent the downfall of their people. Meager indeed are the accounts which thus satisfied the most inquiring of our forefathers, Yet such as they are, they were received as the undoubted truth, and appealed to in later periods as the earliest authentic record of our race. The acuter criticism of an age less prone to believe, more skillful in the appreciation of evidence, and familiar with the fleeting forms of mythical and epical thought, sees in them only a confused mass of traditions borrowed from the most heterogeneous sources, compacted rudely and with little ingenuity, and in which the smallest possible amount of historical truth is involved in a great deal of fable. Yet the truth which such traditions do nevertheless contain yields to the alchemy of our days a golden harvest. If we cannot undoubtingly accept the details of such legends, they still point out to us at least the course which we must pursue to discover the elements of fact upon which the mythos and epos rest and guide us to the period and the locality where these took root and flourished. From times beyond the records of history, it is certain that continual changes were taking place in the position and condition of the various tribes that peopled the northern districts of Europe. Into this great basin the successive waves of Celtic, Teutonic, and Slavonic migrations were poured, and here, through hundreds of years, were probably reproduced convulsions terminated only by the great outbreak which the Germans call the wandering of the nations. For successive generations, the tribes, or even portions of tribes, may have moved from place to place as the necessities of their circumstances demanded. Names may have appeared and vanished altogether from the scene. Wars, seditions, conquests, the rise and fall of states, the solemn formation or dissolution of confederacies, may have filled the ages which intervened between the first settlement of the Teutons in Germany and their appearance in history as dangerous to the quiet of Rome. The heroic days may possibly preserve some shadowy traces of these events, but of all the changes in detail we know nothing. We argue only that nations possessing in so preeminent a degree as the Germans, the principles, the arts, and institutions of civilizations, must have passed through a long apprenticeship of action and suffering, and have learnt in the rough school of practice the wisdom they embodied in their lives. Possessing no written annals, and trusting to the poet the task of the historian, our forefathers have left but scanty records of their early condition. Nor did the superlicious or unsuspecting ignorance of Italy care to inquire into the mode of life and habits of the barbarians, 
until their strong arms threatened the civilization and the very existence of the empire itself. Then first, dimly through the twilight in which the sun of Rome was to set forever, loomed the colossus of the German race, gigantic, terrible, inexplicable. And the vague attempt to define its awful features came too late to be fully successful. In Tacitus, the city possessed indeed a thinker worthy of the exalted theme. But his sketch, though vigorous beyond expectation, is incomplete in many of the most material points. Yet this is the most detailed and fullest account which we possess, and nearly the only certain source of information till we arrive at the moment when the invading tribes in every portion of the empire entered upon their great task of reconstructing society from its foundations. Slowly, from point to point, and from time to time, Traces are recognized of powerful struggles, of national movements, of destructive revolutions. But the definite facts which emerge from the darkness of the first three centuries are rare and fragmentary. Let us confine our attention to that portion of the race which settled on our own shores. The testimony of contemporaneous history assures us that about the middle of the fifth century, a considerable movement took place among the tribes that inhabited the western coasts of Germany and the islands of the Baltic Sea. Pressed at home by the incursions of restless neighbors, and the urgency of increasing population, or yielding to the universal spirit of adventure, Angles, Saxons, and Frisians crossed a little-known and dangerous ocean to seek new settlements in adjacent lands. Familiar as we are with daring deeds of maritime enterprise, who have seen our flag float over every sea and flutter in every breeze that sweeps over the surface of the earth, we cannot contemplate without astonishment and admiration these hardy sailors swarming on every point, traversing every ocean, sweeping every estuary and bay, and landing on every shore which promised plunder or a temporary rest from their fatigues. The wealth of Gaul had already attracted fearful visitations, and the spoils of Roman cultivation had been displayed before the wandering borders of the Elba and Eider, the prize of past and incentive to future activity. Britain, fertile and defenseless, abounding in accumulations of a long career of peace, deserted by its ancient lords, unaccustomed to arms and accustomed to the yoke, at once invited attack and held out the prospect of a rich reward. And it is certain that at that period, there took place some extensive migration of Germans to the shores of England. The expeditions known to tradition as those of Hengist, Ali, Kissa, Kurdic, and Port may therefore have some foundation in fact, and around this meager nucleus of truth were grouped the legends which afterwards served to conceal the poverty and eke out the scanty stock of early history. But I do not think it at all probable that this was the earliest period at which the Germans formed settlements in England. It is natural to believe that for many centuries a considerable and active intercourse had prevailed between the southern and eastern shores of this island and the western districts of Gaul. The first landing of Julius Caesar was caused or justified by the assurance that his Gallic enemies recruited their armies and repaired their losses by the aid of their British kinsmen and allies and the merchants of the coast, who found a market in Britain, reluctantly furnished him with the information upon which the plan of his invasion was founded. When the fortune and the arms of Rome had prevailed over her ill-disciplined antagonists, and both continent and island were subject to the same all-embracing rule, it is highly probable that the ancient bonds were renewed, and that the most familiar intercourse continued to prevail. In the time of Strabo, the products of the island, corn, cattle, gold, silver, and iron, skins, slaves, and a large description of dog, were exported by the natives, no doubt principally to the neighboring coasts, and their commerce with these was sufficient to justify the imposition of an export and import duty. As early as the time of Nero, London, though not a colony, was remarkable as a mercantile station and in all human probability was the great mart of the Gauls. There cannot be the least doubt that an active communication was maintained throughout by the Celtic nations on the different sides of the channel, and similarly, as German tribes gradually advanced along the lines of the Elba, the Weser, 
the Meis, and the Rhine, occupying the countries which lie upon the banks of those rivers, and between them and the sea, it is reasonable to suppose that some offsets of their great migrations reached the opposite shores of England. As early as the second century, Chauki are mentioned among the inhabitants of the southeast of Ireland, and although we have only the name whereby to identify them with the great Saxon tribe, yet this deserves consideration when compared with the indisputably Celtic names of the surrounding races. The Coritavi, who occupied the present counties of Lincoln, Leicester, Rutland, Northampton, Nottingham, and Derby, were Germans, according to the Welsh tradition itself. And the next following name, Katja Vechlevoy, though not certainly German, bears a strong resemblance to many German formations. Without, however, laying more stress upon these facts than they will fairly warrant, let us proceed to other considerations which render it probable that a large admixture of German tribes was found in England long previous to the middle of the 5th century. It appears to me that the presence of Roman emperors recruiting the forces with which the throne of the world was to be disputed from among the hardiest populations of the continent must not only have led to the settlement of Teutonic families in this island, but also to the maintenance, on their part, of a steady intercourse with their kinsmen who remained behind. The military colony, moreover, which claimed to be settled upon good, arable land, formed the easiest and most advantageous mode of pensioning the Emirati, and many a successful Caesar may have felt that his own safety was better secured by portioning his German veterans in the fruitful valleys of England than by settling them as doubtful garrisons in Lombardy or Campania. The fertile fields which long before had merited the praises of the first Roman victor must have offered attractions enough to induce wandering Saxons and Angles to desert the marshes and islands of the Elba, and to call Frisian adventurers over from the sands and salt pools of their home. If in the middle of the fifth century Saxons had established regular settlements at Bayou, if even before this time the country about Granona bore the name of Lutus Saxonicum, we may easily believe that at still earlier periods the Saxons had found over the intervening ocean a way less dangerous and tedious than a march through the territories of jealous or hostile neighbors or even than a coasting voyage along barbarous shores defended by a yet more barbarous population. A northeast wind would almost without effort of their own have carried their ships from Helgoland, and the islands of the Elba, or from Silt and Romsey, to the Wash and the coast of Norfolk. There seems, then, every probability that bodies more or less numerous of coast Germans, perhaps actually of Saxons and Angles, had colonized the eastern shores of England long before the time generally assumed for their advent. The very exigencies of military service had rendered this island familiar to the nations of the continent. Batavi, under their own national chieftains, had earned a share of the Roman glory, and why not of the Roman land in Britain? The policy of the emperor Marcus Antonius, at the successful close of the Marcomannic War, had transplanted to Britain multitudes of Germans to serve at once as instruments of Roman power and as hostages for their countrymen on the frontier of the empire. The remnants of this once powerful confederation cannot but have left long and lasting traces of their settlement among us. Nor can it be considered at all improbable that Carousius, when in the year 287, he raised the standard of revolt in Britain, calculated upon the assistance of the Germans in this country, as well as that of their allies and brethren on the continent. Nineteen years later the death of Constantius delivered the dignity of Kaiser to his son Constantine. He was solemnly elected to that dignity in Britain, and among his supporters was Crocus, or as some read Ericus, an Alemannic king who had accompanied his father from Germany. Still later, under Valentinian, we find an auxiliary force of Alemanni serving with the Roman legions here. By chronological steps we have now approached the period at which was compiled the celebrated document entitled Notitia Utriusque Imperii. Even if we place this at the latest admissible date, 
it is still at least half a century earlier than the earliest date assigned to Hengist. Among the important officers of state mentioned therein as administering the affairs of this island is the Comus Litorius Saxonici Perpertanius, and his government, which extended from near the present site of Portsmouth to Wells in Norfolk, was supported by various civil and military establishments dispersed along the whole seaboard. The term Litus Saxonicum has been explained to mean rather the coast visited by or exposed to the ravages of the Saxons than the coast occupied by them. But against this loose system of philological and historical interpretation, I beg emphatically to protest. It seems to have arisen merely from the uncritical spirit in which the Saxon and Welsh traditions have been adopted as ascertained facts, and from the impossibility of reconciling the account of Beda with the natural sense of the entry in the Notitia. But there seems no reason whatever for adopting an exceptional rendering in this case, and as the Litus Saxonicum on the mainland was that district in which members of the Saxon Confederacy were settled, the Litus Saxonicum per Britannius unquestionably obtained its name from a similar circumstance. Thus far, the object of this rapid sketch has been to show the improbability of our earliest records being anything more than ill-understood and confused traditions, accepted without criticism by our first analysts, and to refute the opinion long entertained by our chroniclers, that the Germanic settlements in England really date from the middle of the 5th century. The results at which we have arrived are far from unimportant. Indeed, they seem to form the only possible basis upon which we can ground a consistent and intelligible account of the manner of the settlements themselves. And be it remembered that the evidence brought forward upon this point are the assertions of indifferent and impartial witnesses. Statesmen, soldiers, men of letters and philosophers, who merely recorded events of which they had full means of becoming cognizant, with no object in general save that of stating facts appertaining to the history of their empire. Moreover, the accounts they give are probable in themselves, and perfectly consistent with other well-ascertained facts of Roman history. Can the same praise be awarded to our own meager national traditions, or to the fuller, detailed, palpably uncritical assertions of our conquered neighbors? I confess that the more I examine this question, the more completely I am convinced that the received accounts of our migrations, our subsequent fortunes, and ultimate settlement are devoid of historical truth in every detail. It strikes the inquirer at once with suspicion, when he finds the tales supposed peculiar to his own race and to this island, shared by the Germanic populations of other lands, and with slight changes of locality or trifling variations of detail, recorded as authentic parts of their history. The readiest belief in fortuitous resemblances and coincidences gives way before a number of instances whose agreement defies all the calculation of chances. Thus, when we find Hengist and Horse approaching the coasts of Kent in three keels, and Ali effecting a landing in Sussex with the same number, we are reminded of the Gothic tradition which carries a migration of Ostrogoths, Visigoths, and Gepidae, also in three vessels, to the mouths of the Vistula, certainly a spot where we do not readily look for that occurrence to a trial calculation, which so peculiarly characterizes the modes of thought of the Kimri. The murder of the British chieftains by Hengist is told totidem verbis, by Wudukind and others, of the old Saxons in Thuringia. Geoffrey of Monmouth relates also how Hengist obtained from the Britons as much land as could be enclosed by an ox-hide. Then, cutting the hide into thongs, enclosed a much larger space than the granters intended, on which he erected Thong Castle, a tale too familiar to need illustration, and which runs throughout the mythos of many nations. Among the old Saxons, the tradition is in reality the same, though recorded with a slight variety of detail. In their story, a lap full of earth is purchased at a dear rate from a Thuringian. The companions of the Saxon jeer him for his imprudent bargain. But he sows the purchased earth over a large space of ground which he claims, and by the aid of his comrades ultimately rests from the Thuringians. 
to the traditional history of the tribes peculiarly belong the genealogies of their kings, to which it will be necessary to refer hereafter in a mythological point of view. For the present, it is enough that I call attention to the extraordinary tale of Offa, which occurs at an early stage of the Mercian table, among the progenitors of the Mercian kings. This story, as we find it in Matthew Paris's detailed account, coincides in the minutest particulars with a tale told by Saxo Grammaticus of a Danish prince bearing the same name. The form itself in which details, which profess to be authentic, have been preserved, ought to secure us from falling into error. They are romantic, not historical, and the romance has salient and characteristic points, not very reconcilable with the variety which marks the authentic records of fact. For example, the details of a long and doubtful struggle between the Saxons and the Britons are obviously based upon no solid foundation. The dates and the events are alike traditional, the usual and melancholy consolation of the vanquished. In proportion as we desert the older and apply to later sources of information, we do meet with successful wars, triumphant British chieftains, vanquished Saxons, heroes endowed with supernatural powers and blessed with supernatural luck. Gildas, Nennius, and Beda mention but a few contests, and even these of a doubtful and suspicious character. Geoffrey of Monmouth and gossipers of his class, on the contrary, are full of wondrous incidents by flood and field, of details calculated to flatter the pride or console the sorrows of Celtic auditors. The success which those who lived in or near the times described either pass over in modest silence or vaguely insinuate under sweeping generalities are impudently related by this fabler and his copyists with every richness of narration. According to him, the invaders are defeated in every part of the island, nay, even expelled from it. Army after army is destroyed, chieftain after chieftain slain, till he winds up his enormous tissue of fabrications with the defeat, the capture and execution of a hero whose very existence becomes problematical, when tested by the severe principles of historical criticism, and who, according to the strict theory of our times, can hardly be otherwise than enrolled among the gods through a godlike or half-godlike form. It is no doubt probable that the whole land was not subdued without some pains in different quarters, that here and there a courageous leader or a favorable position may have enabled the aborigines to obtain even temporary success over the invaders. The new immigrants were not likely to find land vacant for their occupation among their kinsmen, who had long been settled here, though well assured of their cooperation in any attempt to wrest new settlements from the British. But no authentic record remains of the slow and gradual progress that would have attended the conquest of a brave and united people, nor is any such consistent with the accounts the British authors have left of the disorganized and disarmed condition of the population. A skirmish, carried on by very small numbers on either side, seems generally to have decided the fate of the campaign. Steadily, from east to west, from south to north, the sharp axes and long swords of the Teutons hewed their way. Wherever opposition was offered, it ended in the retreat of the aborigines to the mountains. Fortresses whence it was impossible to dislodge them, and from which they sometimes descended to attempt a hopeless effort for the liberty of their country or revenge upon their oppressors. The ruder or more generous of their number may have preferred exile and the chances of emigration to subjection at home, but the mass of the people, accustomed to Roman rule or the oppression of native princes, probably suffered little by a change of masters and did little to avoid it. At even a later period, an indignant bard could pour out his patriotic reproaches upon the Loigrians, who had condescended to become Saxons. We learn that at first the condition of the British under the German rule was fair and easy, and only rendered harsher in punishment of their unsuccessful attempts at rebellion. And the laws of Ini, a West Saxon king, show that in the territories subject to his rule, and bordering upon the yet British lands, the Welshmen occupied the place of Periochian, rather than a helot. Nothing, in fact, is more common or less true than the exaggerated account of total exterminations and miserable oppressions in the traditional literature of conquered nations, and we may very safely appeal even to the personal appearance of the peasantry in many parts of England 
as evidence how much Celtic blood was permitted to subsist and even to mingle with that of the ruling Germans. While the signatures to very early charters supply us with names assuredly not Teutonic, and therefore probably borne by persons of Celtic race, occupying positions of dignity at the courts of Anglo-Saxon kings. While the signatures to very early charters supply us with the names assuredly not Teutonic, and therefore probably borne by persons of Celtic race, occupying positions of dignity at the courts of Anglo-Saxon kings. From what has proceeded, it will be inferred that I look upon the genuine details of the German conquests in England as irrevocably lost to us. From what has proceeded, it will be inferred that I look upon the genuine details of the German conquests in England as irrevocably lost to us. So extraordinary a success as the conquest of this island by bands of bold adventurers from the continent, whose cognate tribes had already come into fatal collision with not only the Gallic provincials, but even the levies of the city itself, could hardly have passed unnoticed by the historians of the empire. We have seen, however, that only Prosper Tyro and Procopius noticed this great event, and that too in terms which by no means necessarily imply a state of things consistent with the received accounts. The former only says indefinitely that about 441, Britain was finally reduced under the Saxon power, while Procopius clearly shows how very imperfect, indeed fabulous, an account he had received. Could we trust the accuracy and critical spirit of this writer, whom no less a man than Gibbon has condescended to call the gravest historian of his time, we might indeed imagine that we had recovered one fact of our earliest history, which brought with it all the attractions of romance. An Angle princess had been betrothed to Radiger, prince of the Varni, a Teutonic tribe whose seats are subsequently described to have been about the shores of the northern ocean and upon the Rhine, by which alone they were separated from the Franks. Tempted, however, partly by motives of policy, partly perhaps by maxims of heathendom, he deserted his promised bride and offered his hand to Theodichild, the widow of his father and sister of the Austrasian Theodbert. Like the epic heroine Brynhildr, the deserted lady was not disposed to pass over the affront thus offered to her charms. With an immense armament she sailed for the mouth of the Rhine. A victory placed the faithless bridegroom a prisoner in her power. But desire of revenge gave place to softer emotions, and the triumphant princess was content to dismiss her rival and compel her repentant suitor to perform his engagement. To deny all historical foundation to this tale would perhaps be carrying skepticism to an unreasonable extent. Yet the most superficial examination proves that in all its details, at least, it is devoid of accuracy. The period during which the events described must be placed is between the years 534 and 547, and it is very certain that the Varni were not settled at that time where Procopius has placed them, on that locality we can only look for Saxons. It is hardly necessary to say that a fleet of 400 ships and an army of 100,000 angles led by a woman are not data upon which we could implicitly rely in calculating either the political or military power of any English principality at the commencement of the 6th century, or that ships capable of carrying 250 men each had hardly been launched at that time from any port in England. Still, I am not altogether disposed to deny the possibility of predatory expeditions from the more settled parts of the island adjoining the eastern coasts. Gregory of Tours tells us that about the same time as that assigned to this angle expedition, Theodoric the Frank, assisted by Suaves, Saxons, and even Bavarians, cruelly devastated the territory of the Thuringians, and although it would be far more natural to seek these Saxons in their old settlements upon the continent, we have the authority of Rudolf von Mengenhardt that they were in fact inhabitants of this island. But if such difficulties exist in dealing with the events of periods which are within the ascertained limits of our chronological system, and which have received the illustration of contemporary history, what shall we say of those where of the time, nay, even the locality is unknown? What account shall we render of those occurrences which exist for us only in the confused forms given to them by successive ages, some mischievously determined to reduce the abnormal to rule, the extraordinary to order, as measured by their narrow scheme of analogy. 
Is it not obvious that to seek for historic truth in such traditions is to be guilty of violating every principle of historic logic? Such was the course pursued by our early chroniclers, but it is not one that we can be justified in repeating. In their view, no doubt, the annals of the several Saxon kingdoms did supply points of definite information, but we are now able to take the measure of their credulity and to apply severe canons of criticism to the facts themselves which they believed and recorded. If it was the tendency and duty of their age to deliver to us the history that they found, it is the tendency and duty of ours to inquire upon what foundation that history rests, and what amount of authority it may justly claim. The little that Beda could collect at the beginning of the 8th century formed the basis of all the subsequent reports. Though not entirely free from the prejudices of his time, and yielding ready faith to tales which his frame of mind disposed him willingly to credit, he seems to have bestowed some pains upon the investigation and critical appreciation of the materials he collected. But the limits of the object he had proposed to himself, vis-à-vis -vis the ecclesiastical history of the island, not only imposed upon him the necessity of commencing his detailed narrative at a comparatively late period, but led him to reject much that may have been well known to him of our secular history. The deeds of pagan and barbarous chieftains offered little to attract his attention or command his sympathies. Indeed were little likely to be objects of interest to those from whom his own information was generally derived. Beda's account, copied and recopied both at home and abroad, was swelled by a few vague data from the regnal annals of the kings. These were probably increased by a few traditions, ill understood and ill applied, which belonged exclusively to the epical or mythological cycles of our own several tribes and races, and the cognate families of the continent. And finally the whole was elaborated into a mass of inconsistent fables, on the admission of Kimrick or Armorican tales by Norman writers, who for the most part felt as little interest in the fate of the Briton as the Saxon, and were as little able to appreciate the genuine history of the one as of the other race. Thus Woden, Beldeg, Geit, Schild, Schaef, and Beowa gradually found their way into the royal genealogies. One by one, Brutus, Aurelius, Ambrosius, Uther Pendragon, and Arthur, Hengist, Horse, and Vortigern, all became numbered among historical personages and from heroes of respective epic poems sunk down into kings and warriors who lived and fought and died upon the soil of England. We are ignorant what Fosti or Mode even of reckoning the revolutions of seasons prevailed in England, previous to the introduction of Christianity. We know not how any event before the year 600 was recorded, or to what period the memory of man extended. There may have been rare annals, there may have been poems, if such there were, they have perished and have left no trace behind, unless we are to attribute to them such scanty notices as the Saxon chronicle adds to Beda's account. From such sources, however, little could have been gained of accurate information either as to the real internal state, the domestic progress, or development of a people. The dry, bare entries of the chronicles in historical periods may supply the means of judging what sort of annals were likely to exist before the general introduction of the Roman alphabet and parchment, while in all probability runes supplied the place of letters, and stones, or the beechwood from which their name is derived, of books. Again, the traditions embodied in the epic are preeminently those of kings and princes. They are heroical, devoted to celebrate the divine or half-divine founders of a race, the fortunes of their warlike descendants, the manners and mode of life of military adventurers, not the obscure progress, household peace, and orderly habits of the humble husbandman. They are full of feasts and fighting, shining arms and golden goblets. The gods mingle among men, almost their equals, share in the same pursuits, are animated by the same passions of love and jealousy and hatred, or, blending the divine with the mortal nature, become the founders of races kingly because derived from divinity itself. But one race knows little of another or its traditions, and cares as little for them. Alliances or wars alone bring them in contact with one another, and the terms of intercourse between the races will for the most part determine the character under which foreign heroes shall be admitted into the national epos, or whether they shall be admitted at all. All history, then, 
which is founded in any degree upon epical tradition, and national history is usually more or less so founded, must be to that extent imperfect, if not inaccurate. Only when corrected by the written references of contemporaneous authors can we assign any certainty to its records. Let us apply these observations to the early events of Saxon history. Of Kent, indeed, we have the vague and uncertain notices which I have mentioned. Even more vague and uncertain are those of Sussex and Wessex. Of the former, we learn that in the year 477, Ali, with three sons, Caiman, Ulensing, and Kissa, landed in Sussex, that in the year 485 they defeated the Welsh, and that in 491 they destroyed the population of Andorida. Not another word is there about Sussex, before the arrival of Augustine, except a late assertion of the military preeminence of Ali among the Saxon chieftains. The events of Wessex are somewhat better detailed. We learn that in 495 two nobles, Cerdic and Kinnerik, came to England and landed at Curtisy's Ora, where on the same day they fought a battle. That in 501 they were followed by a noble named Port, who with his two sons, Beda and Magua, made a forcible landing at Portsmouth, and that in 508 they gained a great battle over a British king, whom they slew together with 5,000 of his people. In 514, Stuff and Vitgar, their nephews, brought them a reinforcement of three ships. In 519, they again defeated the Britons and established the kingdom of Wessex. In 527, a new victory is recorded. In 530, the Isle of Wight was subdued and given to Witgar. And in 534, Curdic died, and was succeeded by Kinderic, who reigned 26 years. In 544, Witgar died. A victory of Kinderic in 552 and 556, and Cullen's accession to the throne of Wessex are next recorded. Wars of the West Saxon kings are noted in 568, 571, 577, 584. From 590 to 595, a king of that race named Keol is mentioned. In 591, we learn the expulsion of Keolin from power. In 593, the deaths of Keolin, Quichelm, and Crida are mentioned. And in 597, the year of Augustine's arrival, we learn that Keolf ascended the throne of Wessex. Meager as these details are, they far exceed what is related of Northumberland, Essex, or East Anglia. In 547, we are told that Ida began to reign in the first of these kingdoms, and that he was succeeded in 560 by Ali, that after a reign of thirty years, he died in 588 and was succeeded by Ethelric, who again, in 593, was succeeded by Ethelfrid. This is all we learned of Northumbria, of Mercia, Essex, East Anglia, and the innumerable kingdoms that must have been comprised under these general appellations, we hear not a single word. If this be all that we can now recover of events, a great number of which must have fallen within the lives of those to whom Augustine preached, what credit shall we give to the inconsistent accounts of earlier nations? How shall we supply the almost total want of information respecting the first settlements? What explanation have we to give of the alliance between Utes, Angles, and Saxons which preceded the invasions of England? What knowledge will these records supply of the real number and quality of the chieftains, the language and blood of the populations who gradually spread themselves from the Atlantic to the Frith of Forth, of the remains of Roman cultivation, or the amount of British power with which they had to contend, of the vicissitudes of good and evil fortune which visited the independent kingdoms, before they were swallowed up in kingdoms of the Heptarchy, or the extent of the influence which they retained after that event. On all these several points we are left entirely in the dark, and yet these are facts which it most imports us to know, if we would comprehend the growth of a society which endured for at least seven hundred years in England, and formed the foundation of that in which we live. Loppenberg has devoted several pages of his elaborate history to an investigation of the Kentish legends, with a view to demonstrate their traditional, that is, unhistorical, character. He has shown that the best authorities are inconsistent with one another, and with themselves, 
in assigning the period of Hengist's arrival in England. Carefully comparing the dates of the leading events, as given from the soundest sources, he has proved beyond a doubt that all these periods are calculated upon a mythical number eight, whose multiples recur in every year assigned. Thus the periods of twenty-four, sixteen, eight, and particularly forty years meet us at every turn, and a somewhat similar tendency may, I think, be observed in the earlier dates of West Saxon history cited in a preceding page. It is also very probable that the early genealogies of the various Anglo-Saxon kings were arranged in series of eight names, including always the great name of Woden. The result of all these inquiries is to guard against plausible details which can only mislead us. If we endeavor to destroy the credit of traditions which have long existed, it is only to put something in their place, inconsistent with them, but of more value. To reduce them to what they really are, lest their authority should render the truth more obscure, and its pursuit more difficult than is necessary, but to use them wherever they seem capable of guiding our research, and are not irreconcilable with our other conclusions. Far less in the fabulous records adopted by historians, than in the divisions of the land itself, according to the populations that occupied it, and the rank of their several members, must the truth be sought. The names of the tribes and families have survived in the localities where they settled, while their peculiar forms of customary laws have become, as it were, melted together into one general system. And the national legends which each of them most probably possessed have either perished altogether, or are now to be traced only in proper names which fill up the genealogies of the royal families. To these local names I shall return hereafter. They will furnish a strong confirmation of what has been advanced in this chapter as to the probability of an early and wide dispersion of Teutonic settlers in Britain. End of chapter 1「Book 1, Chapter 2 of the Saxons in England by John Mitchell Kemble this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2. The Mark All that we learn of the original principle of settlement, prevalent either in England or on the continent of Europe, among the nations of Germanic blood, rests upon two main foundations. First, the possession of land. Second, the distinction of rank and the public law of every Teutonic tribe implies the dependence of one upon the other principle, to a greater or less extent. Even as he who is not free can at first hold no land within the limits of the community, so is he who holds no land therein not fully free, whatever his personal rank or character may be. Thus far the Teutonic settler differs but little from the ancient Spartiate or the comrade of Romulus. The particular considerations which arise from the contemplation of these principles in their progressive development will find their place in the several chapters of this book. It deals with land held in community and severality, with the nature and accidents of tenure, with the distinction and privileges of the various classes of citizens, the free, the noble, and the serf, and with the institutions by which a mutual guarantee of life, honor, and peaceful possession was attempted to be secured among the Anglo-Saxons. These are the incunabula, first principles and rudiments of the English law, and in these it approaches and assimilates to the system which the German conquerors introduced into every state which they founded upon the ruins of the Roman power. As land may be held by many men in common, or by several households under settled conditions, it is expected to examine separately the nature and character of these tenures, and first to inquire into the forms of possession in common, for upon this depends the political being of the state, its constitutional law, and its relative position towards other states. Among the Anglo-Saxons, land so held in common was designated by the names Mark, and Gaw, or Shire. The smallest and simplest of these common divisions is that which we technically call a Mark or March, Merch. A word less frequent in the Anglo-Saxon than the German muniments, only because the system founded upon what it represents yielded in England earlier than in Germany to extraneous influences. 
This is the first general division, the next in order to the private estates or allods of the marksmen. As its name denotes, it is something marked out or defined, having settled boundaries, something serving as a sign to others and distinguished by signs. It is a plot of land on which a greater or lesser number of free men have settled for purposes of cultivation and for the sake of mutual profit and protection, and it comprises a portion both of arable land and pasture, in proportion to the numbers that enjoy its produce. However far we may pursue our researches into the early record of our forefathers, we cannot discover a period at which this organization was unknown. Whatever may have been the original condition of the German tribes, tradition and history alike represent them to us as living partly by agriculture, partly by the pasturing of cattle. They had long emerged from the state of wandering herdsmen, hunters, or fishers, when they first attracted the notice and disputed or repelled the power of Rome. The peculiar tendencies of various tribes may have introduced peculiar modes of placing or constructing their habitations, but of no German population is it stated that they dwelt in tents like the Arab, in wagons like the Scythian, or in earth-dug caverns like the troglodytes of Wallachia. The same authority that tells of some who lived alone as the hillside or the fresh spring pleased them notices the villages, the houses, and even the fortresses of others. Without commerce, means of extended communication, or peaceful neighbors, the Germans cannot have cultivated their fields for the service of strangers. They must have been consumers, as they certainly were raisers of bread corn. Early documents of the Anglo-Saxons prove that considerable quantities of wheat were devoted to this purpose. Even the serfs and domestic servants were entitled to an allowance of bread in addition to the supply of flesh and the large quantities of ale and beer which we find enumerated among the dues payable from the land or in gifts to religious establishments presume a very copious supply of cereals for the purpose of malting. But it is also certain that our forefathers depended very materially for subsistence upon the herds of oxen, sheep, and especially swine, which they could feed upon the enclosed meadows or in the wilds of oak and beech which covered a large proportion of the land. From the moment, in short, when we first learn anything of their domestic condition, all the German tribes appear to be settled upon arable land, surrounded with forest pastures, and having some kind of property in both. Kaiser, it is true, denies that agriculture was much cultivated among the Germans, or that property in the arable land was permitted to be permanent, and although it seems impolitic to limit the efforts of industry, by diminishing its reward, it is yet conceivable that under peculiar circumstances, a warlike confederation might overlook this obvious truth in their dread of the enervating influences of property and a settled life. There may have been difficulty in making a new yearly division of land, which to our prejudices seems almost impossible. Yet the Arab of Iran claims only the produce of the seed he has sown. The proprietor in the Jagher district of Madras changes his lands from year to year. The tribes of the Afghans submit to a new distribution even after a ten years' possession has endeared the fields to the cultivator. Diodorus tells us that the Vicaeans changed their lands yearly and divided the produce, and Strabo attributed a similar custom to one tribe at least of the Illyrian Dalmatians after a period of seven. But so deeply does the possession of land enter into the principle of all the Teutonic institutions that I cannot bring myself to believe in the accuracy of Kaiser's statement. Like his previous rash and most unfounded assertion respecting the German gods, this may rest only upon the incorrect information of Gallic provincials. At the utmost it can be applied only to the Suevi and their warlike allies, if it be not even intended to be confined to the predatory bands of Ariovistus, encamped among the defeated yet hostile Sequani. The equally well-known passage of Tacitus, Arva Peranos Mutant, et Superest Agur, may be most safely rendered as applying to the common mode of culture. They change the arable from year to year, and there is land to spare. That is, for commons and pasture. But it does not amount to a proof that settled property in land was not a part of the Teutonic scheme. It applies no more than this, that within the mark which was the property of all, what was this year one man's corn land, might the next be another man's fallow a process very intelligible to those who know anything of the system of cultivation yet prevalent in parts of Germany, or have ever had any interest in what we call Lamas Meadows. Zeus, whose admirable work is indispensable to the student of Teutonic antiquity, brings together various passages to show that at some early period, 
the account given by Kaiser may have conveyed a just description of the mode of life in Germany. He represents its inhabitants to himself as something between a settled and an unsettled people. What they may have been in periods previous to the dawn of authentic history, it is impossible to say. But all that we really know of them not only implies a much more advanced state of civilization, but the long continuance and tradition of such a state. We cannot admit the validity of Zeus's reckoning, or escape from the conviction that it mainly results from a desire to establish his etymology of the names borne by the several confederations, and which requires the hypothesis of wandering and unsettled tribes. The word mark has a legal as well as a territorial meaning. It is not only a space of land, such as has been described, but a member of a state also, in which last sense it represents those who dwell upon the land, in relation to their privileges and rights, both as respects themselves and others. But the word, as applied even to the territory, has a twofold meaning. It is, properly speaking, employed to denote not only the whole district occupied by one small community, but more especially those forests and wastes by which the arable is enclosed, and which separates the possessions of one tribe from those of another. The mark, or boundary pasture land, and the cultivated space which it surrounds, and which is portioned out to the several members of the community, are inseparable. However different the nature of the property which can be had in them, they are in fact one whole. Taken together, they make up the whole territorial possession of the original cognatio, kin or tribe. The plowed lands and meadows are guarded by the mark, and the cultivator ekes out a subsistence which could hardly be wrung from the small plot he calls his own, by the flesh and other produce of beasts, which his sons, his dependents, or his serfs massed for him in the outlying forests. Let us first take into consideration the mark in its restricted and proper sense of a boundary. Its most general characteristic is that it should not be distributed in arable, but remain in heath, forest, fen, and pasture. In it, the markmen, called in Germany Markgenossen, and perhaps by the Anglo-Saxons Merchianiatus, had commonable rights. But there could be no private estate in it, no heed or hrat, no kiros or heredium. Even if under peculiar circumstances, any markman obtained a right to assart or clear a portion of the forest, the portion so subjected to the immediate law of property ceased to be mark. It was undoubtedly under the protection of the gods, and it is probable that within its woods were those sacred shades especially consecrated to the habitation and service of the deity. If the nature of an early Teutonic settlement, which has nothing in common with the deity, be duly considered, there will appear an obvious necessity for the existence of a mark, and for its being maintained inviolate. Every community, not sheltered by walls or the still firmer defenses of public law, must have one, to separate it from neighbors and protect it from rivals. It is like the outer pulp that surrounds and defends the kernel. No matter how small or large the community, it may be only a village, even a single household, or a whole state, it will still have a mark, a space or boundary by which its own rights of jurisdiction are limited, and the encroachments of others are kept off. The more extensive the community which is interested in the mark, the more solemn and sacred the formalities by which it is consecrated and defended. But even the boundary of the private man's estate is under the protection of the gods and of the law. Accursed in all ages and all legislations, is he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. Even the owner of a private estate is not allowed to build or cultivate to the extremity of his own possession, but must leave a space for eaves. Nor is the general rule abrogated by changes in the original compass of the communities, as smaller districts coalesce and become, as it were, compressed into one body. The smaller and original marks may become obliterated and converted merely into commons, but the public mark will have been increased upon the new and extended frontier. Villages tenanted by Herdingas, or Mödingas, may cease to be separated, but the larger divisions which have grown up by their union, Manwaras, Megsetan, or Huikas, will still have a boundary of their own. These again may be lost in the extending circuit of Wessex or Mercia till a yet greater obliteration of the marks having been produced through increasing population, internal conquest, or the ravages of foreign invaders, the great kingdom of England at length arises, having wood and desolate moorland, 
and mountain as its mark against Scots, Cumbrians, and Britons, and the eternal sea itself as a bulwark against Frankish and Frisian pirates. But although the mark is waste, it is yet the property of the community. It belongs to the freemen as a whole, not as a partable possession. It may as little be profaned by the stranger as the arable land itself which it defends. It is under the safeguard of the public law, long after it has ceased to be under the immediate protection of the gods. It is unsafe, full of danger. Death lurks in its shades and awaits the incautious or hostile visitant. All the markland was with death surrounded, the snares of the foe. Punishments of the most frightful character are denounced against him who violates it, and though in historical times these can only be looked upon as comminatory and symbolical, it is very possible that they may be records of savage sacrifices believed due, and even offered, to the gods of the violated sanctuary. I can well believe that we too had once our Diana Tarica. The marks are called accursed, that is accursed to man, accursed to him that does not respect their sanctity. But they are sacred, for on their maintenance depends the safety of the community and the service of the deities whom that community honors. And even when the gods have abdicated their ancient power, even to the very last, the terrors of superstition come in aid of the enactments of law. The deep forests and marshes are the abodes of monsters and dragons. Wood spirits bewilder and decoy the wanderer to destruction. The Neeker's house by the side of lakes and marshes, Grendel, the man-eater, is a mighty stepper over the mark. The chosen home of the fire drake is a fen. The natural tendency, however, of this state of isolation is to give way. Population is an overactive element of social well-being, and when once the surface of a country has become thickly studded with communities settled between the marks, and daily finding the several clearings grow less and less sufficient for their support, the next step is the destruction of the marks themselves, and the union of the settlers in larger bodies, and under altered circumstances. Take two villages, placed on such clearings in the bosom of the forest, each having an ill-defined boundary in the wood that separates them, each extending its circuit woodward as population increases and presses upon the land, each attempting to drive its mark further into the waste, as the arable gradually encroaches upon this. On the first meeting of the herdsmen, one of three courses appears unavoidable. The communities must enter into a federal union, one must attack and subjugate the other, or the two must coalesce into one on friendly and equal terms. The last name result is not improbable if the gods of the one tribe are common to the other. Then perhaps the temples only may shift their places a little. But in any case the intervening forest will cease to be mark, because it will now lie in the center, and not on the borders of the new community it will be converted into common pasture, to be enjoyed by all on fixed conditions, or it may even be gradually rooted out, plowed, planted, and rendered subject to the ordinary accidents of arable land. It will become folk land, public land, applicable to the general uses of the enlarged state, nay even divisible into private estates, upon the established principles of public law. And this process will be repeated and continue until the family becomes a tribe, and the tribe a kingdom, when the intervening boundary lands, cleared, drained, and divided, will have been clothed with golden harvests, or portioned out in meadows and common pastures, appurtenant to villages, and the only marks remaining will be the barren mountain and moor of the frontiers, the deep unforded rivers, and the great ocean that washes the shores of the continent. Christianity, which destroys or diminishes the holiness of the forests, necessarily confines the guarantee of the mark to the public law of the state. Hence, when these districts become included within the limits of Christian communities, there is no difficulty in the process which has been described. The state deals with them as with any other part of its territory, by its own sovereign power, according to the prevalent ideas of agriculture or political economy. And the once inviolate land may at once be converted to public uses, widely different from its original destination if the public advantage require it. No longer necessary as a boundary, from the moment when the smaller community has become swallowed up and confounded in the larger, it may remain in commons, be taken possession of by the state as folkland, or become the source of even private estates, and to all these purposes we find it gradually applied. 
In a process of time, it seems even to have become partable and appurtenant to private estates in a certain proportion to the arable. Towards the close of the 10th century, I find the grant of a mill and a millstead, and there too as much of the markland as belongeth to three hides. The general advantage which requires the maintenance of the mark as public property does not, however, preclude the possibility of using it for public purposes, as long as the great condition of indivisibility is observed. Although it may not be cleared and plowed, it may be depastured, and all the herds of the markmen may be fed and masted upon its wilds and within its shades. While it still comprises only a belt of forest lying between small settlements, those who live contiguous to it are most exposed to the sudden incursions of an enemy, and perhaps specially entrusted with the measures for public defense, may have peculiar privileges, extending in certain cases even to the right of clearing or asserting portions of it. In the case of the wide tracts which separate kingdoms, we know that a comprehensive military organization prevailed, with castles, garrisons, and governors or margraves, as in Austria, Brandenburg and Baden, Spoleto and Ancona, Northumberland and the marches of Wales. But where clearings have been made in the forest, the holders are bound to see that they are maintained, and that the fresh arable land be not encroached upon. If forest trees spring there by neglect of the occupant, the assart again becomes forest, and as such subject to all the common rights of the markmen, whether in pasture, chase, or estovers. The sanctity of the mark is the condition and guarantee of its indivisibility, without which it cannot long be proof against the avarice or ambition of individuals, and its indivisibility is, in turn, the condition of the service which it is to render as a bulwark, and of its utility as a pasture. I therefore hold it certain that some solemn religious ceremonies at first accompanied and consecrated its limitation. What these may have consisted in, among the heathen Anglo-Saxons, we cannot now discover, but many circumstances render it probable that Woden, who in this function also resembles Hermes, was the tutelary god. Though not absolutely to the exclusion of other deities, two and Freya appearing to have some claim to a similar distinction, but however its limit was originally drawn or driven, it was, as its name denotes, distinguished by marks or signs. Trees of peculiar size and beauty, and carved with the figures of birds and beasts, perhaps even with runic characters, served the purpose of limitation and definition. Striking natural features, a hill, a brook, a morass, a rock, or the artificial mound of an ancient warrior, warned the intruder to abstain from dangerous ground, or taught the herdsman how far he might advance with impunity. In water, or in marshy land, poles were set up, which it was as impious to remove as it would have been to cut or burn down a mark tree in the forest. In the second and more important sense of the word, the mark is a community of families or households, settled on such plots of land and forest as have been described. This is the original basis upon which all Teutonic society rests, and must be assumed to have been at first amply competent to all the demands of society in a simple and early stage of development. For example, to have been a union for the purpose of administering justice, or supplying a mutual guarantee of peace, security, and freedom for the inhabitants of the district. In this organization, the use of the land, the woods, and the waters was made dependent upon the general will of the settlers, and could only be enjoyed under general regulations made by all for the benefit of all. The mark was a voluntary association of free men, who laid down for themselves and strictly maintained a system of cultivation by which the produce of the land on which they settled might be fairly and equally secured for their service and support and from participation in which they jealously excluded all who were not born or adopted into the association. Circumstances dependent upon the peculiar local conformation of the district, or even on the relations of the original parties to the contract, may have caused a great variety in the customs of different marks, and these appear occasionally anomalous, when we meet with them still subsisting in a different order of social existence. But with the custom of one mark another had nothing to do and the markmen, with their own limit, were independent, sufficient to their own support and defense, and seized of full power and authority to regulate their own affairs, as seemed most conducive to their own advantage. The court of the markmen, as it may be justly called, must have had supreme jurisdiction at first over all the causes which could in any way affect the interests of the whole body or the individuals composing it. 
and suit and service to such court was not less the duty than the high privilege of the free settlers. On the continent of Germany, the divisions of the marks and the extent of their jurisdiction can be ascertained with considerable precision. From these it may be inferred that in very many cases the later courts of the great landowners had been in fact at first mark courts, in which even long after the downfall of the primeval freedom, the lord himself had been only the first markman, the patron or defender of the simple freedom, either by inheritance or their election. In this country, the want of materials precludes the attainment of similar certainty, but there can be no reason to doubt that the same process took place, and that originally mark courts existed among ourselves with the same objects and powers. In a charter of the year 971, Codex Diplomaticus No. 568, we find the word markmot, which can there mean only the place where such a court, moat, or meeting was held, while the markbauer, which is not at all of rare occurrence, appears to denote the hill or mound which was the site of the court, and the place where the free settlers met at stated periods to do right between man and man. It is not at all necessary that these communities should have been very small. On the contrary, some of the marks were probably of considerable extent, and capable of bringing a respectable force into the field upon emergency. Others, no doubt, were less populous and extensive. But a hundred heads of houses, which is not at all an extravagant supposition, protected by trackless forests in a district not well known to the invader, constitute a body very well able to defend its rights and privileges. Although the mark seems originally to have been defined by the nature of the district, the hills, streams, and forests, Still, its individual, peculiar, and, as it were, private character, depended in some degree also upon the long-subsisting relations of the markmen, both among themselves and with regard to others. I represent them to myself as great family unions, comprising households of various degrees of wealth, rank, and authority. Some, in direct descent from the common ancestors, or from the hero of the particular tribe, others more distantly connected, through the natural result of increasing population which multiplies indeed the members of the family, but removes them at every step further from the original stock. Some admitted into communion by marriage, others by adoption, others even by emancipation, but all recognizing a brotherhood, a kinsmanship, or siebschaft, all standing together as one unit in respect of other similar communities, all governed by the same judges and led by the same captains, all sharing in the same religious rites, and all known to themselves and to their neighbors by one general name. The original significance of these names is now perhaps matter of curious, rather than of useful inquiry. Could we securely determine it, we should, beyond doubt, obtain an insight into the antiquities of the Germanic races, far transcending the actual extent of our historical knowledge. This it is hopeless now to expect. Ages of continual struggles, of violent convulsions, of conquests and revolutions, lie between us and our forefathers. The traces of their steps have been effaced by the inexorable march of a different civilization. This alone is certain, that the distinction must have lain deeply rooted in the national religion and supplied abundant materials for the national epos. Much has been irrevocably lost, yet in what remains we recognize fragments which bear the impress of former wealth and grandeur. Beowulf, the Traveler's Song, and the multifarious poems and traditions of Scandinavia, not less than the scattered names which meet us here and there in early German history, offer hints which can only serve to excite regret for the mass which has perished. The kingdoms and empires which have exercised the profoundest influence upon the course of modern civilization have sprung out of obscure communities whose very names are only known to us through the traditions of the poet, or the local denominations which record the sites of their early settlements. Many hypotheses may be formed to account for these ancient aggregations, especially on the continent of Europe. Perhaps not the least plausible is that of a single family, itself claiming descent, through some hero, from the gods, and gathering other scattered families around itself. Thus retaining the administration of the family rights of religion, and giving its own name to all the rest of the community. Once established, such distinctive appellations must wander with the migrations of the communities themselves or such portions of them as want of land and means, an excess of population at home, compelled to seek new settlements. In the midst of restless movements, so general and extensive as those of our progenitors, it cannot surprise us when we find the Gentile names of Germany, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark 
reproduced upon our own shores. Even where a few adventurers, one only, bearing a celebrated name, took possession of a new home, comrades would readily be found, glad to constitute themselves around him under an appellation long recognized as heroic. Or a leader, distinguished for his skill, his valor and success, his power or superior wealth, may have found little difficulty in imposing the name of his own race upon all who shared in his adventures. Thus, Harlings and Walsings, names most intimately connected with the great epos of the Germanic and Scandinavian races, are reproduced in several localities in England. Billing, the noble progenitor of the royal race of Saxony, has more than one enduring record, and similarly I believe all the local denominations of the early settlements to have arisen and been perpetuated. So much light appears derivable from a proper investigation of these names that I have collected them in an appendix, A, at the beginning of this volume, to the contents of which the reader's attention is invited. In looking over this list, we are immediately struck with a remarkable repetition of various names, some of which are found at once in several counties, and most striking are those which, like the examples already alluded to, give a habitation upon our own shores to the races celebrated in the poetical or historical records of other ages and other lands. There are indeed hardly any inquiries of deeper interest than those whose tendency is to link the present with the past in the bonds of a mythical tradition, or which presence results of greater importance to him who has studied the modes of thought and action of populations at an early stage of their career. The intimate relations of mythology, law, and social institutions which later ages are too apt scornfully to despise, or superstitiously to imitate, are for them living springs of action. They are believed in, not played with, as in the majority of revivals, from the days of Anitus and Melitus to our own, and they form the broad foundation upon which the whole social policy is established. The people who believe in heroes, originally gods and always god-born, preserve a remembrance of their ancient deities and the Gentile names by which themselves are distinguished, long after the rites they once paid to their divinities have fallen into disuse. It is this record of beings once hallowed, and a cult once offered, which they have bequeathed to us in many of the now unintelligible names of the Marks. Taking these facts into account, I have no hesitation in affirming that the names of places found in the Anglo-Saxon charters, and yet extant in England, supply no trifling links in the chain of evidence by which we demonstrate the existence among ourselves of a heathendom nearly allied to that of Scandinavia. The Wilsings, the Volsinger of the Edda, and Volsungen of the German Heldensaga, have already been noticed in a cursory manner. They are the family whose hero is Siegfried, or Sigurder, the center round which the Nibelungen epos circles. Another of their princes, Fitula, the Norse Sinfjotli is recorded in the poem of Beowulf, and from him appear to have been derived the Fitlingas, whose name survives in Fitling. The Herolingas, or Harlings, have also been noticed. They are connected with the same great cycle and are mentioned in the Traveler's Song. Line 224. As Harlingen in Friesland retains a record of the same name, it is possible that it may have wandered to the coast of Norfolk with the Batavian auxiliaries, Numeris Batavorum, who served under their own chiefs in Britain. The Swafas, a border tribe of the Angles, reappear at Swafham. The Brentings are found again in Brentingby. The Schildings and Schilfings, perhaps the most celebrated of the northern races, give their names to Skelding and Schildington. The Ardings, whose memorial is retained in Ardingly, Ardington, and Ardingworth, are the Asdingi, the royal race of the Visigoths and Vandals, a name which confirms the tradition of a settlement of Vandals in England. With these we probably should not confound the Herdingas, who have left their name to Hardingham of Norfolk. The Bannings, over whom Becca ruled, are recognized in Banningham. The Halsings, in Helsington, and in the Swedish Helsingland, the Mergings, perhaps in Mering and Merrington. The Hundings, perhaps in Huntingham and Huntington. The Hokings, in Hucking. The Seringas meet us again in Sherrington, Sherrington and Sherringham. The Thiringas, in Thorington and Thorington, are likely to be offshoots of the great Hermanduric race, the Thiringi or Thoringi, 
now Thuringians, always neighbors of the Saxons. The Blekingas, a race who probably gave name to Blekingen in Sweden, are found in Bletchington and Bletchingley. In the Gitingas, known to us from Guting, we can yet trace the Alemannic tribe of the Uthingi, or Utingi. Perhaps in the Sittingas or Sinningas, we may find another Alemannic tribe, the Shudingi, and in the Dilingas, the Alpine or High Dutch name, the Tulingi. The Waringas are probably the Norman Varingyar, whom we call Varangians. The Wilfingas, another celebrated race, well known in Norse tradition, are recorded in Beowulf and the Traveler's Song. These are unquestionably no trivial coincidences. They assure us that there lies at the root of our land divisions an element of the highest antiquity, one, too, by which our kinsmanship with the North German races is placed beyond dispute. But their analogy leads us to a wider induction. When we examine the list of names contained in the appendix, we see at once how very few of these are identified with the names recorded in Beowulf and other poems. All that are so recorded had probably belonged to portions of the epic cycle, but there is nothing in the names themselves to distinguish them from the rest. Nothing at least but the happy accident of those poems which were dedicated to their praise having survived. In the lapse of years, how many similar records have perished? And may we not justly conclude that a far greater number of races might have been identified had the ages spared the songs in which they were sung? Vicera forte sante agamemnon multi, sed omnes in lacrimabiles. Urgenter ignatica longa nocta, current quievate sacro. Whatever periods we assume for the division of the land into marks, or to what cause soever we attribute the names adopted by the several communities, the method and manner of their dispersion remains a question of some interest. The appendix shows a most surprising distribution of some particular names over several counties. But this seems conceivable only in two ways. First, that the inhabitants of a mark, finding themselves pressed for room at home, migrated to other seats, and established a new community under the old designation. Or secondly, that in the division of the newly conquered soil, men who had belonged to one community upon the continent found themselves thrown into a state of separation here, either by the caprice of the lots, supposing their immigration simultaneous, or by the natural course of events, supposing one body to have preceded the other. Perhaps, too, we must admit the possibility of a dispersion arising from the dissolution of ancient confederacies, produced by internal war. On the whole, I am disposed to look upon the second hypothesis as applicable to the majority of cases, without presuming altogether to exclude the action of the first and third causes. It is no doubt difficult to imagine that a small troop of wandering strangers should be allowed to traverse a settled country in search of new habitations. Yet at first there must have been abundance of land, which conduct and courage might wring from its Celtic owners. Again, how natural, on the other hand, is it, that in the confusion of conquest or in the dilatory course of gradual occupation, men once united should find their lot cast apart, and themselves divided into distant communities. Nor in this can we recognize anything resembling the solemn planting of a Grecian, far less a Roman colony or suppose that any notion of a common origin survived to flourish feelings of friendship between bodies of man, so established in different lands. Even had such traditions originally prevailed, they must have soon perished, when the marks coalesced into the Gaul or Shire, and several of the latter became included in one kingdom. New interests and duties must have readily superseded maxims which belonged to an almost obsolete organization. But in truth, to this question of dispersion and relationship, considered in its widest generality, there is no limit either of place or time. It derives indeed some of its charm from the very vagueness which seems to defy the efforts of the historian. And even the conviction that a positive and scientific result is unattainable does not suffice to repress the anxiety with which we strive to lift the veil of our Isis. The question of every settlement, large or small, ultimately resolves itself into that of the original migrations of mankind. Unless we can bring ourselves to adopt the hypothesis of autochthonous populations, an hypothesis whose vagueness is not less than attaches to a system of gradual but untraced advances, we must fall back from point to point until we reach one starting place and one origin. Every family that squats upon the waste, 
assumes the existence of two families from which it sprang. Every household, comprising a man and woman, if it is to be fruitful and continue, presupposes two such households. Each of these continues to represent two more, in a geometrical progression, whose enormous sum and final result are lost in the night of ages. The solitary who wanders away into the uncultivated waste, and thereby degrees rears a family, a tribe, and a state, takes with him the traditions, the dispositions, the knowledge, and the ideas, which he had derived from others, in turn equally indebted to their predecessors. This state of society, if society it can be called, is rarely exhibited to our observation. The backwoodsman in America, or the settler in an Australian bush, may furnish some means of judging such a form of civilization, and the traditions of Norway and Iceland dimly record a similar process. But the solitary laborer, whose constant warfare with an exalting and exuberant nature does little more than assure him an independent existence, has no time to describe the course and the result of his toils. And the progress of the modern settler is recorded less by himself than by a civilized society, whose offset he is, which watches his fortunes with interest and judges him with intelligence, which finds in his career the solution of problems that distract itself, and never forgets that he yet shares in the cultivation he has left behind him. Still, the manner in which such solitary households gradually spread over and occupy a country must be nearly the same in all places where they exist at all. The family increases in number, the arable is extended to provide food, the pasture is pushed further and further as the cattle multiply, or as the grasslands become less productive. Along the banks of the river, which may have attracted the feelings or the avarice of the wanderer, which may have guided his steps in the untracked wilderness, or supplied the road by which he journeyed, the footsteps of civilization move upward, till, reaching the rising ground from which the streams descend on either side, the vanguards of two parties meet, and the watershed becomes their boundary, and the place of meeting for religious or political purposes. Meantime, the ford, the mill, the bridge have become the nucleus of a village, and the blessings of mutual intercourse and family bonds have converted the squatter settlements into a center of wealth and happiness. And in like manner is it, where a clearing in the forest, near a spring or well, divine for its uses to man, has been made, and where, by slow degrees, the separated families discover each other, and find that it is not good for man to be alone. This description, however, will not strictly apply to numerous or extensive cases of settlement, although some analogy may be found if we substitute a tribe for the family. Continental Germany has no tradition of such a process and we may not unjustly believe the records of such in Scandinavia to have arisen from the wanderings of unquiet spirits, impatient of control or rivalry, of criminals shrinking from the consequences of their guilt, or of descendants dreading the blood feud inherited from ruder progenitors. But although systematic and religious colonization, like that of Greece, cannot be assumed to have prevailed, we may safely assert that it was carried on far more regularly and upon more strict principles than are compatible with capricious and individual settlement. Tradition here and there throws light upon the causes by which bodies of men were impelled to leave their ancient habitations, and seek new seats in more fruitful or peaceful districts. The emigration represented by Hengist has been attributed to a famine at home, and even the grave authority of history has countenanced the belief that his keels were driven into exile. Thus far we may assume his adventure to have been made with the participation, if not by the authority, of the parent state. In general we may admit the division of a conquered country, such as Britain was, to have been conducted upon settled principles derived from the actual position of the conquerors. As an army they had obtained possession, and as an army they distributed the booty which rewarded their valor. But they nevertheless continued to occupy the land as families, or cognaciones, resulted from the method of their enrollment in the field itself, where each kindred was drawn up under an officer of its own lineage and appointment, and the several members of the family served together. But such a distribution of the land as should content the various small communities that made up the whole force could only be ensured by the joint authority of the leaders, the concurrence of the families themselves, and the possession of a sufficient space for their extension undisturbed by the claims of former occupants and suited to the wants of its new masters. What difficulties, 
What jealousies preceded the adjustment of all claims among the conquerors we cannot hope to learn, or by what means these were met and reconciled. But the divisions themselves, so many of whose names I have collected, prove that in some way or other the problem was successfully solved. On the natural clearings in the forest, or on spots prepared by man for his own uses, in valleys bounded by gentle acclivities which poured down fertilizing streams, or on plains which were here and there rose, clothed with verdure, above surrounding marshes. Slowly and step by step, the warlike colonists adopted the habits and developed the character of peaceful agriculturalists. The towns which had been spared in the first rush of war gradually became deserted and slowly crumbled to the soil, beneath which their ruins are yet found from time to time, or upon which shapeless masses yet remain, to mark the sites of a civilization whose bases were not laid deep enough for eternity. All over England there soon existed a network of communities, the principle of whose being was separation, as regarded each other. The most intimate union, as respected the individual members of each. Agricultural, not commercial. Dispersed, not centralized. Content within their own limits, and little given to wandering, they relinquished in a great degree the habits and feelings which had united them as military adventurers, and the spirit which had achieved the conquest of an empire was now satisfied with the care of maintaining inviolate a little peaceful plot, sufficient for the cultivation of a few simple households. End of chapter 2「Book One, Chapter Three of Saxons in England by John Mitchell Kemble. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gaw or Shear. Next in order of constitution, if not of time, is the union of two, three, or more marks in a federal bond for the purposes of a religious, judicial, or even political character. The technical name for such a union is in Germany a Gau or Bant. In England, the ancient name Gau has been almost universally superseded by that of Shear or Shire. For the most part, the natural divisions of the country are the divisions also of the Gau, and the size of this depends upon such accidental limits as well as upon the character and dispositions of the several collective bodies which we have called marks. The Gau is the second and final form of unsevered possession for every larger aggregate is but the result of a gradual reduction of such districts under a higher political or administrative unity. Different only in degree and not in kind from what prevailed individually in each. The kingdom is only a larger Gaul than ordinary. Indeed, the Gaul itself was the original kingdom. But the unsevered possession or property which we thus find in the Gaul is by no means to be considered in the same light as that which has been described in the Mark. The inhabitants are settled as markmen, not as gallmen. The cultivated land which lies within the limits of the larger community is all distributed into the smaller ones. As the mark contained within itself the means of doing right between man and man, i.e. its markmot, as it had its principal officer or judge, and beyond a doubt its priest and place of religious observances, so the county, shear, or ga had all these on a larger and more imposing scale and thus it was enabled to do right between mark and mark, as well as between man and man, and to decide those differences the arrangement of which transcended the powers of the smaller body. If the elders and leaders of the mark could settle the mode of conducting the internal affairs of their district, so the elders and leaders of the gaw, the same leading markmen in a corporate capacity, could decide upon the weightier causes that affected the whole community. And thus the shirgemot, or shiremut, was the completion of a system of which the Merkmot was the foundation. Similarly, as the several smaller units had arrangements on a corresponding scale for divine service, so the greater and more important religious celebrations in which all the marks took part could only be performed under the auspices and by the authority of the Gaw. Thus alone could due provision be made for sacrifices, which would have been too onerous for a small and poor district, and an equalization of burthens be effected, while the machinery of government and efficient means of protection were secured. At these great religious rites, accompanied as they ever were by the solemn thing, placatum or court, 
thrice in the year the markmen assembled unbidden, and here they transacted the ordinary and routine business required. On emergencies, however, which did not brook delay, the leaders could ensure their preemptory summons to a bidden thing, and in this were then decided the measures necessary for the maintenance and well-being of the community, and the mutual guarantee of life and honor. To the Ga then probably belonged, as an unsevered possession, the lands necessary for the site and maintenance of a temple, the supply of beasts for sacrifice, and the endowment of a priest or priests, perhaps also for the erection of a stockade or fortress, and some shelter for the assembled freemen in the thing. Moreover, if land existed which from any cause had not been included within the limits of some mark, we may believe that it became the public property of the Gaw, i.e. of all the marks in their corporate capacity. This at least may be inferred from the rights exercised at a comparatively later period over wastelands by the constituted authorities, the duke, count, or king. Accident must more or less have determined the seat of the Gaw jurisdiction. Perhaps here and there some powerful leading mark, already in the possession of a holy site, may have drawn the neighboring settlers into its territory. But as the possession and guardianship of the seat of government could not but lead to the vindication of certain privileges and material advantages to its holders, it is not unreasonable to believe that where the marks coalesced on equal terms, the temple lands would be placed without the peculiar territorial possession of each, as they often were in Greece, upon the Eschatia, or boundary land. On the summit of a range of hills, whose valleys sufficed for the cultivation of the markmen, on the watershed from which the fertilizing streams descended, at the point where the boundaries of two or three communities touched one another, was the proper place for the common periodical assemblages of the free men. And such sites, marked even to this day by a few venerable oaks, may be observed in various parts of England. The description which has been given might seem at first more properly to relate to an abstract political unity than to a real and territorial one. No doubt the most important quality of the Gaw or Shear was its power of uniting distinct populations for public purposes. In this respect it resembled the Shire while the sheriff's court was still of some importance, or even yet where the judges coming on their circuit, under a commission, hold a shire moot or court in each shire for gall delivery. Yet the shire is a territorial division as well as an abstract and merely legal formulary. Although all of the land comprised within it is divided into parishes, hamlets, villes, and liberties. Strictly speaking, the shire, apart from the units that make it up, possesses little more land than that which the town hall, the gall, or the hospital may cover. When for the two latter institutions we substitute the fortress of the king and a cathedral, which was the people's and not the bishop's, we have as nearly as possible the Anglo-Saxon shire property and the identity of the two divisions seems proved. Just as the Gaw, Pagus, contains the marks, Vicos, and the territory of them all, taken together, makes up the territory of the Gaw, so does the shire contain hamlets, parishes, and liberties, and its territorial expanse is distributed into them. And then the word mark is used to denote two distinct things, a territorial division and a corporate body. So does the word gaw or shear denote both a machinery for government and a district in which such machinery prevails. The number of marks included in a single gaw must have varied partly with the variations of the land itself, its valleys, hills, and meadows. To this cause may have been added others, arising to some extent from the original military organization and distribution, from the personal character of a leader, or from the peculiar tenets and customs of a particular mark. But proximity and settlement upon the same land, with the accompanying participation in the advantages of wood and water, are ever the most active means of uniting men in religious and social communities. And it is therefore reasonable to believe that the influence most felt in the arrangement of the several gauze was in fact a territorial one, depending upon the natural conformation of the country. Some of the modern shire divisions of England in all probability have remained unchanged from the earliest times, so that here and there a now existent shire may be identical in territory with an ancient gaw. But it may be doubted whether this observation can be very extensively applied. Obscure as is the record of our old divisions, what little we know favors the supposition that the original gauze were not only more numerous than our shires, but that these were not always identical in their boundaries with those gauze whose locality can be determined. The policy or pedantry of Norman chroniclers has led them to pass over in silence the names of the ancient divisions, 
which nevertheless were known to them. Wherever they have occasion to refer to our shires, they do so by the names they still bear. Thus Florence of Worcester and William of Malmesbury, named to the south of the Humber, Kent, Wiltshire, Berkshire, Dorset, Sussex, Southampton, Surrey, Somerset, Devonshire, Cornwall, Gloucester, Worcestershire, Warwick, Cheshire, Derby, Stafford, Shropshire, Hereford, Oxford, Buckingham, Hertford, Huntington, Bedford, Northampton, Leicester, Lincoln, Nottingham, Cambridge, Norfolk, Suffolk, and Essex, comprising with Middlesex 32 of the shires, out of 40 into which England is now distributed. Yet even these names and divisions are of great antiquity. Asser, in his Life of Alfred, mentions by name Berkshire, Essex, Kent, Surrey, Somerset, Sussex, Lincoln, Dorset, Devon, Wiltshire, and Southampton, being a third of the whole number. Unfortunately, from his work being composed in Latin and his consequent use of paga, we cannot tell how many of these divisions were considered by him as sheer. The Saxon Chronicles, during the period anterior to the reign of Alfred, seems to know only the old general divisions. Thus, we have Cantuareland, Kent, West Saxon, South Saxon, East Saxon, Middle Saxon, Wessex, Sussex, Essex, Middlesex, East Angle, East Anglia, Northanimbraland, Southanimbraland, Merknaland, Northumberland, Southumberland, Mercia, Lindiswara and Lindisay, Lincolnshire, Southridge, Surrey, Wheat, the Isle of Wight, Huicas, the Huicky in Gloucestershire and Worcestershire, Mersawara, the people of Romney Marsh, Wilsathen, Dornsathen, and Sumersathen, Wiltshire, Dorsetshire, and Somersetshire. But after the time of Alfred, the different manuscripts of the chronicles usually adopt the word sheer, in the same places as we do, and with the same meaning. Thus we find Biarrickshire, Bedenfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Defenashire, Deorabishir, Efferwitshir, Gleowancastershir, Grantabrickshir, Hamptonshire, Southampton, Hamptonshire, Northampton, Hertfordshire, Herefordshire, Huntingdonshire, Legacastershire, Lindicurnashire, Oxnafordshire, Scrobesbirigshire, but also Scrobesetham, Snottinghamshire, Staffordshire, Warringwickshire, or Warringshire, Wigorkestershire, and Wiltonshire, Middlesexa, Estesexa, Southsexa, Southridge, and Kent remain. Estangle is not divided into Norfolk and Suffolk. Thus, out of the thirty two shires south of the Humber, which Florence and William of Malmesbury mention, the Chronicles note 26, of which 21 are distinguished as shires by the word shear. In Beda, nothing of the kind is to be found. The general scope of his ecclesiastical history rendered it unnecessary for him to descend to minute details, and besides the names of races and kingdoms, he mentions few divisions of the land. Still, he notices the Provincia Huiciorum, the Middle Angli or Angli Mediterranei, a portion of the Mercians, the Mercii Australis or Aquilonales, the Regio Surigiona or Surrey, the Regio Loidis or Elmet near York, the Provincia Mayanwarorum or hundreds of East and West Mayon in Southampton, the Regio Giriorum in which Peterborough lies, and distinct from this, the Australis Girui or South Girians. The appendix to the Chronicles of Florence of Worcester supplies us with one or two names of small districts, not commonly found in other authors. One of these is the Mercian district of the West Angles or West Hecken, ruled over by Merowald, in whose country were the Magsethan, or people of Hereford, who are sometimes reckoned to the Huicas, or inhabitants of Worcester and Gloucester. Another, the Middle Angles, 
had its bishopric in Leicester. The South Angles, whose bishops sat at Dorster in Oxfordshire, consequently comprised the counties down to the Thames. The North Angles, or Mercians proper, had their bishop in Lichfield. Lastly, it has been recorded that Malmesbury in Wiltshire was in Provincia Septonia. But we are not altogether without the means of carrying this inquiry further. We have a record of the divisions which must have preceded the distribution of this country into shires. They are unfortunately not numerous, and the names are generally very difficult to explain. They have so long become obsolete that it is now scarcely possible to identify them. Nor need this cause surprise when we compare the oblivion into which they have fallen with the sturdy resistance offered by the names of the Marks, and their long continuance throughout all the changes which have befallen our race. The Gauls, which were only political bodies, became readily swallowed up and lost in shires and kingdoms. The Marks, which had an individual being, and as it were a personality of their own, passed easily from one system of aggregations to another, without losing anything of their peculiar character, and at a later period it will be seen that this individuality became perpetuated by the operation of our ecclesiastical institutions. A very important document is printed by Sir Henry Spellman in his glossary under the head Hida. In its present condition, it is comparatively modern, but many of the entries supply us with information obviously derived from the most remote antiquity, and these it becomes proper to take into consideration. The document seems to have been intended as a guide either to the taxation or the military force of the kingdom, and professes to give the number of hides of land contained in the various districts. It runs as follows. Merkna contains 30,000 hides. Wokensetna, 7,000 hides. Westerna, 7,000 hides. Peksetna, 1,200 hides. Elmedsetna, 600 hides. Lindesfarona, 7,000 hides. Suthgirwa, 600 hides. Northgirwa, 600 hides. Estwixna, 300 hides. Westwixna, 600 hides. Spalda, 600 hides. Wigesta, 900 hides. Herrafina, 1,200 hides. Sweordora, 300 hides. Eisla, 300 hides. Huica, 300 hides. Witgara, 600 hides. Noxgaga, 5,000 hides. Othgaga, 2,000 hides. Huinka, 7,000 hides. Kilternsetna, 4,000 hides. Hendrika, 3,000 hides. Unekunga, 1,200 hides. Arrosetna, 600 hides. Ferfinga, 300 hides. Belmiga, 600 hides. Witheringa, 600 hides. Eastwilla, Eastwilla, 600 hides. Westwilla, 600 hides. East Engel, 30,000 hides. East Sexna, 7,000 hides. Kantwarna, 15,000 hides. Sooth Sexna, 7,000 hides. West Sexna, 100,000 hides. The entries respecting Mercia, East Anglia, and Wessex could hardly belong to any period anterior to that of Alfred, for Mercia, previous to the Danish wars, must certainly have contained more than 30,000 hides, while East Anglia cannot have reached so large a sum till settled by Guthorm's Danes. Nor is it easy to believe that Wessex, apart from Kent and Sussex, should have numbered 100,000 in the counties of Surrey, Hampshire, Dorset, Wilshire, with parts of Berkshire, Somerset, and Devon, much before the time of Ethelstan. A remarkable variation is found between the amounts stated in this list and those given by Beda, as respects some of the entries. Thus, Mercia, here valued at 30,000 hides, is reckoned in the ecclesiastical history at 12,000 only. Quickas are reckoned at 300, they contain 600 hides. White, reckoned at 600, contained 1,200. On the other hand, Kent and Sussex are retained at the ancient valuation. 
It is nevertheless impossible to doubt that the greater number of the names recorded in this list are genuine and of the highest antiquity. A few of them can be recognized in the pages of very early writers. Thus, Girwa, Elmit, Lindisfaran, Witgara, and Huicas are mentioned by Bida in the 8th century. Some we are still able to identify with modern districts. Murcia I imagine to be that portion of Burgrid's kingdom, which upon its division by the victorious Danes in 874, they committed as a tributary royalty to Keowulf, which subsequently came into the hands of Elfred by the Treaty of Wedmore in 878, and was by him erected into a duchy under his daughter Athelflaed and her husband. Wolkensetna may possibly be the Gaw of the Rokensetten, the people about the Reckon or hill country of Somerset, Dorset, and Devon. The Pecksetten appear to be the inhabitants of the Peakland, or Derbyshire. The Elmidsetten, those of Elmet, the ancient British Loidus, an independent district of Yorkshire. Lindisfaran are the people of Lindesay, a portion of Lincolnshire. North and South Gilroa were probably in the mark between East Anglia and Mercia. As Peterborough was in North Girwaland, this must have comprised a part of Northamptonshire, and Ethelthrith derived her right to Eli from her first husband, a prince of the South Girwians. This district is therefore supposed to have extended over a part of Cambridgeshire and the Isle of Eli. Spalda may have the tract stretching to the northeast of these upon the river Welland, in which still lies Spalding. The Huicus occupied Worcestershire and Gloucestershire, and perhaps extended into Herefordshire to the west of the Severn. The Witgeras are the inhabitants of the Isle of Wight, and the Kilternsethen were the people who owned the hill and forest land about the Chilterns, verging toward Oxfordshire, and very probably in the mark between Mercia and Wessex. I fear that it will be impossible to identify any more of these names, and it does not appear probable that they supply us with anything like a complete catalogue of the English gauze. Setting aside the fact that no notice seems to be taken of Northumberland, save the mention of the little principality of Elmet, and that of the local divisions of East Anglia, Kent, Essex, Sussex, and Wessex, are passed over in the general names of the kingdoms, we look in vain among them for names known to us from other sources, and which can hardly have been other than those of gauze. Thus we have no mention of the Tonsethen, whose district lay apparently upon the banks of the Severn, of the Manwater, or land of the Utes, in Hampshire, of the Magsethen, or West Hecken, in Herefordshire, of the Merkswater, in West Kent, or of the Gettingas, who occupied a tract in the province of Middlesex. Although it is possible that these divisions are included in some of the larger units mentioned in our list, they still furnish an argument that the names of the Gauls were much more numerous than they would appear from the list itself, and that this marks only a period of transition. It is clear that when William of Malmesbury mentions 32 shires as making up the whole of England, he intends only England south of the Humber. The list we have been examining contains 34 entries. Of all the names therein recorded, one only can be shown to lie to the north of that river. From this, however, it is not unreasonable to suppose that the whole of England is intended to be comprised in the catalogue. Even admitting this, we cannot but conclude that these divisions were more numerous than our shires, seeing that large districts, such as Mercia, Wessex, and East Anglia, are entered only under one general head respectively. The origin of the Gaul in the federal union of two or more marks is natural, and must be referred to periods far anterior to any historical record. That of the division into shires, as well as the period at which this arose, are less easily determined. But we have evidence that some division into shires was known in Wessex as early as the end of the 7th or beginning of the 8th century, since Eni provides for the case where a plaintiff cannot obtain justice from his shireman or judge. And the same prince declares that if an elderman compounds a felony, he shall forfeit his shire while he further enacts that no man shall secretly withdraw from his lord into another shire. As it will be shown hereafter that a territorial jurisdiction is inseparably connected with the rank of a duke or elderman, I take the appearance of these officers in Mercia, during the same period, to be evidence of the existence of a similar division there. Its cause appears to me to lie in the consolidation of the royal power, as long as independent associations of freemen were enabled to maintain their natural liberties, 
to administer their own affairs undisturbed by the power of strangers, and by means of their own private alliances to defend their territories and their rights, the old division into Gauls might continue to exist. But the centralization of power in the hands of the king implies a more artificial system. It is more convenient for judicial and administrative purposes, more profitable and more safe for the ruler, to have districts governed by his own officers, and in which a territorial unity shall supersede the old bonds of kinsmanship. Centralization is hardly compatible with family tradition. The members of the Gaw met as associated freemen, under the guidance of their own natural leaders, and formed a substantive unit or small state, which might, or might not, stand in relations of amity to similar states. The Shire was a political division, presided over by an appointed officer, forming part only of a general system, and no longer endowed with the high political rights of self-government, in their fullest extent. I can imagine the Gaw, but certainly not the Shire, declaring war against a neighbor. As long as the Gaw could maintain itself as a little republic, principality, or even kingdom, it might exist unscathed. But as the smaller kings were rooted out, their lands and people incorporated with larger unions, and powerful monarchies rose upon their ruins. It is natural that a system of districts should arise, based entirely upon a territorial division. Such districts, without peculiar individual character of their own, or principle of internal cohesion, must have appeared less dangerous to usurpation than the ancient Gentile aggregations. End of chapter 3「Book One, Chapter Four of Saxons in England John Mitchell Kemble This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Landed Possession The Edel Hid or Alod Possession of a certain amount of land in the district was the indispensable condition of enjoying the privileges and exercising the rights of a free man there is no trace of such qualification as constituted citizenship at athens or rome among our forefathers the exclusive idea of the city had indeed no sway they formed voluntary associations upon the land for mutual benefit the qualification by birth as far as it could be of any importance was inferred from the fact of admission among the community and Jalandan, or those who occupied the same land were taken to be connected in blood an inquiry into the pedigree of a man who presented himself to share in the perils of the conquest or the settlement would assuredly have appeared superfluous nor was it more likely to be made when secure enjoyment came to reward the labors of invasion in fact the germanic settlements whether in their origin isolated or collective are based throughout upon the idea of common property in land it is not the city but the country that regulates their form of life and social institutions as tacitus knew them they bore in general the character of disliking cities it is well enough known he says that none of the german populations dwell in cities nay that they will not even suffer continuous building and house joined to house they live apart each by himself as the woodside the plain or the fresh spring attracted him thus the germanic community is in some sense at stricta glebi bound to the soil its members are sharers in the arable the forest and the marsh the waters and the pastures their bond of union is a partnership in the advantages to be derived from possession of the land an individual interest in a common benefit the district occupied by a body of new settlers was divided by lot in various proportions yet it is certain that not all the land was so distributed a quantity sufficient to supply a proper block of arable to each settler was set apart for division while the surplus fitted for cultivation the marshes and forests less suited to the operations of the plough and a great amount of fine grass or meadow land destined for the maintenance of cattle remained in undivided possession as commons 
at first too it is clear from what has been said in the second chapter that considerable tracts were left purposely out of cultivation to form the marches or defences of the several communities but those alone whose share in the arable demonstrated them to be members of the little state could hope to participate in the advantages of the commons of pasture like the old roman patricians they derived from their heredium benefits totally incommensurate with its extent without such share of the arable the man formed no portion of the state it was his franchise his political qualification even as a very few years ago a freehold of inconsiderable amount sufficed to enable an englishman to vote or even be voted for as a member of the legislature to be as the greeks would call it a privilege which the utmost wealth in copyhold estates or chattels could not confer he that had no land was at first unfree he could not represent himself and his interests in the courts or assemblies of the freemen but must remain in the moon or hand of another a necessary consequence of a state of society in which there is indeed no property but land in other words no market for its produce from the mode of distribution it is probable that each share was originally called halit it derived however another and more common name from its extent and nature the ordinary anglo-saxon words are higid in its contracted and almost universal form hid and hewis the latin equivalents which we find in the chronicles and charters are familia casatis mansis mansa mansio manans and terra tributarii the words hid and hiwiz are both similar if not identical in meaning they stand in close etymological relation to higgin hiwan the family the man and wife and thus perfectly justify the latin terms familia and casatis by which they are translated the hid then or hide of land is the estate of one household the amount of land sufficient for the support of one family it is clear however that this could not be an invariable quantity if the households were to be subsisted on an equal scale it must depend upon the original quality and condition of the soil as well as upon manifold contingencies of situation climate aspect accessibility of water and roads abundance of natural manures proximity of marshes and forests in short an endless catalogue of varying details if therefore the hyde contained a fixed number of acres all over england and all the freemen were to be placed in a position of equal prosperity we must assume that in the less favoured districts one hyde would not suffice for the establishment of one man but that his allotment must have comprised more than that quantity the first of these hypotheses may be very easily disposed of there is not the slightest ground for supposing that any attempt was or could be made to regulate the amount of individual possession beyond the limit of each community or that there ever was or could be any concert between different communities for such a purpose the second supposition however presents greater difficulties there is no doubt a strong antecedent improbability of the hyde having been alike all over england isolated as were the various conquests which gradually established the saxon rule in the several districts it can hardly be supposed that any agreement was at first found among bands engaged in continual struggles for safety rather than for extension of territory it may indeed be objected that later when the work of conquest had been consolidated when under the rule of powerful chieftains the resistance of the britons had ceased to appear dangerous some steps may have been taken towards a general arrangement those historians who please themselves with the phantom of a saxon confederation under one imperial head may find therein an easy solution of this and many other difficulties but still it seems little likely that the important step of dividing the country should have been postponed or that a successful body of invaders should have thought it necessary to wait for the consent or cooperation of others whose ultimate triumph was yet uncertain experience of human nature would rather incline us to believe that as each band wrung from the old masters of the soil as much as sufficed for its own support and safety it hastened to realize its position and marked its acquisition by the stamp and impress of individual possession it is moreover probable that 
had any solemn and general agreement been brought about through the influence of any one predominant chief we should not have been left without some record of a fact so beneficial in itself and so conclusive as to the power and wisdom of its author this we might not unreasonably expect even though we admit that such an event could only have taken place at the very commencement of our history and that such a division or what is more difficult still redivision of the soil is totally inconsistent with the state of society in england at any period subsequent to a d six hundred but these are precisely the cases where the mythus replaces and is ancillary to history against all these arguments we have only one fact to adduce but it is no light one it is certain that in all the cases where a calculation can be made at all we do find a most striking coincidence with respect to the size of the hide in various parts of england that such calculation is applicable to very numerous instances and apparently satisfies the condition of the problem in all and lastly that there appears no reason to suppose that any such real change had taken place in the value of the hide down to the period of the norman conquest and the compilation of doomsday according to the admeasurement of at least the largest and the most influential of the english tribes the latest of these measurements are recorded in doomsday the earliest by beta the same system of calculations the same results apply to every case in which trial has been made between these remote limits and we are thus enabled to ascend to the seventh century a period at which any equality of possessions is entirely out of the question but at which the old unit of measurement may still have retained and handed down its original value even as with us one farm may comprise a thousand another only two or three hundred acres and yet the extent of the acre remained unaltered how then are we to account for this surprising fact in the face of the arguments thus arrayed against it i cannot positively assert but still think it highly probable that there was some such general measure common to the germanic tribes upon the continent and especially in the north whether originally sacerdotal or how settled it is useless to guess but there does seem reason to believe that a measure not widely different from the result of my own calculations as to the hide prevailed in germany and hence to conclude that it was the usual basis of measurement among all the tribes that issued from the storehouse of nations what was the amount then of the hide among the anglo-saxons perhaps the easiest way of arriving at a trustworthy conclusion will be to commence with the anglo-saxon acre and other subdivisions of the hide and the acre itself there is reason to believe that the latter measure implied ordinarily a quantity of land not very different in amount from our own statute acre i argue this from a passage in the dialogue attributed to alfric where the ploughman is made to say having yoked my oxen and fastened my share in coulter i am bound to plough every day a full acre or more now experience proves that a plough drawn by oxen will hardly exceed this measure upon average land at the present day an acre and a quarter would be a very hard day's work for any ploughman under such circumstances hence for all practical purposes we may assume our actual acre not to differ very materially from the anglo-saxon and now how is an acre constituted it is many divisors all multiplying into the required sum of four thousand eight hundred and forty square yards thus it is clear that a length of four thousand eight hundred and forty yards with a breadth of one yard is quite as much an acre as a length of two hundred and twenty yards with a breadth of twenty-two in other words ten chains by one or twenty-two times ten times twenty-two the usual and legal computation that is to say twenty-two strips of land each two hundred and twenty yards long and one wide if placed together in any position will make up an acre place side by side they will make an oblong acre whose length and breadth are as ten to one a space rather more than sixty-nine and less than seventy yards in each side would be a square acre it is however not probable that the land generally allowed of square divisions but rather that the portions were oblong a circumstance in favour of the ploughman whose labour varies very much with the length of the furrow the present divisors of the acre are five point five and forty combinations of these numbers make up the parts not only of the acre or square measure but also the measure of length thus five point five times forty equals two hundred and twenty which taken in yards are one furlong and which with one yard's breadth are one twenty-second of an acre 
again forty times five point five yards with a breadth of five point five yards or two hundred and twenty times five point five or one thousand two hundred and ten yards square point two five of an acre twice that or forty times five point five with a breadth of eleven yards or point five acre and twice that or two hundred and twenty times twenty that is in modern surveying ten chains by one equals four thousand eight hundred and forty yards or the whole acre the same thing may be expressed in another way we may assume a square of five point five yards which is called a rod perch or pole forty of these make a rood which is a furlong with a breadth of five point five yards and four such roods or a furlong with a breadth of twenty two yards are an acre of the oblong form described above and which is still the normal or legal acre my hypothesis goes on to assume that such or nearly such were the elements of the original calculation in fact that they were entirely so with the substitution only of five for five point five as a factor it remains to be asked why these numbers should be fixed upon probably from some notion of the mystical properties of the numbers themselves forty and eight are of continual recurrence in anglo-saxon tradition and may be considered as their sacerdotal or mythical numbers forty divided by eight gives a quotient of five and these may have been the original factors especially if as there is every reason to believe the first division of lands whether here or on the continent matters not took place under the authority and with the assistance of the heathen priesthood if this were so the saxon acre very probably consisted of five times five times forty times four equals four thousand square yards in which case the rod would be twenty-five yards square and the furlong two hundred yards in length at the same time as the acres must be considered equal for all the purposes of useful calculation four thousand saxon square yards equals four thousand eight hundred and forty english five saxon equals five point five english and two hundred saxon equals two hundred and twenty english yards further the saxon yard equals one point one english or thirty nine point six inches this i imagine to be the met gird or measuring yard of the saxon laws if then we take five times five times forty yards we have a block of land two hundred saxon yards in length and five in breadth and this i consider to have been the saxon square furlang or small acre and to have been exactly equal to our root the quarantina of early calculations there is no doubt whatever of the saxon furlang having been a square as well as long measure as its name denotes it is the length of a furrow now two hundred and twenty equals two hundred saxon yards is not at all too long aside for a field in our modern husbandry and is still more readily conceivable in a less artificial system where there was altogether less enclosure and the rotations of crops were fewer five yards or five and a half is not too much space to allow for the turn of the plough and it therefore seems not improbable that such an oblong block two hundred by five should have been assumed as a settled measure or furlong for the ploughman two being taken alternately as is done at this day in working and forming a good half day's work for man and beast the length of the furrow by which the labour of the ploughman is greatly reduced being taken to compensate for the improved character of our implements i think it extremely probable that the saxons had a large and a small acre as well as a large and small hundred and a large and small yard and also that the quarantina or rood was this small acre taking forty quarantini we have a sum of ten large acres and taking three times that number we have one hundred and twenty quarantini or a large hundred of small acres equals thirty large acres giving ten to each course of a threefold system of husbandry this on the whole seems a near approximation to the value of the hide of land and the calculation of small acres would then help to account for the number of one hundred and twenty which is assigned to the hide by some authorities in the appendix to this chapter i have given various calculations to prove that in doomsday the value of a hide is forty norman acres it has been asserted that one hundred saxon equals one hundred and twenty norman acres and if so forty norman equals thirty three and a third saxon which does not differ very widely from the calculation given above 
it must be borne in mind that the hyde comprised only arable land the meadow and pasture was in the common lands and forests and was attached to the hyde as of common right under these circumstances if the calculation of thirty thirty two or thirty three acres be correct we shall see that ample provision was made for the family let us now apply these data to places of which we know the hidage and compare this with the modern contents and statute acres according to beta the isle of wight contained one thousand two hundred hides or families now the island contains eighty six thousand eight hundred and ten acres which would give seventy two and a third acres per hide but only seventy five thousand acres are under cultivation now and this would reduce our quotient to sixty two point five acres on the hypothesis that in such a spot as the isle of wright in great portions of which vegetation is not abundant our saxon forefathers had half as much under cultivation as we now have we should obtain a quotient of about thirty-one acres to the hide leaving forty nine thousand six hundred and ten acres of pasture waste etc the ratio between the cultivated and uncultivated land being about thirty seven to forty nine is much too near equality for the general ratio of england but may be accounted for by the peculiar circumstances of the island again beta estimates thanet at six hundred hides now thanet at this day contains twenty three thousand acres of arable land and three thousand five hundred of marsh and pastures the latter must have been far more extensive in the time of beta for in the first place there must have been some land on the side of surrey and sussex reserved as mark and we know that drainage and natural causes have reclaimed considerable tracts in that part of kent nor is it reasonable to suppose that our forefathers ploughed up as much land as we do yet even to renew three thousand acres will give us only thirty-eight and a third acres to the hide and i do not think we shall be venturing too much in placing the thirty-two hundred thirty-eight hundred or five thousand acres by which twenty-three thousand respectively exceed nineteen thousand eight hundred nineteen thousand two hundred and eighteen thousand to the account of pastures and commons seven or eight thousand acres of common land would bear in fact so unusually small a proportion to the quantity under crop that we should be disposed to suspect the islanders of having been less wealthy than many of their neighbours unless we give them credit for having sacrificed bread crops to the far more remunerative pasturage of cattle the whole acreage of kent is nine hundred and seventy two thousand two hundred and forty acres what amount of this must be deducted for waste rivers roads and towns i cannot say but some deduction is necessary now kent numbered fifteen thousand hides this gives a quotient of sixty four to sixty five acres per hide and at the least one half of this may fairly be taken off for marsh pasture and the weald of andred the calculation for sussex is rendered uncertain in some measure through our ignorance of the relative proportion borne by the weald in the seventh century or earlier to its present extent the whole county is computed at nine hundred and seven thousand nine hundred and twenty acres and the weald at four hundred and twenty five thousand acres we may be assured that every foot of the weald was forest in the time of beta to this must be added one hundred and ten thousand acres which are still waste and totally unfit for the plough thirty thousand acres now computed to be occupied by roads buildings etc may be neglected our amount will therefore state itself thus whole acreage nine hundred and seven thousand nine hundred and twenty wheeled and waste five hundred and thirty five thousand some three hundred and seventy two thousand nine hundred and twenty acres now sussex contains seven thousand hides and this will give us a quotient of fifty three point twenty five acres per hide here again if we make allowance for the condition of saxon husbandry we shall hardly err much in assuming something near thirty to thirty three acres to have been the arable hide in sussex when once we leave the accurate reports of a historian like beta for the evidence of later manuscripts we must necessarily proceed with great caution and in reasonable distrust of our conclusions this must be borne in mind and fairly appreciated throughout the following calculations an authority already mentioned computes the number of hides in east anglia at thirty thousand it is difficult to determine exactly what counties are meant by this as we do not know the date of the document but supposing what is most probable that norfolk and suffolk 
are intended we should have a total of two million two hundred and forty one thousand sixty acres in those two great farming districts but even this large amount will only give us a quotient of seventy three point seven acres per hide and it may fairly be diminished by at least one half to account for commons marshes forests and other land not brought under the plough from the seventh to the tenth centuries the same table states essex at seven thousand hides the acreage of that county is nine hundred and seventy nine thousand acres hence upon the whole calculation we shall have one hundred and thirty nine and six sevenths acres per hide but of course here a very great deduction is to be made for epping hainault and other forests and for marshy and undrained land i shall now proceed to reverse the order of proceeding which has hitherto been adopted and to show that the hypothesis of the hide having comprised from thirty to thirty-three acres is the only one which will answer the conditions found in various grants that in a number of cases from very different parts of england a larger number of acres would either be impossible or most improbable that it is entirely impossible for the hide to have reached one hundred and twenty or even one hundred acres and that the amount left after deducting the arable to form pastures and meadows is by no means extravagant the examples are taken from different charters printed in the codex diplomaticus evi saxonici and for convenience of reference are arranged tabularly the comparison is made with the known acreage taken from the parliamentary return of eighteen forty one the table is constructed upon the following plan the first column contains the name of the place the second the number of hides the third the actual acreage the fourth fifth sixth seventh and eighth the hides calculated at thirty thirty two thirty three forty and one hundred acres respectively the ninth tenth eleventh and twelfth the excess of real over supposed acreage at the first four amounts the thirteenth the excess of hideage over real acreage on the hypothesis of one hundred acres per hide the fourteenth fifteenth sixteenth and seventeenth the ratios of hideage at thirty thirty two thirty three and forty to the excess from which we deduce the proportion between the arable and the meadow pasture and waste in a few instances there is a double return implying that it is uncertain to which of two synonymous districts a grant must be referred we have thus forty-nine cases in which the hide is proved less than one hundred acres a fortiori less than one hundred and twenty any one who carefully considers the ratios arrived at in the foregoing table which for any one of the assumed cases rarely exceed one to two will agree that there is a remarkable coincidence in the results in at least the rich fertile and cultivated counties from which the examples are derived in some cases indeed the proportion of arable to waste is so great that we must suppose other districts now under cultivation to have been then entirely untouched in order to conceive sufficient space for marks and pastures but lest it should be objected that these examples can teach us only what was the case in fertile districts i subjoin a calculation of the hideage and acreage of all england including all its barren moors its forests its marshes and its meadows from the solent to the utmost limit of northumberland this calculation leaves no doubt a bare possibility of the hides containing one hundred or one hundred and twenty statute acres but those who are inclined to believe that taking all england through the proportion of cultivated to uncultivated land was as twenty-nine to three or even as twenty-four to seven it must be owned appreciate our ancient husbandry beyond its merits cultivation may very probably have increased with great rapidity up to the commencement of the ninth century and in that case waste land would have been brought under the plough to meet the demands of increasing population but the savage inroads of the northmen which filled the next succeeding century must have had a strong tendency in the opposite direction i can hardly believe that a third of all england was under cultivation at the time of the conquest yet this is the result which we obtain from a calculation of thirty-two or thirty-three acres to the hide while a calculation of forty acres gives us a result of three-eighths 
or very little less than one half the extraordinary character of this result will best appear from the following considerations if we proceed to apply these calculations to the existing condition of england we shall be still more clearly satisfied that from thirty to thirty-three acres is at any rate a near approximation to the truth the exact data for england are i believe not found but in eighteen twenty seven mr cooling a civil engineer and surveyor delivered a series of calculations to the select committee of the house of commons on emigration which calculations have been reproduced by mr porter in his work on the progress of the nation now as the arable and gardens are all that can possibly be reckoned to the hide we have these figures giving a ratio of five to eleven nearly between the cultivated and uncultivated the actual amount in france is difficult to ascertain but of the fifty two million seven hundred and thirty two thousand four hundred and twenty eight hectares of which its superficial extent consists it is probable that about thirty million are under some sort of profitable culture giving a ratio of rather less than fifteen to eleven between the cultivated and uncultivated how much of this is arable and garden i cannot exactly determine but it is probable that a great deal is reckoned to profitable cultivation which could not have been counted in the hide osieries meadows orchards cultivated or artificial grasslands and brushwood are all sources of profit and thus are properly included in a cadastre of property which may be tithed or taxed as productive but they are not strictly what the hide was and must be deducted in any calculation such as that which is the object of this chapter we are unfortunately also furnished with inconsistent amounts by different authorities where the difference rests upon what is reckoned to profitable cultivation on which subject there may be a great variety of opinion still for a time neglecting these considerations and making no deduction whatever it appears that the excess of culture upon the gross sum is only as fifteen to eleven in france in the returns from austria we can follow the same train of reasoning thus of the whole productive surface of the austrian empire the arable bears only the proportion of four to eleven but to this must clearly be added an immense extent of land totally unfitted for the plough by which the ratio of arable to the whole territorial surface will be materially diminished strange then as the conclusion may appear we are compelled to admit that england at the close of the tenth century had advanced to a high pitch of cultivation while the impossibility of reckoning the hide at much above thirty saxon acres is demonstrated it is clear however the property of the land may have been distributed that the elements of wealth existed in no common degree the number of forty acres has of course been taken solely for the purpose of getting a common measure with the present acre assumed in the parliamentary survey whether it corresponded exactly with thirty thirty-two or thirty-three saxon acres it is impossible to say but i have shown that the difference could not be very great something may be alleged in favour of each of these numbers but on the whole the larger one of thirty-three acres seems to me the most probable a valuable entry of the year nine sixty seven may help us to some clearer conclusion in this document bishop oswald states himself to have made a grant of the third hind ditcot that is the third acre it is certain that at some very early period the word hund denoted ten whence we explain its occurrence in such numerals the word hind then i derive from this hund and render by tenth and the grant seems to have conveyed the third tenth which can only be said of a quantity containing three times ten units of some description or other but this third tenth is further described as being every third acre that is a third of the whole land and ten units make up this third it seems therefore not unreasonable to suppose that the acre was the unit in question that ten such acres constituted the hind and that the hind itself was the third part of the hide when we consider that thirty acres are exactly three times an area of forty times forty square rods there appears a probability that the measure was calculated upon a threefold course of cultivation similar to that in use upon the continent of europe 
this consisted of a rotation of winter corn summer corn and fallow and to each a block or telga of ten large or forty small acres roods was allotted thirty acres were thus devoted to cultivation but where was the home stall probably not upon the thirty acres themselves which we cannot suppose to have been generally enclosed and sundered but to have lain undivided as far as external marks were concerned in the general arable of the community the village containing the homesteads of the markers probably lay at a little distance from the fields and i do not think we shall be giving too much when we allow three acres over and above the thirty for farm buildings straw-yard and dwelling for we cannot doubt that stall feeding was the rule with regard to horned cattle in general in the same dialogue which has been already cited the ploughman is made to say i must fill the oxen's cribs with hay and give them water and bear out their dung moreover there must be room found for stacks of hay and wood for barns and outhouses and sleeping rooms both for the serfs and the members of the family nor are houses of more than one story very likely to have been built with this introduction i proceed to another grant of oswald in the year nine ninety six he gave three hides of land to eadric the property however lay in different places at eanol festun a hide and a half at upper stratford the second acre that is half a hide at vec and leah the third acre that is a third of a hide on the east of the river avon eight acres of meadow and onwards towards beckon cliff twelve acres and to the northward of the avon the three acres for a mill stall our data here are one and a half hide plus one half hide plus one third hide or two and a third hides but if the calculations which precede are correct eight plus twelve acres or twenty acres equals two-thirds hide and thus make up three hides of thirty acres each three acres devoted to mill buildings are not reckoned into the sum and it is therefore possible that a similar course was pursued with regard to the land occupied not by the mill stall but by the home stall having thus stated my own view of the approximate value of the hide i feel it right to cite one or two passages which seem adverse to it by a grant of the year nine seventy seven oswald conveyed to edelwald two hides all but sixty acres these sixty acres the bishop had taken into his own demesne or inland at kempsey as weedland now if this be an accurate reading and not by chance an ill-copied fifty four nine it would seem to imply that sixty acres were less than a hide for these acres were clearly arable again edel red granted land at stoke to leo frick in nine eighty two the estate conveyed was of three hides and thirty acres called in one charter jugera in another part of the same grant e cara it may be argued that here the acres were meadow or pasture not included in the arable but there are other calculations upon the juggerum which render it probable that less than our statute acre was intended by the term for example in eight thirty nine king edel wolf gave duda ten jagura within the walls of canterbury now canterbury at this day comprises only three thousand two hundred and forty acres and taking the area of almost any provincial town it seems hardly probable that ten full acres within the walls should have been granted to any person especially to one who like duda was of no very great consideration a town lot of two acres and a half or ten roods is conceivable the last example to be quoted is from a will of ilfgar a king's thane about nine fifty eight in this among other legacies he grants to edelgar a hide of one hundred and twenty acres in this instance i am inclined to think that the special description implies a difference from the usual computation if a hide were always one hundred and twenty acres why should elfgar think it necessary to particularize this one hide was there a large hide of one hundred and twenty as well as a small one of thirty in the other cases looking at the impossibility of assigning more than forty statute acres to the saxon hide so plainly demonstrated by the tables i suppose the equas to be small acres or roods 
it is scarcely necessary to say that where the number of hides mentioned in any place falls very far short of the actual acreage no argument can be derived anyway the utmost it proves is that only a certain amount however inconsiderable was under the plough thus beta tells us that anglesey contained nine hundred and sixty iona or hickolmkill only five hides the acreage of anglesey gives one hundred and fifty thousand acres under cultivation this would be one hundred and fifty six point thirty three per hide but in this island a very great reduction is necessary taking it even as it stands and calculating the hide at thirty acres we should have a ratio of twenty four to one hundred and one at forty acres a ratio of thirty two to ninety three or little more than one to three iona numbers about one thousand three hundred acres nearly two square miles this at five hides would give two hundred and sixty acres per hide at thirty acres a ratio of three to twenty three or nearly one to eight between cultivated and uncultivated land or at forty acres a ratio of two to eleven but the monks and their dependents were the only inhabitants and in the time of beta up to which there is no proof of the lands having been inhabited at all in fact it was selected expressly because a desert sand if not forest must have occupied a large proportion of the surface let us now retrace our steps for a few moments the hide was calculated upon the arable it was the measure of the allod the edel or inherited individual possession it was the lot or share of the first settler it kept a plough at work during the year and according to its etymology higid and the word familia by which it was translated it was to suffice for the support of one wis or household did it really so suffice at first and afterwards unquestionably it did we may safely assert this without entering into nice speculations as to the amount of population in the saxon kingdoms of the seventh eighth ninth or even eleventh centuries we know that in the eighth century one hundred and fifty hides were enough for the support and comfort of six hundred monks in yarrow and weir mouth there is no reason from their history to suppose that they were at all sparingly provided for but allowance must be made also for serfs and dependents the exercise of hospitality and charity the occasional purchase of books vestments and decorations the collection of relics and the maintenance of the fabric both of the church and monastery grants and presents offerings and foundations would do much but still some portion of these necessary expenses must be carried to the account of the general fund at this rate however one hide was capable of maintaining four full-grown men now even at the present day an industrious man can very well support his family upon not thirty or forty but ten acres of average land if we look at the produce of such a threefold course as has been mentioned there can hardly be any doubt upon the subject the cultivator would have every year twenty saxon equals twenty-six and two-thirds norman acres under some kind of corn principally barley in all probability though much wheat was grown assuming the yield at only two quarters per acre which is an almost ludicrous understatement of the probable amount we give each householder forty quarters of cereals at the various lowest and deducting his seed corn and the public taxes we still leave him a very large amount the average annual consumption of wheat per head in england is now computed at one quarter let us add one half to compensate for the less nutritious qualities of barley and we shall yet be under the mark if we allow our householder at the close of the year a net receipt of thirty quarters or food for at least twenty persons add to this the cattle and especially swine fed in the forest which paid well for their own keep and gave a net surplus and the churl or owner of one hide of land independently of his political rights becomes a person of some consideration from his property in short he is fully able to maintain himself his wife and child the ox that ploughs and the slave that tends his land owning much more indeed than in hesiod's eyes would have sufficed for these purposes it may be admitted that the skies of greece and italy showered kindlier rays upon the ionian or the latin than visited the rough denizen of our thule that less food of any kind and especially less meat was required for their support and that they felt no necessity to withdraw large amounts of barley from the annual yield for the purpose of producing fermented liquors still as far as the amount of land is concerned the advantage is incontestably on the side of the anglo-saxon and in this one element of wealth 
our churl was comparatively richer than the comrade of romulus or the worshipper of athene end of chapter four book one chapter five of saxons in england john mitchell kemble this librivox recording is in the public domain personal rank the freeman the noble the second principle laid down in the first chapter of this book is that of personal rank which in the teutonic scheme appears inseparably connected with the possession of land the earliest records we can refer to place before us a system founded upon distinctions of birth as clearly as any that we can derive from the parliamentary writs or rolls of later ages in our history there is not even a fabulous arcadia wherein we may settle a free democracy for even where the records of fact no longer supply a clue through the labyrinths of our early story the epic continues the tradition and still celebrates the deeds of nobles and of kings tacitus from whom we derive our earliest information and supplies us with many details which not only show the existence of a system but tend also to prove its long prevalence he tells us not only of nobles but also of kings princes and inherited authority more or less fully developed and the unbiased judgment of the statesman who witnessed the operation of institutions strange to himself warns us against theoretical appeals to the fancied customs of ages not contemporaneous with our own the history of europe knows nothing of a period in which there were not freemen nobles and serfs and the institutions of europe in proportion as we pursue them to their earliest principles furnish only the stronger confirmation of history we may no doubt theorize upon this subject and suggest elementary forms as the necessary conditions of a later system but this process is and must be merely hypothetical nor can such forms be shown to have had at any time a true historical existence that every german was in the beginning kaiser and pope in his own house may be perfectly true in one sense just as true it is it that every englishman's house is his castle nevertheless the german lived under some government civil or religious or both and to the great advantage of society the process of law surmounts without the slightest difficulty the imaginary battlements of the imaginary fortress the whole subject must be considered in one of two ways with reference namely to a man living alone with his family or to the same man and family in a bond of union with others that is in the state could we conceive a permanent condition of society such that each particular family lived apart without connection or communion with others we must admit the inevitable growth of a patriarchal system of which the eldest member of the family would be the head a system similar to that which we do find described as prevailing in the wandering family of abraham but such a condition could only exist at a period of time and in a state of the earth which admitted a frequent migration and while the population bore a small proportion to the means of support perhaps even in countries where water is of greater value than land thus the moment the family of abraham became too numerous and his herdsmen found it necessary to defend their wells and pastures against the herdsmen of lot a separation took place and the sheikhs parted according to the provisions of a solemn compact that there might not be strife between them but setting aside the mysterious purposes for which the race of abraham were made wanderers and which impress an exceptional character upon their whole history it is clear that even they were surrounded by a society whose conditions were totally different from any that could have existed in germany they fled from the face of a depraved cultivation prevalent in the cities and they were sojourners only from place to place till the fullness of time when they were to found the normal theocracy of the world to a certain degree they resembled the squatters in the backwoods of america like them they established a law for themselves and acted upon it with the nature of that law divine or human we have nothing to do for the purposes of this inquiry in this sense indeed they could be kings and priests in their own house but so are or were the north american regulators who in their own families and among all over whom they could establish their power 
acted as judges and both promulgated and executed a law which was necessary to their very existence in the wilderness but i find it impossible to admit that the origin of our germanic nations is to be found in any such solitary households or families were it true as moser appears to argue of some parts of westphalia it would not be so of other districts in southern germany as he indeed admits and particularly it would not be true of england in these two cases there can be no doubt that some kind of military organization preceded the peaceful settlement and in many respects determined its mode and character but even if we admit to the fullest extent the doctrine of solitary settlements we must still contend that these are in their very nature temporary that they contain no possible provision for stability in short that they are excluded by the very idea itself of a state yet it is as a member of a state that man exists that he is intended to exist and unless as a member of a state he is incapable of existing as a man he can as little create a language as create a state he is born to both for both and without both he cannot exist at all each single family then is a state two three or four families are a state under larger conditions how are these last to be settled where a number of independent households are thinly dispersed over a portion of the country their reciprocal relations and position will probably be more or less of the following kind some arrangement will exist for the regulation of the terms on which the use of the woods waters and common uncultivated land may be enjoyed by all the settlers it is even possible that they may have some common religious ceremonies as the basis of this arrangement but further than this there need be no union or mutual dependence each solitary homestead is a state by itself possessing the just belli in no federal relation to and consequently in a state of war with every other household even though this right of war should not be in active operation at any given moment in his own household every man may bear rule either following his own arbitrary will or in accordance with certain general principles which he probably recognizes in common with his neighbors he may have a family worship of his own of which he will be the chief priest and which worship may or may not be consistent with that of his neighbors if he is troublesome to them they may root him out slay or enslave him do with him what seems good in their eyes or whatsoever they have power to do if he thrives and accumulates wealth they may despoil him or he oppress them all however jury belli for there can be no jus imperii in such a case this however cannot be the normal state of man the anxious desire it might almost be called instinctive yearning to form a part of a civilized society forbids its continuance not less than the obvious advantage of entering into a mutual guarantee of peace and security the production of food and other necessaries of life is the first business of men the attempt to take forcible possession of or to defend accumulated property presupposes the accumulation while the land and water are more than sufficient for the support of the population the institutions proper to peace will prevail it is inconceivable and repugnant to the very nature of man that such institutions should not be established the moment that two or more separate families become conscious of each other's existence and in respect to our germanic forefathers we find such in full vigour from their very first appearance in history some of the institutions essential to the great aim of establishing civil society at the least possible sacrifice of individual freedom such as the vergilt the frank pledge etc will be investigated in their proper places they seem to offer a nearly perfect guarantee for society at an early period but for the present we must confine ourselves to the subject of personal rank and as the centre and groundwork of the whole teutonic scheme is the individual free man it is with him that we must commence our investigation the natural divisions into which all human society must be distributed with respect to the beings that form it are the free and the unfree those who can protect themselves and those who must be in the protection of others even in the family this distinction must be found and the wife and son are unfree in relation to the husband and father they are in his mund from this mund the son indeed may be emancipated but not the wife or daughter these can only change it 
the wife by the act of god namely the death of the husband the daughter by marriage in both cases the mund passes over into other hands originally the free man is he who possesses at least as much land as being tilled will feed him strength and skill to labour and arms to defend his possession married to one free woman who shares his toils soothes his cares and orders his household he becomes the founder of the family the first unit in the state the son who springs from this marriage completes the family and centres in himself the blood the civil rights and the affections of his two progenitors it is thus through the son that the family becomes the foundation of the state the union of a greater or less number of free heads of houses upon a district sufficient for their support in a mutual guarantee of equal civil rights is the state itself for man is evidently formed by god to live in a regulated community by which mode of life alone he can develop the highest qualities of the nature which god has implanted in him and the first community is the union of free men for purposes of friendly intercourse and mutual aid each enjoying at the hands of every other the same rights as he is willing to grant to every other each yielding something of his natural freedom in order that the idea of state that is of orderly government may be realized for the state is necessary not accidental man not living in a state not having developed and in some degree realize the idea of state is in so far not man but beast he has no past and no future he lives for the day and does not even accumulate for the days to come he lives thinks feels and dies like a brute for man is free through the existence not the absence of law through his voluntary and self-conscious relinquishment of the power to do wrong and the adoption of means to counteract and diminish his own tendency to evil the amount of personal liberty to be given up is the only question of practical importance but from the idea of freedom itself results the law that this amount must be in all cases a minimum the ideas of freedom and equality are not however inseparable a nation of slaves may exist in sorrowful equality under the capricious will of a native or foreign tyrant a nation of free men may cheerfully wisely and happily obey the judge or the captain they have elected in the exigencies of peace and war hence the voluntary union of freemen does not exclude the possibility of such union being either originally based upon terms of inequality or becoming sooner or later settled upon such a basis but as the general term is the freedom i take this as the unity which involves the difference the noble is one of the freemen and is made noble by the act of the free the free are not made so by the noble by these principles the divisions of this chapter are regulated the free man is emphatically called man churl mas meritus wapnid man armatus after the prevalence of slavery he is for distinction termed free frig man friels that is free neck the hand of the master has not bent his neck but his oldest and purest denomination is churl till a very late period the anglo-saxon law knows no other distinction than that of churl and earl the old norse rigsmal which is devoted to the origin of the races considers karl as the representative of the free man the names of his sons and daughters are terms yet that survive to represent various classes of freemen in almost every germanic country the rights of a freeman are these he has land within the limits of the community the hereditary estate by virtue of which he is a portion of the community bound to various duties and graced with his various privileges for although his rights are personal inherent in himself and he may carry them with him into the wilderness if he please still where he shall be permitted to execute them depends upon his possession of lands in the various localities in these he is entitled to vote with his fellows upon all matters concerning the general interests of the community the election of a judge general or king the maintenance of peace or war with a neighboring community the abrogation of old or the introduction of new laws the admission of coterminous freemen to a participation of rights and privileges in the district he is not only entitled but bound to share in the celebration of the public rites of religion to assist at the public council or thing where he is to pronounce the customary law by ancient right and so assist in judging between man and man 
lastly to take part as a soldier in such measures of offence and defence as have been determined upon by the whole community he is at liberty to make his own alliances to unite with other freemen in the formation of guilds or associations for religious or political purposes he can even attach himself if he will to a lord or patron and thus withdraw himself from the duties and the privileges of freedom he and his family may depart whither he will and no man may follow or prevent him but he must go by open day and publicly probably not without befitting ceremonies and a symbolical renunciation of his old seats that all may have their claims upon him settled before he departs the freeman must possess and may bear arms he is born to them he wears them on all occasions public and private he is entitled to use them for the defence of his life and honour for he possesses the right of private warfare and either alone or with the aid of his friends may fight if it seems good to him this right is technically named feud and to be exposed to it is barren to bear the feud if he be strong enough or ill-disposed enough to prefer violent to a peaceful settlement of his claims he may attack imprison and even slay his adversary but then he must bear the feud of the relations beside the arms he wears the sign and ornament of his freedom is the long hair which he suffers to float upon his shoulders or winds about his head his proper measure and value by which his social position is ascertained and defended is the weirgild or price of a man his life his limbs the injuries which may be done to himself his dependents and his property are all duly assessed and though not rated so highly as the noble yet he stands above the stranger the serf or the freedman in like manner his land though not entirely exempt from charges and payments for public purposes is far less burthened than the land of the unfree moreover he possesses rights in the commons woods and waters which the unfree were assuredly not permitted to exercise the great and essential distinction however which he never entirely loses under any circumstances is that he aids in governing himself that is in making applying and executing the laws by which the free and the unfree are alike governed that he yields in short a voluntary obedience to the law for the sake of living under a law in an orderly and peaceful community in the state of things which we are now considering the noble belongs to the class of freemen out of it he springs in all its rights and privileges he shares to all its duties he is liable but in a different degree he possesses however certain advantages which the free man does not like the latter he is a holder of real estate he owns land in the district but his lot is probably larger and is moreover free from various burdens which press upon his less fortunate neighbour he must also take part in the thing placitum or general meeting but he and his class have the leading and directing of the public business and ultimately the execution of the general will the people at large may elect but he alone can be elected to the offices of priest judge or king upon his life and dignity a higher price is laid than upon those of the mere freeman he is the unity in the mass the representative of the general sovereignty both at home and abroad the tendency of his power is continually to increase while that of the mere freeman is continually to diminish falling in the scale in exact proportion as that of the noble class rises the distinctive name of the noble is earl words representing nobility and power denote his qualities and he bears other titles according to the accidents of his social position thus elder elder man principal wit consul optimum senior proctor better in addition to his own personal privileges the noble possesses in the fullest extent every right of the freeman the highest order of whose body he forms end of chapter five book one chapter six of saxons in england john mitchell kemble this librivox recording is in the public domain the king as the noble is to the freeman so in some respects is the king to the noble he is the summit of his class and completes the order of the freemen even in the dim twilight 
of teutonic history we find tribes and nations subject to kings others again acknowledge no such office and tacitus seems to regard this state as the more natural to our forefathers i do not think this clear on the contrary kingship in a certain sense seems to me rooted in the german mind and institutions and universal among some particular tribes and confederacies the free people recognize in the king as much of the national unity as they consider necessary to their existence as a substantive body and as the representative of the whole nation they consider him to be a mediator between themselves and the gods the elective principle is the safeguard of their freedom the monarchical principle is the condition of their nationality but this idea of kingship is not that which we now generally entertain it is in some respects more in others less comprehensive and here it seems necessary to recur to a definition of words with us a king is the source both of the military and the judicial powers he is chief judge and general in chief among protestants he is head of the church and only wants the functions of high priest because the nature of the church of christ admits of no priestly body exclusively engaged in the sacrifices or in possession of the exclusive secrets of the cult but in the eye of the state and as the head of a state clergy he is the high priest the authority in which ultimately even the parochial order centres and finds its completion he is an officer of the state the highest indeed and the noblest but to the state he belongs as a part of itself with us a commission of regency a stranger or a woman may perform all the functions of royalty the houses of parliament may limit them a successful soldier may usurp them with the early germans the king was something different from this the inhabitants of the mark of Ga, however numerous or however few they may be must always have some provision for the exigencies of peace and war but peace is the natural or normal state that for which war itself exists and the institutions proper to war are the exception not the rule hence the priestly and judicial functions are permanent the military merely temporary the former whether united in the same person or divided between two or more are the necessary conditions of the existence of the state as a community the latter are merely requisite from time to time to secure the free exertion of the former to defend the existence of the community against the attacks of other communities we may admit that the father is the first priest and judge in his own household he has above all other the sacerdotal secrets and the peculiar rites of family worship these not less than age experience and the dignity of paternity are the causes and the justification of his power the judicial is a corollary from the sacerdotal authority but what applies to the individual household applies to any aggregate of households even as the family worship and the family peace require the exertion of these powers for their own maintenance and preservation so do the public worship and the public peace require their existence though in a yet stronger degree from among the heads of families some one or more must be elected to discharge the all-important functions which they imply if the solemn festivals and the public rites of the god are to be duly celebrated if the anger of the thunderer is to be propitiated and the fruits of the earth to be blessed if the wounded cattle are to be healed the fever expelled or the secret malice of evil spirits to be defeated who but the priest can lead the ceremonies and prescribe the ritual who but he can sanctify the transfer of land the union of man and wife the entrance of the newborn child upon his career of life who but himself can conduct judicial investigations where the deities are the only guardians of truth and avengers of perjury or where their supernatural power alone can determine between innocence and guilt lastly who but he can possess authority to punish the freeman for offences dangerous to the well-being of all freemen to what power less than that of god will the free man condescend to bow how then is it to be determined to whom such power once admitted to be necessary shall be at first entrusted the first claim clearly lies with those who are believed to be descended from the gods or from the local god of each particular district 
they are his especial care his children he led them into the land and gave them the secret of appeasing or pleasing him he protects them by his power and guides them by his revelations he is their family and household god the progenitor of their race one of themselves and they are the best indeed the only expounders of his will a single family with which others have by slow degrees united themselves by which others have been adopted and which in process of time have thus become the nucleus of a state will probably remain in possession of this sacerdotal power the god of the land does not readily give place to others and those with whom his worship identifies him will continue to be his priests long after others have joined in their ceremonies or it is possible that a single household wandering from a more civilized community may be admitted among a rude people to whom they impart more perfect methods of tillage more efficient medical precepts more impartial maxims of law better or more ornamental modes of architecture or more accurate computations of time than they had previously possessed the mysterious courses of the stars the secrets of building bridges towers and ships of ploughing and of sowing of music and of healing have been committed to them by their god for the sake of the benefits they offer their god is received into the community and they remain his priests because they alone are cognizant of and can conduct the rites wherewith he is to be served even in periods so remote as not to be confounded with those of national mag a small body of superior personal strength physical beauty mental organization or greater skill in arms may establish a preponderance over a more numerous but less favored race in such a case they will probably join the whole mass of the people receiving or taking lands among them and they will by right of their superiority constitute a noble sacerdotal royal race among a race of freemen they may introduce their religion as well as their form of government as did the dorians in the peloponnesus or if as must frequently be the case a compromise take place they and their god will reserve the foremost rank although the conquered or otherwise subjected people may retain a share in the state and vindicate for their ancient deities a portion of reverence and cult the gods of nature of the earth and agriculture thus yield for a while to the supremacy of the gods of mental cultivation and warlike prowess demeter gives way before apollo afterwards however to recover a portion of her splendour odin obtains the soul of the warrior and the freeman thor must content himself with that of the thrall in all the cases described to which we may add violent conquest by a migratory body leaving only garrisons and governors behind it the family or tribe which are the ruling tribe are those in whom the highest rank dignity nobility and power are inherent but unless some peculiar circumstances arising within the ruling tribe itself limit the succession to the members of one household as for example among the jews the sanctity of the tribe will be general and not individual they will be alone qualified to hold the high and sacred offices but the will of the whole state that is popular election must determine which particular man shall be invested with their functions out of the noble race the election cannot indeed be made but the choice of the individual noble is at first free this is the simplest mode of stating the problem history however is filled with examples of compromise where two or more noble tribes divide the supreme authority in even or uneven shares two kings for instance represent two tribes of the durians in the spartan politia the seven great and hereditary ministerial houses in the german empire the five great ulus of the durrani afghans with their hereditary offices represent similar facts among the old bavarians the agilophlings could alone hold the ducal dignity but three or four other families possessed a peculiar nobility raising them nearly as much above the rest of the nobles as the nobles were raised above the rest of the people under these circumstances the attributes of sovereignty may be continually apportioned to one family it may belong to furnish kings or judges to another generals to a third priests or this division may have arisen in course of time within a single family or again the general may only have been chosen pro re nata when the necessity of the case required it from among the judges or priests or even from among those who were not capable by birth of the judicial or sacerdotal power we are able to refer to an instance in support of this assertion beta says of the old saxons what tacitus asserts of the germanic races generally 
the early separation of the judicial from the strictly sacerdotal functions to a certain degree at least is easily conceived it would be mere matter of convenience as soon as the population became numerous and widely dispersed yet to a very late period among the teutons we find traces of the higher character the ordeal or judgment of god the casting of lots and divination are all derived from and connected with priesthood the heathen place of judgment was sanctified to the gods by priestly ceremonies nor can it be supposed that the popular councils were held without a due inauguration by religious rites or a marked exertion of authority by the priests tacitus speaking of these parliaments makes the intervention of the priests the very first step to business the parliaments of later times was opened by the celebration of mass and even yet mr speaker goes to prayers during the flourishing period of christianity among the anglo-saxons synods of the bishops and their clergy were commanded to be held twice a year to act as supreme courts of justice at least in civil causes the law of the visigoths while it recognizes a separation of the persons implies a confusion of the jurisdiction the people it is true found the judgment or verdict but the judge declared the law pronounced the sentence and most probably superintended the execution in this he represented at once the justice of the god and the collective power of the state thus then we may conclude that at first in every mark and more especially in every state when various marks had coalesced there was found at least one man of a privileged family who either permanently or for a time conducted the public affairs during peace and was from his functions not less than his descent nearly connected with the religion of the people and the worship of the gods whether this man be called elderman seems of little moment he is the president of the freemen in their solemn acts as long as peace is maintained the original king of the shire or small nation if he be by birth a priest and distinguished by military talents as well as elected to be a judge he unites all the conditions of kingship and under such circumstances he will probably not only extend his power over neighboring communities but even render it permanent if not hereditary in his own a similar process may take place if the priest or judge be one the general another of the same household we may conclude that the regal power grows out of the judicial and sacerdotal and that whether the military skill and authority be superadded or not king is only another name for the judge of a small circuit it is only when many such districts have been combined when many such smaller kings have been subdued by one more wise more wealthy powerful or fortunate than themselves that the complete idea of the german kingdom develops itself that the judicial military and even in part the priestly powers sink into a subordinate position and the kingdom represents the whole state the free men the nobles and the fulcrate or public law of both it is thus that the king gains the ultimate and appellate jurisdiction the right of punishment and the general conservancy of the peace as well as the power of calling the freemen to arms when this process has taken place the former kings have become eldermen they retain their nobility their original purity of blood their influence perhaps over their people but they have sunk into subordinate officers of a state of which a king at once hereditary and elective is the head we are tolerably familiar with the fact that at least eight kingdoms existed at once in saxon england but many readers of english history have yet to learn that royalty was much more widely spread even at the time when we hear but of eight seven or six predominant kings as this is a point of some interest a few examples may not be amiss it is probable that from the very earliest times kent had at least two kings whose capitals were respectively canterbury and rochester the seat of two bishoprics the distinction of east and west kentings is preserved till the very downfall of the saxon monarchy not only do we know that edric and hethel here reigned together but also that withdred and his son ethelbert the second did so oswin is mentioned as a king of kent during the period when our general authorities tell us of ecbert alone contemporary with him we have swed heard another king and all these extend into the period usually given to edric and hethel here the later years of ethelbert the second must have seen his power shared with edbert erd wolf sigurd and ecbert and sigurd deliberately calls himself king of half kent a very remarkable document of edbert is preserved in the textus rofensis after the king's own signature in which he calls himself rex cantuororium his nobles place their names as rulers 
now the fact of these persons having comatus at all is only conceivable on the supposition that they were all royal kings or sub-kings that they were subordinate appears from the necessity of the grant being confirmed by edelbert which took place in presence of the granter and grantee and the archbishop at canterbury among the kings of this small province are also named ethelric herdbert edbert pren and earl hund the last prince father of the celebrated egbert of wessex among the territories which at one time or another were incorporated with the kingdom of mercia one is celebrated under the name of hawicus it comprised the then diocese of worcester this small province not only retained its king till a late period but had frequently several kings at once thus osric and ashir ethelweird ethelherd ethelric in all probability oswudu between years seven hundred and four to seven hundred and nine a few years later viz between the years seven fifty seven and seventeen eighty five we find three brothers Ainbert, ealdred and utred claiming the royal title in the same district while offa their relative swayed the paramount sceptre of mercia that other parts of that great kingdom had always formed separate states is certain even in the time of penda who reigned from six twenty six to six fifty six we know that the middle angles were ruled by beda his son while merewald another son was king of the west Tukan, or people of herefordshire in the important battle of winwidfeld where the fall of penda perhaps secured the triumph of christianity we learn that thirty royal commanders fell on the mercian side under ethelred penda's son and successor we find borwald calling himself a king in mercia during the reign of Sentwine in wessex we hear of a king baldred whose kingdom probably comprised sussex and part of hampshire at the same period also we find ethelherd calling himself king of wessex and perhaps also brother ethelweird unless this be an error of transcription frewald in a charter to the monastery of chertsey mentions the following sub regularly as concurring in the grant osric wickard and ethelwald there was a kingdom of elmet in yorkshire and even till the tenth century one of bamborough the same facts might easily be shown of east anglia essex and northumberland were it necessary but enough seems to have been said to show how numerously peopled with kings this island always full of kings must have been in times where of history has no record from all that has preceded it is clear that by the term king we must understand something very different among the anglo-saxons from the sense which we attach to the word one principal difference lies indeed in this that the notion of territorial influence is never for a single moment involved in it the kings are kings of tribes and peoples but never of the land they occupy kings of the west saxons the mercians or the kentings but not of wessex mercia or kent so far indeed is this from being the case that there is not the slightest difficulty in forming the conception of a king totally without a kingdom the norse traditions are full of similar facts the king is in truth essentially one with the people from among them he springs by them in their power he reigns from them he receives his name but his land is like theirs private property one estate does not owe allegiance to another as in the feudal system at least of all is the monstrous fiction admitted even for a moment that the king is owner of all the land in a country the teutonic names for a king are numerous and various especially in the language of poetry many of them are immediately derived from the words which denote the aggregations of the people themselves but the term which among all the teutons properly denotes this dignity is derived from the fact which tacitus notices viz the nobility of the king the anglo-saxon sinning is a direct derivative from the adjective sign generous and this again from sin genus the main distinction between the king and the rest of the people lies in the higher value set upon his life as compared with theirs as the weir guild of or life price of the noble exceeds that of the free man or the slave so does the life price of the king exceed that of the noble like all the people he has a money value but it is a greater one than is enjoyed by any other person in the state so again his protection is valued higher than that of any other and the breach of his peace is more costly to the wrongdoer he is naturally the president of the state and the ecclesiastical synod and the supreme conservator of the public peace 
to the king belonged the right of calling out the national levies the posse comitatus for purposes of attack or defence the privilege of recommending grave causes at least to the consideration of the tribunals the reception of a certain share of the fines legally inflicted on evildoers and of voluntary gifts from the freemen and as a natural and rapid consequence the levy of taxes and the appointment of fiscal officers consonant with his dignity were the ceremonies of his recognition by the people and the outward marks of distinction which he bore immediately upon his election he was raised upon a shield and exhibited to the multitude who greeted him with acclamations even in heathen times it is probable that some religious ceremony accompanied the solemn rite of election and installation the christian priesthood soon caused the ceremony of anointing the new king perhaps as head of the church to be looked upon as a necessary part of his inauguration to him were appropriated the wagon and oxen in this he visited the several portions of his kingdom traversed the roads and proclaimed his peace upon them and i am inclined to think solemnly ascertained and defined the national boundaries a duty symbolical in some degree of his guardianship of the private boundaries among all the tribes there appear to have been some outward marks of royalty occasionally or constantly born the merwingian kings were distinguished by their long and flowing hair the goths by a fillet or cap among the saxons the sinhelm or sinabia a circle of gold was in use and worn round the head in the thing or popular council he bore a wand or staff in war time he was preceded by a banner or flag the most precious however of all the royal rights and a very jewel in the crown was the power to entertain a comitus or collection of household retainers a subject to be discussed in a subsequent chapter the king like all other free men was a landed possession and depended for much of his subsistence upon the cultivation of his estates in various parts of the country he held lands in absolute property furnished with dwellings and storehouses in which the produce of his farms might be laid up and from one to another of which he proceeded as political exigencies caprice or the consumption of his hoarded stock rendered expedient in each villa was placed a bailiff whose business it was to watch over the king's interests to superintend the processes of husbandry and govern the laborers employed in production above all to represent the king as regarded the freemen and the officers of the county court the lot share of the king though thus divided was extensive and comprised many times the share of the freeman we may imagine that it originally and under ordinary circumstances would be calculated upon the same footing as the weirgild that if the life of the king was seventy-two times as valuable as that of the jurl his land would be seventy-two times as large if the one owned thirty the other would enjoy two thousand one hundred and sixty acres of arable land but the comitatus offers a disturbing force which it will hereafter be seen renders this sort of calculation nugatory in practice and the experience of later periods clearly proves the king to have been a landowner in a very disproportionate degree in addition to the produce of his own lands however the king was entitled to expect voluntary gifts in kind naturalia from the people which are not only distinctly stated by tacitus to have been so given but are frequently referred to by early continental historians in process of time when these voluntary gifts had been converted into settled payments or taxes further voluntary aids were demanded upon the visit of a king to a town or country the marriage of a princess or of the king himself and other public and solemn occasions from which in feudal times arose the custom of demanding aids from the tenants to knight the lord's son or marry his daughter another source of royal revenue was a share of the booty taken in war where the king and the freemen served together the celebrated story of clovis and the soissons base proves that the king received his portion by lot as did the rest of his army but there is no reason to doubt that his share as much exceeded that of his comrades as his weir guilt and landed possessions were greater than theirs as conservator of the public peace the king was entitled to a portion of the fines inflicted on criminals and the words in which tacitus mentions this fact show that he was in this function the representative of the whole state it is a prerogative derived from his executive power and similar to this is his right to the forfeited lands of felons which if they were to be forfeited could hardly be placed in other hands than those of the king as representative of the whole state 
in proportion as this idea gains ground the influence of the king in every detail of public life necessarily increases and the regalia or royal rights become more varied and numerous he is looked upon as the protector of the stranger who has no other natural guardian inasmuch as no stranger can be a member of any of those associations which are the guarantee of the free man he has the sole right of settling the value and form of the medium of exchange through his power of calling out the armed force he obtains rights which can only consist with martial law even the right of life and death the justice of the whole country flows from him the establishment of fiscal officers dependent upon himself places the private possessions of the freeman at his disposal the peculiar conservancy of the peace and command over the means of internal communication enable him to impose tolls on land and water carriage he is thus also empowered to demand the services of the freemen to receive and conduct travelling strangers heralds or ambassadors from one royal vill to another to demand the aid of their carts and horses to carry forage provisions or building materials to his royal residence treasure at trove is his because where there is no owner the state claims the accidental advantage and the king is the representative of the state it is part of his dignity that he may command the aid of the freemen in his hunting and fishing and hence that he may compel them to keep his hawks and hounds in harbour or feed his huntsmen as head of the church he has an important influence in the election of bishops even in the establishment of new sees or the abolition of old established ones his authority it is that appoints the duke the gareffa perhaps even the members of the state above all he has the right to divest himself of a portion of these attributes and confer them upon those whom he pleases in different districts the complete description of the rights of royalty in all their detail will find a place in the second book of this work they can only be noticed cursorily here inasmuch as they appertain in strictness to a period in which the monarchical spirit and the institutions proper thereto have become firmly settled and applied to every part of our social scheme but whatever extension they may have attained in process of time they have their origin in the rights permitted to the king even in the remotest periods of which we read there cannot be the least doubt that many of them were usurpations gradual developments of an old and simple principle and it is only in periods of advanced civilization that we find them alluded to nevertheless we must admit that even at the earliest recorded time in our history the kings were not only wealthy but powerful far beyond any of their fellow-countrymen all intercourse with foreign nations whether warlike or peaceful tends to this result because treaties and grave affairs of state can best be negotiated and managed by single persons a popular council may be very properly consulted as to the final acceptance or rejection of terms but the settlement of them can obviously not be beneficially conducted by so unwieldy a multitude moreover contracting parties on either side will prefer having to do with as small a number of negotiators as possible if it be only for the greater dispatch of business accordingly tacitus shows us on more than one occasion the senate in communication with the princes not the populations of germany and this must naturally be the case where the aristocracy to whose body the king belongs have the right of taking the initiative in public business but although we find a great difference in the social position wealth and power of the king and those of the noble and freemen we are not to imagine that he could at any time exercise his royal prerogatives entirely at his royal pleasure held in check by the universal love of liberty by the rights of his fellow nobles and the defensive alliances of the freemen he enjoyed indeed a rank a splendour and an influence which placed him at the head of his people a limited monarchy but happier than a capricious autocracy and the historian who had groaned over the vices and tyranny of tiberius nero and domitian could give the noble boon of his testimony to the eternal memory of the barbarous arminius end of chapter six book one chapter seven of saxons in england by john mitchell kemble this librivox recording is in the public domain the noble by service i have called the right to entertain a comitatus or body of household retainers a very jewel in the crown it was so because it formed in process of time the foundation of all the extended powers which became the attributes of royalty 
and finally succeeded in establishing upon the downfall of the old dynasts or nobles by birth a new order of nobles by service whose root was in the crown itself a close investigation of its gradual rise progress and ultimate development will show that the natural basis of the comitatus is in the superior wealth and large possessions of the prince in all ages of the world and under all conditions of society one profound problem has presented itself for solution viz how to reconcile the established divisions of property with the necessities of increasing population experience teaches us that under almost any circumstances of social being a body of men possessed of sufficient food and clothing have been found to increase and multiply with a rapidity far too great to be balanced by the number of natural or violent deaths and it follows therefore that in every nation which has established a settled number of households upon several estates each capable of supporting but one household in comfort the means of providing for a surplus population must very soon become an object of general difficulty if the paternal estate be reserved for the support of one son if the paternal weapons descend to him to be used in the feuds of his house or the service of the state what is to become of the other sons who are excluded from the benefits of the succession in a few instances we may imagine natural affection to have induced a painful and ultimately unsuccessful struggle to keep the family together here and there cases may have occurred in which a community was fortunate enough from its position to possess the means of creating new estates to suit the new demand and conquest or the forcible partition of a neighbouring territory may have supplied a provision for the new generation yet tradition contradicts this and speaks of the exposure of children immediately after birth leaving it to the will of the father to save the life of the child or not and similarly the tales of the north record the solemn and voluntary expatriation of a certain proportion of the people designated by lot at certain intervals of time however in the natural course of things he who cannot find subsistence at home must seek it abroad if the family estate will not supply him with support he must strive to obtain it from the bounty or necessities of others for emigration has its own heavy charges and for this he would require assistance and in a period such as we are describing trade and manufacture offer no resources to the surplus population but all the single hides or estates are here considered as included in the same category and it is only on the large possessions of the noble that the poor freeman can hope to live without utterly forfeiting everything that makes life valuable some sort of service he must yield in among all that he can offer military service the most honourable and attractive to himself is sure to be the most acceptable to the lord whose protection he requires the temptation to engage in distant or dangerous warlike adventures may not appear very great to the agricultural settler whose continuous labour will only wring a mere sufficiency from the soil he owns it is with regret and reluctance that such a man will desert the land he has prepared for crops he has raised even when the necessity of self-defence calls the community to arms far otherwise however is it with him who has no means of living by the land or whom his means place above the necessity of careful unremitting toil the prince enriched by the contributions of his fellow-countrymen and the presence of neighbouring states or dynasts as well as master of more land than he requires for his own subsistence has leisure for ambition and power to reward its instruments on the land which he does not require for his own cultivation he can permit the residence of free men or even serfs on such conditions as may seem expedient to himself or endurable to them he may surround himself with armed and noble retainers attracted by his liberality or his civil and military reputation whom he feeds at his own table and houses under his own roof who may perform even servile duties in his household and on whose aid he may calculate for purposes of aggression or defence 
nor does it seem probable that a community would at once discover the infinite danger to themselves that lurks in such an institution far more frequently must it have seemed matter of congratulation to the cultivator that its existence spared him the necessity of leaving the plough and harrow to resist sudden incursions or enforce measures of internal police or that the strong castle with its band of ever watchful defenders existed as a garrison near the disputable boundary of the mark the germania of tacitus supplies us with a detailed account of the institution of the comitatus which receives strong confirmation on every point from what we gather from other authentic sources in his own words illustrious birth or the great services of their fathers give the rank of princes even to young men they are associated with the rest who have already made proof of their greater powers nor is there any shame in appearing among the comitus moreover the comitatus itself has its grades according to the judgment of him they follow and great is the emulation among the comitus as to who shall hold the highest place in the estimation of the prince and among the princes as to who shall have the most numerous and the bravest comitus this is dignity this is power to be ever surrounded with a troop of chosen youths a glory in time of peace and a support in war nor is it only in their own tribe but in the neighbouring states as well a name and glory to be distinguished for the number and valour of the comitatus for they are courted with embassies and adorned with presents and keep off wars by their very reputation when it comes to fighting it is dishonourable for the prince to be excelled in valour for the comitatus not to equal the valour of the prince but infamous and a reproach throughout life to return from battle the survivor of the prince to defend and protect him to reckon to his glory even one's own brave deeds this is the first and holiest duty the princes fight for victory the comitatus for the prince if the state in which they spring is torpid with long peace and ease the most of these young nobles voluntarily seek such nations as may be engaged in war partly because inaction does not please this race partly because distinction is more easy of attainment under difficulties nor can you keep together a great comitatus save by violence and war since it is from the liberality of the prince that they exact that war-horse that bloody and victorious lance for feasts and meals ample though rude take the place of pay wars and plunder supply the means of munificence nor will you so readily persuade them to plough the land or wait with patience for the year as to challenge enemies and earned wounds seeing that it seems dull and lazy to acquire with sweat what you may win with blood it would be difficult in a few lines to give anything like so clear and admirable an account of the peculiarities of the comitatus as tacitus has left us in this vigorous sketch and little remains but to show how his view is confirmed by other sources of information and to draw the conclusions which naturally result from these premises to the influence and operation of these associations are justly attributed not only the conquests of the various tribes but the most important modifications in the law of the people as the proper name for the freeman is churl and for the born noble earl so is the true word for the commas or comrade jessith this is in close etymological connection with sith a journey and literally denotes one who accompanies another the functions and social position of the jessith led however to another appellation in the peculiar relation to the prince he is a thane strictly and originally servant or minister and only noble when the service of royalty has shed a light upon dependence and imperfect freedom beowulf describes himself as the relative and thane of higelac but his royal blood and dried valour make him also the head of a comitatus and he visits hort with a selected band of his own comrades they like himself belong however to his lord and are described as higelac's sharers in the monarch's table and hearth a portion of the booty taken in war naturally became the property of the jessithus but one amusing author tells us how on some occasion in consequence of there being no queen in a court 
the comatists were ill supplied with clothes a difficulty which they could only provide against by inducing their king to marry there seems no reason to doubt the fact thus recorded however we may judge respecting its occurrence in the time of frotho similarly when siegfried set out upon his fatal marriage expedition into burgundy he and his twelve comrades were clothed by the care of the royal siglant from this relation between the prince and the comatists are derived the names appropriated to the former in the epopoeia of hayford lord literally bread giver distributor of treasure and the like it is clear also that a right to any share in the booty could not be claimed by the jesseth as it undoubtedly could by the free soldier in the haraban but depended entirely upon the will of the chief and his notions of policy a right could not have been described as the result of his liberality in the historical time of charlemagne we have evidence of this the share of the free man who did not serve under a lord was his own by lot and seeing where all was left to the arbitrary disposition of the chief the subservience of a follower would very naturally become the measure of his liberality the relation of the comatus was one of fealty it was undertaken in the most solemn manner and with appropriate symbolic ceremonies out of which in later times sprung homage and the other incidents of feudality all history proves that it was of the most intimate nature that even life itself was to be sacrificed without hesitation if the safety of the prince demanded it the jessithus of beowulf exposed themselves with him to the attack of the fiendish grendel wiglaf risks his own life to assist his lord and relative in his fatal contest with the fire drake and the solemn denunciation which he pronounces against the remaining comatus who neglected this duty recalls the words of tacitus and the infamy that attaches to the survivors of their chief but we are not compelled to draw upon the stores of poetry and imaginative tradition alone the sober records of our earlier analysts supply ample evidence and corroboration of the philosophical historian when quickhelm of wessex sent an assassin to cut off a duny of northumberland that prince was saved by the devotion of his thane lilla who threw himself between and received the blow that was destined for his master in the words of beta again we learn that in the year seven eighty six sign heard an etheling of wessex who had pretensions to the crown surprised the king cinewulf at the house of a paramour at merton and there slew him he proffered wealth and honours to the comatus of the king which they refused and with small numbers manfully held out till every one had fallen on the following morning a superior force of the king's thanes came up to them again the etheling offered land and gold but in vain he was slain on the spot with all his own comatus who refused to desert him in his extremity this is the account given in the saxon chronicle at the word lawrence of worcester and henry of huntingdon all follow the chronicle which in some details they apparently translate william of malmesbury seems to adopt the same account but adds a few words which have a special reference to this portion of the argument it is obvious that from this intimate relation between the prince and the gesseth must arise certain reciprocal rights and duties sanctioned by custom which would gradually form themselves into a code of positive law and ultimately affect the state and condition of the free men in the earliest development of the comitatus it is clear that the idea of freedom is entirely lost it is replaced by the much more questionable motive of honour or to speak more strictly of rank and station the commis may indeed have become the possessor of land even of very large tracts by gift from his prince but he could not be the possessor of a free hide and consequently bound to service in the general ferd or to suit in the folk moat he might have wealth and rank and honour be powerful and splendid dignified and influential but he could not be free and if even the free man so far forgot the inherent dignity of his station as to carry himself into the service of the prince an individual man although a prince and not as yet the state or the representative of the state can it be doubted that the remunerative service of the chief would outweigh the barren possession of the farmer or that the festive board and adventurous life of the castle would soon supply excuses for neglecting the humbler duties of the popular court and judicature even if the markmen raised him from their role 
and committed his ethel to a worthier holder what should he care whom the liberality of his conquering leader could endow with fifty times its worth and whose total divorce from the vulgar community would probably be looked upon with no disfavour by him who had already marked the community for his prey nor could those whom the jesseth in turn settled upon lands which were not within the general mark jurisdiction be free markmen but must have stood towards him in somewhat the same relation as he stood to his own chief upon the plan of the larger household the smaller would also be formed the same or similar conditions of tenure would prevail and the services of his dependents he was no doubt bound to hold at the disposal of his own lord and to maintain for his advantage we have thus even in the earliest times the nucleus of a standing army the means and instruments of aggrandizement both for the king and the praetorian cohorts themselves practised and delighting in battle ever ready to join in expeditions which promised adventure honour or plunder feasted in time of peace enriched in time of war holding the bond that united them to their chief as more sacred or stringent than even that of blood and consequently ready for his sake to turn their arms against the free settlers in the district whenever his caprice his passion or his ambition called upon their services in proportion as his power and dignity increased by their efforts and assistance so their power and dignity increased his rank and splendour were reflected upon all that surrounded him till at length it became not only more honourable to be the unfree chattel of a prince than the poor free cultivator of the soil but even security for possession and property could only be attained within the compass of their body as early as the period when the frankish law was compiled we find the great advantage enjoyed by the comus over the free salian or riparian in the large proportion borne by his vir gilt in comparison with that of the latter the advantage derived by the community from the presence and protection of an armed force such as the gesiphus constituted must have gradually produced a disposition to secure their favour even at the expense of the free nobles and settlers and a mark that wished to entrust its security and its interest to a powerful soldier would probably soon acquiesce in his assuming a direction and leadership in their affairs hardly more consistent with their original liberty than the influence which a modern nobleman may establish by watching as it is called over the interests of the registration even the old nobles by blood who gradually beheld themselves forced down into a station of comparative poverty and obscurity must have early hastened to give in their adhesion to a new order of things which held out peculiar prospects of advantage to themselves and thus the communities deserted by their natural leaders soon sunk into a very subordinate situation became portions of larger unities under the protection and ultimately the rule of successful adventurers and consented without a struggle to receive their comitus into those offices of power and distinction which were once conferred by popular election as the guests of this were not free and could not take a part in the deliberations of the freemen at the folk mote or in the judicial proceedings except in as far as they were represented by their chief means for doing justice between themselves became necessary these were provided by the establishment of a system of law administered in the lord's court by his officers and to which all his dependents were required to do suit and service as amply as they would if free have been bound to do in the folk moat but the law administered in such a court and in those formed upon its model in the lands of the comitus themselves a privilege very generally granted by the king at least in later periods was necessarily very different from that which could prevail in the court of the free men it is only in a lord's court that we can conceive punishments to have arisen which affected life and honour and fealty with all its consequences to have attained a settled and stringent form totally unknown to the popular judicature forfeiture or rather excommunication and pecuniary mulks which partook more of the nature of damages than of fine were all that the freeman would subject himself to under ordinary circumstances expulsion degradation death itself might be the portion of him whose whole life was the property of a lord to be by him disposed of at his pleasure hence the forfeiture of lands for adultery and incontinence and hence even alfred affixes the penalty of death to the crime of 
conspiracy against a lord while manslaughter could still be compounded for by customary payments one or two special cases may be quoted to show how the relation of the jessith to his chief modified the general law of the state the horse and arms which in the strict theory of the comitatus had been the gift or rather the loan of the chief were to be returned at the death of the vassal in order according to the same theory that they might furnish some other adventurer with the instruments of service these technically called her getwe armatura bellica have continued even to our own day under the name of harriet and strictly speaking consist of horses and weapons in later imitation of this the unfree settlers on a lord's land who were not called upon by their tenure to perform military service were bound on demise to pay the best chattel to the lord probably on the theoretical hypothesis that he at the commencement of the tenancy had supplied the necessary implements of agriculture and this differs entirely from a relief because here it is the act of the leaving relief the act of the incoming tenant or heir and because in its very nature and amount harriet is of a somewhat indefinite character but relief is not in the strict theory of the comitatus the jesseth could possess no property of his own all that he acquired was his lord's and even the liberalities of the lord himself were only loans not absolute gifts he had the usufruct only during life and at the death of the tenant it is obvious that the estate vested in the lord alone the guesseth could have no heir as indeed he had no family the lord stood to him in place of father brother and son hereditary succession which must at first have been a very rare exception could only have arisen at all either from the voluntary or the compelled grant of the lord he could only become general when the old distinction between the free markman and the jesseth had become obliterated and the system of the comitatus had practically and politically swallowed up every other yet even under these circumstances it would appear that a perfectly defined result was not attained and hence although the document entitled rectitudinis singularum personarum numbers the heirs among the rights of the soldiers yet even to the close of the anglo-saxon monarchy we find dukes prefects kings thanes and other great nobles humbly demanding permission from the king to make wills entreating him not to disturb their testamentary dispositions and even bribing his acquiescence by including him among the legatees in this as in all human affairs a compromise was gradually found necessary between opposing powers and the king as well as the comitus neither of whom could dispense with the assistance of the other found it advisable to make mutual concessions i doubt whether at even an earlier period than the eleventh century the whole body of thanes would have permitted the king to disregard the testament of one of their body unless upon definite legal grounds as for example grave suspicion of treason but still they might consent to the nominal application and sanction of the ancient principle by allowing the insertion of a general petition that the will might stand in the body of the instrument the circumstances thus brought under review show clearly that the condition of the jesseth was unfree in itself that even the free by birth who entered into it relinquished that most sacred inheritance and reduced themselves to the rank of thanes ministers or servants certain rights and privileges grew up no doubt by custom and the counts were probably not very long subject to the mere arbitrary will of the chief they had the protection of others in a similar state of dependency to their own and chances such as they were of subservience to the king's wishes a bond of affection and interdependence surpassing that of blood and replacing the mutual free guarantee of life and security was formed between them and they shared alike in the joys and sorrows the successes and reverses of peace and war but with it all and whatever their rank they were in fact menials housed within the walls fed at the table clothed at the expense of their chief dependent upon his bounty his gratitude or forbearance for their subsistence and position in life bound to sacrifice that life itself in his service and strictly considered incapable of contracting marriage or sharing in the inestimable sanctities of a home they were his cupbearers stewards chamberlains and grooms even as kings and electors were to 
the emperor whom they had raised out of their own body the real nature of their service appears even through the haze of splendour and dignity which gradually surround the intimate servants of royalty and as the chief might select his comitus and instruments from what class he chose it was the fate of these voluntary thanes not unfrequently to be numbered in the same category with the unfree by birth and thus in their own persons to witness the destruction of that essential principle of all teutonic law the distinction between the free man and the serf great indeed ought to be the advantages which could compensate for sacrifices like these and great in their eyes beyond a doubt they were in return for freedom the jethsith obtained a certain maintenance the chance of princely favour of military and active life of adventure with all its advantages of pillage festivals and triumphs poets and minstrels courtly halls and adventitious splendour the usufruct at least and afterwards the possession of lands and horses arms and jewels as the royal power steadily advanced by his assistance and the old national nobility of birth as well as the old landed freeman sunk into a lower rank the jethus found himself rising in power and consideration in proportion to that of his chief the offices which had passed from the election of the free men to the gift of the crown were now conferred upon him and the elderman duke judge and even the bishop were at length selected from the ranks of the comitatus finally the nobles by birth themselves became absorbed in the ever-widening whirlpool day by day the freemen deprived of their old national defences ringing with difficulty a precarious subsistence from the incessant labour sullenly yielded to a yoke which they could not shake off and commended themselves such was the phrase to the protection of a lord till a complete change having thus been operated in the opinions of men and consequently in every relation of society a new order of things was consummated in which the honours and security of service became more anxiously desired than a needy and unsafe freedom and the alods being finally surrendered to be taken back as beneficia under immediate lords the foundations of the royal feudal system were securely laid on every side End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of Saxons in England。John Mitchell Kemble。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The Unfree the Serf。We have considered the case of the wife, the son, and the daughter as far as can be done until we come to deal with the family relations and we have examined the position of one peculiar class of the unfree namely the comitus or gasithus of the kingly leaders another but less favoured class remained to be noticed those namely whom the latin authors designate by the terms libertus and servus and who among all the nations of germanic origin have various denominations these have no honourable no profitable service to compensate for the loss of independence but form the large body of hired cultivators the artisans and handy craftsmen in various branches of industry the predial even the domestic or menial servants of the free landowner the grounds as well as the degrees of slavery by which term i mean dependence the being in the mund of another and represented by him in the folk mote are various one viz poverty arising from overpopulation has been noticed in the last chapter but i agree with eichhorn and grimm in attributing the principal and original cause of slavery in all its branches to war and subsequent conquest another and important cause is forfeiture of liberty for crime and the amount of dependence the gentler or harsher condition of the serf depends to a great extent upon the original ground of servitude if the victor has a right to the life of the vanquished which by the law of nature is unquestionably the case he possesses a fortiori a perfect claim to the person the property and the services of his prisoner if his self-interest or the dictates of humanity induce him to waive that right 
these remarks apply no doubt in their full force only to our pagan forefathers but even christianity itself did not at once succeed in rooting out habits which its divine precepts of justice and mercy emphatically condemn beta in his desire to prove the efficacy of the mass for the dead tells an interesting story of a young noble who was left severely wounded on the field after a battle between northumberland and mercia in the year six seventy nine fearful of the consequences should his rank be discovered he disguised himself in the habit of a peasant and assumed that character at the castle of the earl into whose hands he fell declaring that he was a poor and married man who had been compelled to attend the army with supplies of provisions but his language and manners betrayed him and at length under a solemn promise of immunity he revealed his name and station the reply of the earl is characteristic he said i knew well enough from thy answers that thou wert no rustic and now indeed thou art worthy of death seeing that all my brothers and relations were slain in that battle yet i will not kill thee lest i should break the faith that i have pledged accordingly when his wounds were healed his captor sold him to a frisian in london who finding that he could not be bound finally released him on his parole and permitted him to ransom himself whatever the motive it is thus clear that the victor possessed the right of life and death over his captive even when taken in cold blood and the traditions as well as the historical records of the northern nations are filled with instances of its exercise it does not however by any means follow that the total defeat of a hostile tribe resulted in the immediate and direct enslaving of all the survivors as in the example just cited the blood feud no doubt frequently led to the murder of the captive chiefs and nobles even if less justifiable motives did not counsel the same miserable means of removing dangerous competitors but the heavy doom of death must have been one of the melancholy privileges of the noble class and even though many of the common freemen may have been sold or retained as slaves at the caprice of the captors still we cannot suppose this to have been the lot of any but those who had actually taken part in combat no natural or national law could extend these harsh provisions to the freemen who remained quiet at home nevertheless even these were liable to be indirectly affected by the hostile triumph inasmuch as the conquerors appear invariably to have taken a portion more or less great of the territory occupied by the conquered and wherever this is the case to the extent of depriving the cultivator of means if sufficient for his support he has no resource but to place himself in dependence upon some wealthier man and lose together with his lot the right to form an integral part of the state the degree of his dependence and the consequent comparative suffering to himself may vary with a multitude of circumstances but the one fact still remains viz that he is in the moon or hand of another represented in the state by that other and consequently in the most emphatic sense of the word unfree it is now generally admitted that this must have been the case with the whole population in some districts who thus became dependent upon a few intrusive lords but still these populations cannot be said to have stood in that peculiar relation to the conquerors which the word servus strictly implies towards an owner the utmost extent of their subjection probably reached no further than the payment of tribute the exclusion from military duty and the standing under a protectorate inglorious and easy when once the dues of the lord were paid they may even have rejoiced at being spared the danger of warfare and the laborious suit of the folk moat and forgotten that self-government is the inherent right and dignity of man in the convenience of having others to defend and rule them moreover the territorial subjection was not necessarily a juridical one indeed some of the teutonic conquerors recognized as positive law the right of even the dependent romans and provincials to be judged and taxed according to the rules and maxims of roman not salic or langobardic jurisprudence and this when carried out in the fullest detail with respect to the various tribes 
at any time united under one supreme head constitutes what is now called the system of personal right whereby each man enjoyed the law and forms of law to which he was born without the least reference to the peculiar district in which he might happen to live in other words that he carried his own law about whithersoever he went as a quality attached to his own person and not in the slightest degree connected with or dependent upon any particular locality in this way alamanni by o wari saxons frisians langobards romans gallic provincials and slavonic populations were all united under the empire of the salic and ripuarian franks the peculiar circumstances under which the conquest took place must of course have defined the relations under which the subjects stood to the ruling state it is conceivable that the conquerors might not want land but be contented with glory and pillage or they might not be able to seize and retain the conquered territory or again they may have required new settlements for themselves and their allies to obtain which they waged a war of extermination thus the sway we although unable to expel the ubi I altogether from their territory yet succeeded in rendering them tributary well in thuringia the franks and their saxon allies seized all the land slaying expelling or completely reducing the indigenous inhabitants to slavery another and curious instance may be cited from a comparatively late period when the little island of man was invaded conquered and colonized by the norwegian godred godredus the not being able to dispose of property hereditarily is the true badge and proof of slavery tacitus draws a great distinction between the different degrees of servitude among the germans he tells us that the unsuccessful gambler who had staked and lost his liberty and the free disposal of his own body upon one fatal cast of the dice would voluntarily submit to be bound and sold but that it was not usual for them to reduce their other serfs to the condition of menials they only demanded from them a certain amount of produce or unquestionably of labour in the field or pasture and then left them the enjoyment of their own dwellings and property the general duties of the house beyond such supplies which were provided for among the romans by the ministeria per familiam descripta were left among the germans to the wife and children of the householder it will be desirable to follow a somewhat similar distinction in treating of the different kinds of slaves and having shown that one class of the unfree are those who have been partially dispossessed by conquest but retain their personal freedom in some degree to proceed to those who are personally unfree the mere chattels of a lord who can dispose of them at his pleasure even to the extent of sale mutilation and death the class we have hitherto been observing is that intended by the term let in anglo-saxon and related terms in german monuments and by the romans they settled on imperial land and bound to pay tribute and perform military service they formed as grimm has well observed a sort of middle class among the unfree comprising the great majority of those who without being absolutely their own masters were yet placed somewhat above the lowest and most abject condition of man which we call slavery this condition among our forefathers was termed servitude without confining ourselves to the definition in the law of henry the first we may distribute the different kinds of slaves into classes according to different grounds of slavery thus they are serfs casu or natura and the serfs casu comprise serfs by the fortune of war by marriage by settlement by voluntary surrender by crime by superior legal power and by illegal power or injustice the remaining class are serfs by birth the serfs by fortune of war were those who were not left under the public law to enjoy a portion of their ancient freedom and possessions but were actually reduced to a state of prideal or many menial servitude by their captors and either reserved for household drudgery or sold at their arbitrary will the cassandra and andromache of grecian story stand here side by side with our own german gudrun this part of the subject has received sufficient illustration from the tale of the thane Ima, already quoted from beta 
the serf by marriage was the free man or free woman who contracted that bond with the slave in this case the free party sank to the condition of the unfree among some at least of the german races the salic law is explicit upon this point both with respect to man and woman among the Raipu Aryan franks it was enacted thus if a free Raipu Aryan woman hath followed a Raipu Aryan serf let the king or the count offer unto her a sword and a spindle if she accept the sword let her therewith slay the serf if the spindle let her abide with him in servitude in this case the burgundian law commanded both parties to be slain but if the relatives of the woman would not put her to death she became a serf of the king saxo grammaticus cites a similar law for denmark there is no evidence of the anglo-saxon practice in this respect but it appears unlikely that the case should be of common occurrence probably purchase and emancipation always preceded such marriages and the law of henry the first makes no mention of this among the grounds of slavery the serf by settlement is he who has taken up his abode in a district exclusively inhabited by the unfree the heir makes the serf there is no distinct anglo-saxon provision on the subject but perhaps we may include in this class some at least of those who taking refuge on a lord's land and among his suck men without any absolute and formal surrender of their freedom did actually become his serfs and liable to the services due to him from all their neighbours the generality however of such cases fall under the next following head the serfs by surrender of henry's law of norse law among these grim numbers the serfs whose voluntary submission so much surprised the roman philosopher even the law of the germans so generally favourable to liberty contemplates and provides for the case of such a voluntary servitude this might arise in various ways for example a time of severe scarcity such as are only too often recorded in our ancient annals unquestionably drove even the free to the cruel alternative of either starvation or servitude examples come from gregory of tours the britons normans in which in the latter a lady directing by her will the manumission of all those who had bent their heads in the evil days for food another was no doubt debt incurred either through poverty or crime and when the days of fierce and cruel warfare had passed away this must have been the most fertile source of servitude i have not found among the anglo-saxon remains any example of slavery voluntarily incurred by the insolvent debtor but the whole course of analogy is in favour of its existence and markoff supplies us with the formulary by which among the franks the debtor surrounded his freedom to the creditor it may be presumed that this servitude had a term and that a certain period of servile labour was considered equivalent to the debt the case of crime was undoubtedly a very common one especially as those whose necessities were the most likely to bring them in collision with the law were those also who were least able to fulfil its requirements by payment of the fines attached to their offences the criminal whose own means were insufficient and whose relatives or lord would not assist him to make up the legal fine he had incurred was either compelled to surrender himself to the plaintiff or to some third party who paid the sum for him by agreement with the aggrieved party serfs by force or power are not those comprised in the first class of these divisions or serfs by the fortune of war these of course have lost their freedom through superior force but the class under consideration are such as have been reduced to servitude by the legal act of those who had a right to dispose of them as for instance a son or daughter by the act of the father it is painful to record a fact so abhorrent to our christian feelings but there cannot be the least doubt that this right was both admitted and acted upon the father upon whose will it literally depended whether his child should live or not had a right at a subsequent period to decide whether the lot of that child should be freedom or bondage illegitimate children the offspring of illicit intercourse with his servant community may have formed the majority of those thus disposed of by a father but in times of scarcity it is to be feared that even 
issue of legitimate marriage was not always spared the frisians when oppressed by the amount of roman tribute sold their wives and children but the very restriction to the exercise of this right within particular limits of time which we may believe the merciful intervention of the church to have brought about speaks only too plainly for its existence in england even as late as the end of the seventh century and after christianity had been established for nearly one hundred years in this country we find the following very distinct and clear recognitions of the right in books of discipline compiled by two several archbishops for the guidance of their respective clergy in the penitential of theodore archbishop of canterbury occurs this passage this policy is mentioned in the penitential of theodore archbishop of canterbury in the somewhat later confessional of eckbert archbishop of york we find a similar statement it is however very remarkable that in the penitential of the same eckbert the sale of a child or near relative is put down as an offence punishable by excommunication the next head includes the serfs by reason of crime the distinction between these and the class of criminals who became slaves through compact or redemption is that in their case servitude was the direct punishment of their offence and not merely an indirect and immediate consequence it seems to me at least that this sense strictly lies at the foundation of two laws of edward alfred's son and these the former says if any one through conviction of theft forfeit his freedom and deliver himself up and his kindred forsake him and he know not who shall make boot for him let him then be worthy of the work which thereunto appertaineth again if a free man work upon a festival day let him lose his freedom or pay the penalty this alternative is an alleviation of the strict law but as forfeiture undoubtedly followed upon theft and other offences the thief could not expect to make payment for himself and was always exposed to the danger of incurring slavery should another make it for him it is however possible that his relations may have interfered to save him without the reducing him to servitude or even if he were so reduced he became the serf of him that engaged for him whereas if not rescued at all he must have been a fiscal serf in the hands of the crown there exists therefore a perceptible difference between the various kinds of slaves by law made so even though it permitted a merciful alternative and one whose punishment would have been a malt which exceeded his means the law of other german tribes numbers slavery among its punishments without any reservation at all thus among the visigoths he that assisted in the escape of a serf and neither restored him nor his worth to the owner was to become a slave in his place by the barbarian law he that could not pay a weirgilt due from him was to be enslaved together with his wife and children it is true that the anglo-saxon laws do not give us any enactment of a corresponding nature nevertheless i entertain no doubt that incontinence was a ground of slavery in the case both of man and woman toward the end of the ninth century denewolf bishop of winchester leased the lands of alsford to the relative of his own son on condition of a yearly rent however unjust the canons of winchester might think it it is clear that the widden gemot did not for the bishop was obliged to pay one hundred and twenty man cusses in gold to the king to have back his own land again in the year one thousand two we hear of a lady forfeiting her lands to the king by reason of incontinence the consequences of this destitution can hardly have been other than servitude and it may be at once admitted that where there were no lands to forfeit servitude was the recognized punishment of the offence theodore describes this the last division of circumstances that can lead to servitude as payment for crimes type of servitudes comprises those who have been reduced to slavery by violence or fraud in short illegally illegitimate children poor relations unfriended strangers young persons without power of self-defence may thus have been seduced or forced into a servile condition of life escape from which was always difficult inasmuch as there is necessarily a case against the serf and he can have no standing in the court composed only of the free to this head seem referable the passages i have already 
alluded to in theodore the other great division includes all the serfs by reason of unfree birth and as these are necessarily the children either of parents who are both unfree or under particular circumstances of one unfree parent it follows that their hereditary condition may arise from any one of the conditions heretofore under examination all the legitimate children of two serfs are themselves irrevocably serfs but some distinctions arise where the parents are of unequal condition as where the mother is free the father unfree and vice versa vice versa in this respect the law was very different among the different tribes the swedish law declared in favour of liberty the german generally the other way the sachsenspiegel spiegel decides that the children follow the father's right and similarly the law of henry the first has the same policy to the english principle i am bound to give my adhesion inasmuch as the natural and the original social law can recognize none but the father either in the generation or in the subsequent rule of the family whatever alleviation the practices of chivalry the worship of the virgin mother and the christian doctrine of the equality of man and woman before god may have introduced the original feeling is on the father's side and the foundations of our law are based upon the all-sufficiency of his right a woman is in the mund or keeping of a man society exists for men only that is for women merely as far as they are represented by a man that this original right was interfered with by the law of property is not denied but here different cases are to be considered first whether the serf or native is the property of the party who unites with him or her secondly whether the free party unite with some other owner's serf or nief next whether the issue are born in wedlock or not and lastly how far the public law and right is involved in the question of freedom and servitude the last consideration in fact involves the first because under the first except in the case of hardly intelligible neglect marriage could never take place between two unequal parties at all emancipation must have preceded the ceremony while the civil law would of course rule that ceremony itself taking place by consent was an act of emancipation not to be gainsaid it is therefore with regard to third parties only that a question can arise there is no proof that such a question ever did arise among the anglo-saxons or that it was thought needful to provide for it by law and the earlier evidences with which this book has especially to do are either entirely silent or so general in their expressions that we cannot decide from them upon a particular case in fact the whole argument is reduced to the second head viz where one parent is the property of a third party and where the child is born in lawful wedlock for a child not so born is not subject to any law which binds the parents and can as little be injured as advantaged by the law in the strict anglo-saxon law there is no definite decision on these points the codes of other german races at the oldest period are equally silent in later times indeed we have determinations but these as we have observed are contradictory perhaps we may take the doctrine of the sassen spiegel coinciding as it does with the opinion of many probably a majority of our own law sages as the original one especially as it is the only one in accordance with other details of family life and with the supreme law of nature itself which leaves to the father the decision as to the life or death of the child as to its liberty or slavery in this sense then i agree with sir john fortescue and sir edward coke it is to be remembered that we are dealing now with the condition of the offspring not of the parent the uncertainty that prevails with respect to the latter in the anglo-saxon law and the contradictory enactments of other german codes have been already noticed but all that has been said applies solely to the case of children born in lawful wedlock and almost all the apparent contradictions which have been noticed in our own law arise from a want of clear distinction on this point the child of a free father and unfree mother if the parents were not married remained to the lord of the nief according to our expressive proverb mine is the calf that is born of my cow in fleeta's words the distinction is drawn most clearly and they may therefore stand here in place of my own 
thus here again the offspring follows the father as soon as there is a marriage to determine that there is an offspring at all in law but if there be no marriage the chattel thrown into the world like any other waif or stray belongs domini loci it has a value can be worked or sold it is a treasure trove of a sort and as it belongs to nobody else falls to the lord as a compensation probably for the loss of his niece's services during pregnancy and the nonage of the child whatever the origin of serfage may have been it can hardly be questioned that the lot of the serf was a hard one and this perhaps not so much from the amount of labour required of him as from the total irresponsibility of the master in the eye of the law as to all dealings between himself and his servant the christian clergy indeed did all they could to mitigate its hardships but when has even christianity itself been triumphant over the selfishness and the passions of the mass of men the early pagan germans though in general they treated their serfs well yet sometimes slew them under the influence of unbridled passion an event which probably was not unusual considering the power of a lord over his slave and generally a penance for the slaughter of a serf by his lord without judicial authority in contemplation of law in fact the slave is the absolute property of his lord a chattel to be disposed of at the lord's pleasure and having a value only for the benefit of the lord or of some public authority in his place the serf cannot represent himself for others his interests must be guarded by others for he himself has no standing in any public court he is not in any association for mutual agreement or guarantee for he has nothing of his own to defend and no power to defend what another has if he be slain by a stranger his lord claims the damages and not his children if the lord himself slay him it is but the loss of so much value a horse an ox gone more or less out of his death no feud can arise for the relatives who allowed him to fall into or remain in slavery have renounced the family bond and forfeited both the virgilt and the moon if he be guilty of wrong he cannot make compensation in money or in chattels for he can have no property of his own save his skin thus his skin must pay for him and the lash be his bitter portion he cannot defend himself by his own oath or the oaths of friends and compurgators but if accused must submit to the severe uncertain and perilous test of the ordeal and if when thus hunted down he be found guilty severe and ignominious punishment amounting in the case of theft to death by flogging for men by burning for women is reserved for him naturally and originally there can be no limitation in the amount or the character of labour imposed upon him and no stipulation for reciprocal advantage in the form of protection food or shelter among the saxons servant has appears to have been bound to the soil though in some few cases we can trace a power vested perhaps only in certain public authorities of transferring the slave from one estate to another last but most fearful of all the taint of blood descended to his offspring and the innocent progeny to the remotest generations were born to the same miserable fate as bowed down the guilty or unfortunate parent but yet there was a gleam of hope one solitary ray that made even the surrounding darkness tolerable and may have cheered the broken-hearted serf through years of unrequited toil and suffering the law that reduced him to slavery made it also possible that he should be restored to freedom it did not from him this blessing however distant it might seem tacitus knew of liberty among the germans men who had been slaves had been manumitted and were free thus in yet pagan times general kindliness of disposition habits of domestic intercourse perhaps the suggestions of self-interest may have tended to raise the condition of the serf even to the restoration of freedom but it was the especial honour and glory of christianity that while it broke the spiritual bonds of sin it ever actively laboured to relieve the heavy burthen of social servitude we are distinctly told that bishop wilfred on receiving the grant of selsey from cadwella of wessex immediately manumitted two hundred and fifty unfortunates whom he found there attached to the soil that those whom by baptism he had rescued from servitude to devils might by the grant of liberty be rescued from servitude to man in this spirit of charity the clergy obtained respite from labour for the servants on the sabbath on certain high festivals and on the days which preceded or followed them the lord who compelled his servants to labour between the sunset on saturday and the sunset on sunday forfeited him altogether probably at first to the king or the 
but in the time of canute the serf thus forfeited was to become folk free to their merciful intervention it must also be ascribed that the will of a saxon proprietor laic as well as clerical so constantly directs the manumission of a number of serfs for the soul's health of the testator alfred even goes so far as to give free power to the serf of bequeathing to whomsoever he pleases whatever may have been given him for god's sake or he may have earned in his own moments of leisure and this provision which probably implies a prohibition to the lord of removing his labourer arbitrarily from a plot of ground well cultivated by his own efforts tends to secure to the unfortunate serf some interest in the produce of his industry the hungarian will recognize in it the spirit of maria theresa's herbarium it is moreover obvious from many surviving documents that in the later periods the serf could purchase his own release at least with the lord's consent or be bought by another for the purpose of manumission or even be borrowed on pledge for a term of years during which his labour might be actively employed in laying up the means of future freedom it cannot indeed be denied that the slave might be sold like any other chattel and that even as late as ethelred and canute the law ventured to prohibit no more than the selling him into heathendom or without some fault on his part nor can we believe that acts of the grossest oppression and tyranny were unfrequent but from what has been already cited it must be evident that there was a constantly growing tendency in favour of freedom that the clergy suggested every motive and the law made every possible effort at least to diminish the more grievous circumstances of servitude it is moreover to be borne in mind that a very large portion of the slaves at any time were in reality criminal serfs convicts expiating their offences by their sufferings taking all the circumstances into consideration i am disposed to think that the mere material condition of the unfree population was not necessarily or generally one of great hardship it seems doubtful whether the labour of the serf was practically more severe or the remuneration much less than that of an agricultural labourer in this country at this day his lord was bound to feed him for his own sake and if when old and worn out he wished to rid himself of a useless burthen he could by an act of emancipation hand over his broken-down labourer to the care of a church which with all its faults never totally lost sight of the divine precepts of charity we are not altogether with the the means of judging as to the condition of the serf and the provision made for him although the instances which we may cite are not all either of one period or one country indeed derived from compilations having the authority of law they show sufficiently what opinion was entertained on this subject by some among the ruling class in the prose version of salomon and saturn it is said that every serf ought to receive yearly seven hundred and thirty loaves that is two loaves a day beside morning meals and noon meals this cannot be said to be a very niggardly portion again the valuable document entitled rectitudinis singularum personarum gives details respecting the allowances made to the serfs in various pre or domestic capacities which would induce a belief not only that they were tolerably provided for but even enabled by the exertion of skill and industry to lay up funds of their own towards the purchase of their freedom the redemption of their children or the alleviation of their own poverty from the same authority and others we may conclude that on an estate in general serfs discharge the functions of ploughman shepherd goatherd swineherd oxherd and cowherd barnman sower hayward woodward dairy maid and beetle or messenger while the other sorts of activities were probably poor freemen from whom a certain portion of labour could be demanded in consideration of their holdings or a certain rent reserved out of the produce of their hives flocks or herds committed to their care and these formed the class of the poor mercenaries serving for hire or for their land but not yet reduced so low as in the scale as to the servant or slave it is not only probable that there would be distinctions in the condition of various serfs upon the same estate but even demonstrable it can hardly be doubted that men placed in situations of some trust as the ploughman oxford or beetle were in a somewhat higher class and of better condition than the mere hewers of wood and drawers of water now in the charter of the year nine hundred two we find an interesting statement which i must take leave to cite denewolf bishop of winchester and his chapter had leased land at Applesburn to burnwolf a relative of the bishop the chapter sent word to that the men that is the serfs were to remain attached to the land 
whether he or any other held it now there were three convicts and three servants whom the bishop and the brethren gave me together with their offspring the expressions used in this passage seem to show that some of the servants upon this estate enjoyed a higher condition than others being cultivators or boors while the others were more strictly slaves the very curious and instructive dialogue of elfric numbers among the serfs among the serfs the ploughmen whose occupation the author nevertheless places at the head of all the crafts with perhaps a partial exception in favour of the smiths servitude ceased by voluntary or compulsory manumission on the part of the lord the latter case being that where the services of the slave were forfeited through the misconduct of the master and as loss of liberty must be considered in the main as a consequence of the public law understood in the general and expressed in the particular case so must it i think be asserted that at first emancipation depended in some degree upon the popular will as well as the mercy or caprice of private individuals it is no doubt true that at a period when what we now call crimes were rather considered in the light of civil injuries for which satisfaction was due to the parties injured it might seem reasonable to leave the latter in possession of the power to assess the minimum at least of his own satisfaction to allow him to decide how long a period of servitude he would content himself with if he chose to renounce the right he possessed of claiming an endless one or lastly to reward good and faithful service by cancelling the consequences of an earlier wrong but emancipation has two very different effects it not only relieves the serf from personal burthens and disabilities but it restores or introduces a citizen to political and public rights in a state of society where landed possession and the exercise of such rights are inseparable a grave difficulty arises fees how can provision be made for the newly emancipated and now a free man if the community will consent and possess the means to create a new free hide for his occupation of course the matter can be managed but this consent renders the emancipation in reality the act of the state not of the manumitter or the lord on restoring freedom to his serf may endow him with a portion of his own land sufficient for easy or even wealthy subsistence but this will not make him fully a free man give him his full position in the polity and place him on a level with the free inhabitants of the mark till periods very late in comparison with that which is assumed in the course of this argument a similar principle prevails in our legislation upon this subject glanville says it is also to be observed that a man may enfranchise his serf in respect of the persons of himself or his heirs but not in respect of others for if any one having once been a serf and afterwards having attained to freedom in this manner should be produced in court against a third party to support a cause or for the purpose of making any law of the land he may justly be removed therefrom if his birth and villainage should be objected to and proved against him in the court even though the serf so enfranchised should have come to be promoted unto a knight's degree later still liberty seems considered as a privilege the value of which might be diminished by its extension and fleta gives as a reason why the lord is bound to pursue his fugitive serf lest by negligence of the lord's serfs should prevail to assert their own freedom on consideration therefore of all the facts we must conclude that where full and complete manumission was intended the transaction could only be completed in the presence and with the cooperation of the community whereby all claims besides those of the manumitting lord would be formally estopped for the future and this would be nearly equivalent to the admission rare indeed of a medic or other stranger to the full rights of citizenship at athens which could hardly have effect without a deliberate vote of the whole people accordingly even in the laws of william the conqueror the henry the first we find evidence that the completest publicity was given to formal manumissions and it is not unreasonable to believe that this refers back to a time when such publicity may have consisted in the presentation of the serf before the assembled folk mote in their expressed or implied assent to the solemn act practically however it is probable that the dissolution of servitude did not absolutely confer all the privileges of freedom the numerous acts of manumission directed by the wills of great landowners are totally inconsistent with the notion of any interference on the part of the assembled people as necessary to their validity 
the instances it is true are mostly of modern date but still we hear of manumissions by wholesale at very early periods where nothing but the lord's own will can possibly be thought of it seems therefore probable that a certain amount of dependence was reserved that the freedman became relieved from the harsher provisions of his former condition but remained in general under the protection and on the land of his former lord perhaps receiving wages for services still rendered in the eighth century with of kent enacted that even in the case of solemn manumission at the altar the inheritance the weir guilt and the wound of the family should remain to the lord whether the new freedman continued to reside within the mark or not the mode of provision for the emancipated serf must in a majority of cases have led to this result the lord endowed him out of his own land either with a full possession secured by charter or a mere temporary conditional loan the man therefore remained upon the lord's estate and in his surety though no longer liable to servile disabilities the full ceremonies used in the solemn act of emancipation by the anglo-saxons are not known to us but there is reason to suppose that they resemble those of other teutonic nations generally these may be divided into civil and ecclesiastical the former receiving their sanction from the authority of the people or the prince the latter from the church and its peculiar influences he who would emancipate his serf shall deliver him to the sheriff by the right hand in full county shall proclaim him free from all yoke of servitude by manumission shall show him open roads and doors and shall deliver unto him the arms of a free man namely the lance and sword thenceforth the man is free such is the law of william the conqueror and it is repeated with little variation by henry i except that there is no limitation to the sheriff and the county but this was also one form of manumission among the langobards the person who was to be made full free was delivered over successively into the hands of four different persons the last of these brought him before witnesses to a spot where four roads met and his choice was given him of these roads he was then free and that is removed from under the protection of his former master but it appears that the master even though he gave the free roads might reserve the mund of his freedman by which he retained the right of inheriting from him if he died childless and this recalls to us the provision already cited from the kentish law the history of ramsay informs us that the son of manny adopted this form in a very extensive emancipation of his serfs and we may therefore suppose it to have been a mode usual among saxons among the franks the fullest and completest act of emancipation was that which took place before the king or in a popular court the freedman from the ceremonies adopted on the occasion was called denarialis he became capable of a virgil of contracting marriage with a free woman and in general obtained all the rights of a free citizen but he still remained in some degree under the mund of the king who received his virgil and had certain rights over his inheritance i do not know whether this has any connection with the law of henry the first which provides that in any case of manumission the serf shall give thirty pence to the lord as a witness namely the price of his skin for a testimony that he has thenceforth himself his master there was a form of manumission among the franks by charter which however did not confer all the privileges of the denarialis the holder of such a charter was thence called chartularius i will not assert that such a system prevailed here although it is possible that some of the many charters of emancipation printed in the codex may be of this nature their general character however is that of a record of bargain and sale between different parties it may be indeed presumed that emancipation would follow but there is no positive statement that it did the following class of cases perhaps approaches nearest to such a charter but this book of the gospels it appeareth that elfwig and red hath bought himself out from abbot elsvig and all the convent with one pound whereof is witness all the brotherhood at bath christ blind him who turneth away this record but this is only a memorandum in a copy of the gospels no charter of manumission and i presume that the sheriff would have required some much more definite and legal act before he looked upon elfwig the red as a free man probably he was duly made free at the altar of the abbey church or at the door of this subsequent process we have a good example in the book of st petrarch this book beareth witness that the person in bought a woman and her son for half a pound at the church door in bodwin and he gave this person fourpence as toll 
then came the man who bought these persons and took them and freed them ever sackless on petrarch's altar in the witness of these good men that is isaac the priest of all forms of emancipation i imagine this to have been the most frequent partly because of its convenience partly because the motives for emancipation were generally of a religious caste and the sanctions of religion were solemn and awful almost all the records which we possess on this subject are taken from the margins of gospels or other books belonging to religious houses and the few references in the laws imply emancipation at the altar among the franks this form in which the freed man was called tabularius conveyed only imperfect freedom the utmost it could do was to confer the privileges of a roman provincial to which class the clergy were reckoned but the tabularius even so was not fully free he still remained in the mund of the church whitred's law so often cited shows clearly that this was not the case in england nor could it be seeing that the clergy among us were national and the frankish system of personal rights did not prevail i am therefore disposed to think that gradually emancipation at the altar was taken to convey all the privileges of manumission and that it was the mode generally though not exclusively in use on this point the want of documents prevents our attaining certainty the method was probably this the man was formally offered up before the high altar and there declared free in the presence of the officiating clergy and the congregation a memorandum was then made in some religious book belonging to the church and the names of the witnesses were recorded whether a separate certificate was prepared does not appear the full extent of the rights obtained by the freedman especially in respect of inheritance is not to be gathered from any existing anglo-saxon document it is probable that these were limited as among the langobards and franks his offspring however were free and his marriage with a free woman equal his other rights duties and privileges in short his general condition were in all probability determined by certain arrangements between himself and his lord previous to the act of manumission in such a case neither party would find much difficulty in settling the terms of a bargain End of chapter eight book one chapter nine of saxons in england by john mitchell kemble this librivox recording is in the public domain the mutual guarantee megborough tithing hundred the organization in marx and in the ga or sur was a territorial one based upon the natural conformation of the country common possession of the soil and usufruct of its produce it has been already said that both of these divisions have their separate courts of justice or parliaments their judges and executive officers but some further machinery was required to secure the public peace to provide for the exercise of what in modern society we call the police and to ensure the rights of the individual markman in respect to other markmen as well as his conformity to the general law a corporate existence was necessary which should embrace a more detailed system of relations than was to be found either in the mark or in the shire moot strictly speaking the former of these was principally busied with the questions which arose out of its own peculiar nature that is with offences against the integrity of the frontier the forest the rights of common in the pastures and meadows and other delinquencies of a public character on the other hand the charmut though it must have taken cognizance of disputed questions between several marks and may even from the first have exercised some description of appellate jurisdiction must naturally have considered the higher and more general attributes of legislation and foreign policy the national rather than municipal administration as belonging to its peculiar and appropriate province perhaps also the exigencies of military discipline may gradually have rendered a more complicated method of enrolment necessary by means of which companies and regiments might be kept upon a permanent footing and called into immediate action when occasion demanded their services while at the same time due provision was made for the tilling the lands of those whose personal exertions were required in defence of the public weal there were two forms in which these various objects might be attained 
these were subordinate organizations of men not excessive in number or too widely dispersed and founded either upon the bond of blood or the ties of family including that of adoption or merely upon an arbitrary numerical definition each of these plans had advantages as well as defects the family bond alone did not secure a sufficient territorial unity although in practice it had at first considerable influence upon the location of individual households moreover it gave rise to an inequality continually on the increase and necessarily threatening to the independence of the free men on the other hand any merely arbitrary numerical classification would have excluded a most important social element the responsibility of man to man in the bond of kindred the feelings and engagements of family affection family honour and family ambition the problem was finally solved by a partial union of the two methods in all probability the law of compromise which reigns throughout all history gradually brought about a fusion of two separate principles widely differing in point of antiquity and thus superinduced the artificial upon the natural bond without entirely destroying the influence of the latter for i think it unquestionable that the artificial bond was really later in point of time since in the first place indefinite and vague arrangements usually precede the definite and settled and next because tacitus takes no notice whatever of any but the family bond which he represents as stringent in the highest degree we have already seen that caesar declares the divisions of the land to have taken place according to families or relationships cognationis from which we may infer at first a considerable amount of territorial unity from his far more observant successor we learn that the military organization was based upon the same principle that the composition of the troop or regiment depended upon no accidental arrangement but was founded upon families or relationships and that every man was bound to take up the enmities as well as the friendships of his father or kinsmen but leaving these earlier evidences it still seems that the meg burr or family bond is an institution whose full comprehension is necessary to a clear conception of the anglo-saxon public and private life the idea of the family is at once the earliest and strongest of human ties in its development it is also the most ennobling to the individual and salutary to the state on it depend the honour and dignity of woman the unselfish education of man the training of children to obedience and love of parents to protection and justice of all to love of country and enlightened subordination to the state where it does not exist man becomes an instrument in the hands of others or the blind tool of systems in its highest form it is the representative of that great mystery by which all christians are one brotherhood united under one father and king throughout the latter day of ethnic civilization when the idea of state had almost ceased to have power and the idea of family did not exist there was a complete destruction both of public and private morality and the world grown to be a sink of filth and vice was tottering to the fall which providence in mercy had decreed for its purification the eruption of the german tribes breathed into the dead bones of heathen cultivation the breath of a new life and the individual dignity of man as a member of a family the deep-seated feeling of all those nations while it prepared them to become the founders of christian states which should endure made them the wonder of the philosophers and the theologians of rome greece and africa and an example to be held up to the degenerate races whom they had subdued the german house was a holy thing the bond of marriage a sacred and symbolic engagement holy above man was woman herself even in the depths of their forests the stern warriors had assigned to her a station which nothing but that deep feeling could have rendered possible this was the sacred sex believed to be in nearer communion with divinity than men in the superstitious tradition of their mythology it was the young and beautiful shield maze the maiden wheel carrion who selected the champions that had deserved to become the guests of woden the matrons presided over the rites of religion conducted divinations and encouraged the warriors on the field of battle veletas and arenias 
prophetesses in the bloom of youth and beauty led the raw levies of the north to triumph over the veteran legions of rome neither rank nor wealth could atone for violated chastity nor were in general any injuries more severely punished than those which the main strength of man enabled him to inflict on woman that woman nevertheless in the family held a subordinate situation to men lies in the nature of the family itself and in the disposition and qualities which have been implanted in woman to enable her to fulfil her appointed duties in the scheme of providence qualities not different in degree but kind from those of her helpmate that they may be the complement of his and united with his make up the full and perfect circle of humanity as an individual woman was considered a being of a higher nature as a member of the state she was necessarily represented by him upon whom nature had imposed the joyful burthen of her support and the happy duty of her protection a principle too little considered by those who with a scarcely pardonable scholism have clamoured for what they call the rights of woman woman among the teutons was near akin to divinity but not one among them ever raved that the fem libra could be woman hence the profound importance attached to chastity and the un undoubted influence of alliances by marriage through which separate kindreds are fused into one body adopting common interests pursuing common objects and recognizing in the bond which unites its members obligations which are still exhibited in oriental countries which we trace throughout the middle ages of europe but which are gradually vanishing under the conditions of our modern mercantile society it lies in the very nature of things that among a people animated with such principles as have now been described and so placed by circumstances on tracts of land far more than sufficient for their support the very earliest organization should be based upon the family relations dwelling near to one another united by a community of interests and the endearing ties of mutual relationship or the scarcely weaker bond of adoption strong as regards other families in direct proportion to their union among them themselves the magith or family offer all the guarantees in their own natural position which the primitive state can require in the popular councils the largest and most distinguished family has necessarily the greatest weight but association of others severally less powerful is always capable of counteracting danger which might arise in a free state from the ambition of any of its portions in the absence of a central power or rather its dispersion through all the several members of the community the collection of revenue and the maintenance of the peace must be left to the heads of the several factions whether villages as in the east or families which at one time are identical with villages the police therefore especially belongs to the family and is by it exercised over all the individuals that compose it hence also the grave misconduct of the individual may justly have the effect of destroying the social position of the whole Megith in beowulf the warriors who deserted their prince in his utmost deed are sternly told by his successor that not only they but their whole megber well thenceforth have forfeited the rights of citizenship not each of you individually but each and every man of your kin cognation or megscraft shall be deprived of his rights of citizenship from which we must infer that the misconduct of one person might compromise his relatives who are held responsible for his actions and this rule coupled with the fact of all serving together under one selected from among themselves and each under the eye of his nearest and dearest friends supplied a military organization capable of enabling the barbarians to cope with far more disciplined and scientific military systems than their own serving to explain the almost irresistible power with which like the turks of more recent times the teutons of old burst upon the nations exposed to their onset the weir guilt or price of blood the earliest institution of this race only becomes perfectly intelligible when considered from this point of view the gens or family at large are injured by the loss of their associate and to them compensation must be made so they in turn must make compensation for him since rights and duties are commensurate this principle however darkly is still involved in the theory of our civil actions for seduction 
it lies in the very nature of things that this albeit a natural cannot be an enduring system its principal condition is neighbourhood the concentration of the family upon one spot as population increases and with it emigration the family bond gradually becomes weaker and at last perishes as a positive and substantive institution surviving only fragmentarily in the traces which it leaves upon the latter order that replaces it war commerce cultivation the effect and cause of increasing population gradually disperse the members of the sibs craft or cognation and a time arrives when neighbors are no longer kinsmen at this point the old organization ceases to be effective and a new one becomes necessary unless the ancient principle is to be entirely abandoned but principles are not easily abandoned in early stages of society a young nation finds it easier to adopt artificial arrangements founded upon the ancient form nor is it necessary that the later should have totally superseded its predecessor it is enough that when the earlier ceases to fulfil its object the latter should be directed to supply its obvious deficiency and be united with it as circumstances best permit throughout the earliest legislation of the teutonic nations and especially in our own we find arrangements based upon two distinct principles in active operation the responsibility of the family lies ever in the background the ultimate resort of the state against the individual of the individual against the state but we also find small bodies of men existing as corporations founded upon number and neighbourhood and thus making up the public units in the state itself from the first we find the inhabitants of the mark classed in tens and hundreds tithings and hundreds each probably comprising respectively a corresponding number of members together with the necessary officers viz a tithing man for each tithing and a hundred man for the hundred thus making one hundred and eleven men or heads of houses in the territorial hundred the frankish law names the officers thus alluded to in it the tithing man is decanus the hundred man centenarius the anglo-saxon law does not indeed mention its divisions by these names till a comparatively late period when their significations have become in some respects altered but it seems probable that it does imply them under the term gegelden fellows brothers of the guild in a case of aggravated crime it is provided that the offender's relatives shall pay a third part of the fine his gagladen a third part and if he cannot pay the remainder himself he is to become an outlaw that is forfeit his land and flee perhaps formally abjure the country now it is perfectly clear that a law expressed in such general terms as these cannot be directed to a particular and exceptional condition that it does not apply to the accidental existence of gagledon but on the contrary assumes every man to have such we cannot therefore construe it of voluntary associations formed for religious social or funereal objects and for the purposes of this law we must look upon gagledon as a general name borne by every individual in respect of some guild or association of which he was taken to be a member the only meanings which the root guild enables us to attach to the word gilgida are these either one who shares with others in paying or one who shares with others in worshipping if we adopt the former rendering we must suppose that certain contributions were made by a number of persons to a common purse partly for festive purposes partly as a mutual guarantee and club fund for legal costs for the expenses of reciprocal aid and defence perhaps even for mortuary celebrations and charitable distributions another though perhaps a less probable suggestion is that such gagledon may have been jointly responsible for taxes or the outfit of armed men who attended in the third or military expedition on behalf of them all but this we cannot further illustrate in the absence of all record of the financial system of the early teutonic monarchs even those of charlemagne himself which would have been invaluable guides to us through the intricacies of that dark subject of inquiry the second meaning given to gagilda would rest upon the assumption of some private and as it were hero worship common to the guild brothers a fact familiar enough to us in the athenian and the roman but the existence of any such foundation of the guild among the anglo-saxons is extremely improbable when we consider the small numbers that appear to have constituted the association and that no trace of any such worship remains in our heathen mythology 
i therefore prefer the first rendering of the word and look upon gilgulden as representing those who mutually pay for one another that is under a system of pecuniary mulks those who are mutually responsible before the law the associates in the tithing and the hundred it is well known that in the later anglo-saxon law and even to this day the tithing and hundred appear as local and territorial not as numerical divisions we hear of tithings where there are more and tithings where there are fewer people we are told of the spoor of cattle being followed into one hundred or out of another i do not deny that in process of time these divisions have become territorial but this does not of necessity invalidate the doctrine that originally the numbers were calculated according to the heads of families or that the extent of territory and not the taxable military or corporate units formed at first the varying quantity had it been otherwise we should naturally have found a much greater equality in the size of the territorial hundreds throughout at least each saxon kingdom nor in all probability would the number of the hundreds in respective counties differ so widely a difference intelligible only if we assume population and not space to have been the basis of the original calculations moreover to a very late period in one part of england the abstract word tiathan was replaced by the more concrete ten mentale to which it is impossible to give any meaning but the simple one the words express viz the tale or count of ten men again as late as the tenth century in a part of england where men and not acres became necessarily the subjects of calculation viz in the city of london we find the citizens distributing themselves into frith guilds or associations for the maintenance of the peace each consisting of ten men while ten such guilds were gathered into a hundred the remarkable document known as judicia civitatis londonensis gives the following detailed account of the whole proceeding this is the ordinance which the bishops and the reeves belonging to london have ordained and confirmed with pledges among our frith guilds as well earlish as churlish in addition to the dooms which were fixed at greatly and exeter and thundersfield resolve that we count every ten men together and the chief one to direct the nine in each of those duties which we have all ordained and afterwards the hindens of them together and one hinden man who shall admonish the ten for our common benefit and let these eleven hold the money of the hinden and decide what they shall disperse when aught is to pay and what they shall receive should money accrue to us at our common suit that we gather to us once in every month if we can and have leisure the hinden men and those who direct the tithings as well as with butt filling or as else may please us and know what of our agreement has been executed and let these twelve men have their refection together and feed themselves as they themselves think right and deal the remains of the meat for love of god now as this valuable record mentions also territorial tithings containing different amounts of population it seems to me to furnish important confirmation of the conclusion that the gegelden of any and alfred the members of the london tithings or frith gills of ten and the york ten Mateo, are in truth identical and it is further in favour of this view that the citizens call the members of such guild ships gegelden and we have also ordained respecting every man who has given his pledge in our guild ships that should he die each guild brother gigglda shall give a gessel loaf for his soul and sing a fifty psalms or cause the same to be sung within thirty days upon a review of the preceding passages it may be inferred that the hinden consisted of ten tithings and consequently answered to what we more commonly called a hundred it may perhaps be suggested that if any distinction existed between these two terms the hinden represented the numerical the hundred the territorial division but their original identity may be argued from an important passage in the law of any he ordains he that is charged with mortal feud and is willing to deny the slaying on oath then shall there be in the hinden one king's oath of thirty hides as well for a noble as a churl be it whichever it be now hinden can only mean one of two things viz a collection of ten or a collection of a hundred according as we render the word hund admitting that at some very early period hund did mean ten we yet never find it with any such signification in any book or manuscript or indeed at all except in the numerals hund sefantig hunditatig hunniguntig hun twelve tig 
where its force is anything but clear when we compare those words with fiftig sixtig twentig etc on the other hand the adjective hind does clearly denote something which has the quality of a hundred thus a twi hind or a twelve hind man is he whose life is worth respectively two or twelve hundred shillings again it is clear that the judicia quitatis londinensis intends by hinden a collection of a hundred and not of ten men inasmuch as it distinguishes this from the tithings and further it must be admitted upon the internal evidence of the law itself that a hundred and not a tithing is referred to since so small a court as that of the ten men could not possibly have had cognizance of such a plea as manslaughter or been competent to demand the king's oath of thirty hides but as such a plea might well be brought before the hundred court it is probable that such was meant lastly it was the custom for the hundred court to be holden monthly and we observe the same provision with the london hinden at which it is very probable that legal matters were transacted as well as accounts investigated for it is expressly declared that their meeting is to ascertain how the undertakings in the record have been executed that is how the peace has been kept i therefore conclude that the hinden and the hundred are in fact and were at first identical with the hypothetical reservation that at a later period the one word represented a numerical the other a territorial division when these two had ceased to coincide in corroboration of which view it may be observed that the word hinden hinden does not occur in the laws later than the time of ethelstan or nor hundred earlier than that of edgar it is true that no division founded upon numbers can long continue to coincide with the first corresponding territorial allocation however closely they may have been at first adjusted in spite of every attempt to regulate it population varies incessantly but the tendency of land divisions is to remain stationary for ages a holy horror prevents the alteration of that which has been sanctified in men's minds by long continuance was perhaps more deeply sanctified at the first by religious ceremonies the rights of property universally demanded the jealous guardianship of boundaries moreover the first things or at all events the first hundreds must have had elbow-room enough within the mark to allow for a considerable elasticity of population without the necessity of disturbing the ancient boundary and thus we can readily understand two very distinct things to have grown up together out of one origin namely a constantly increasing number of guilds yet a nearly or entirely stationary tale of territorial tithings and hundreds i cannot but think that under happier circumstances this view might lead us to conclusions of the utmost importance with respect to the history of our race that if it were possible for us now to ascertain the original number of hundreds in any county of which beta in the eighth century gives us the population and also the population at the period of the original division we should find the two data in exact accordance and thus obtain a clue to the movement of the population itself down to beta's time looking to the permanent character of land divisions and assuming that our present hundreds nearly represent the original in number and extent we might conclude that if in the year four hundred kent was first divided than it then continued only one hundred heads of houses or hides upon three thousand acres of cultivated land while in the time of beta three centuries later it comprised six hundred families or hides upon eighteen thousand acres it is a common saying that we owe the institution of shire tithing and hundred divisions to alfred stated in so broad a manner as this i am compelled to deny the assertion no one can contemplate the life and acts of that great prince and accomplished man without being filled with admiration and respect for his personal energy his moral and enlightened policy and the sound legislative as well as administrative principles on which he acted but we must nevertheless not in the nineteenth century allow ourselves to be blinded by the passions and prejudices which ruled in the twelfth the people oppressed by foreign power no doubt 
long looked back with an affectionate regret to the memory of england's darling he was the hero of a suffering nation his activity and fortune had once cleared the land of norman tyranny his arm had smitten the forefathers of those whose iron yoke now weighed on england he was the reputed author of those laws which under the amended and extended form enacted by the confessor were now claimed by the english people from their foreign kings he was in a word the representative and as it were very incarnation of english nationality we may smile at but must yet respect the feeling which made him also the representative of every good thing which connected every institution or custom that his suffering countrymen regretted with his time-hallowed name it is unnecessary to detail the many ways in which this traditional character of alfred continually reappears the object of these remarks is merely to point out that the attribution to him of the system of tithings hundreds and the like is one of many groundless assertions connected with his name not one word in corroboration of it is to be found in asser or any other contemporaneous authority and there is abundant evidence that the system existed long before he was born not only in other german lands but even among ourselves still i am willing to incur the responsibility of declaring the tradition absolutely without foundation on the contrary it seems probable that alfred may have found it necessary after the dreadful confusion and devastation of the danish wars to make a new muster or regulation of the tithings nay even to cause in some districts a new territorial division to be established upon the old principle and this is the more credible since there is reason to believe that the same causes had rendered a new definition of boundaries generally necessary even in the case of private estates the strongest argument against this lies however in the total silence of all contemporary writers a less tenable supposition is that alfred introduced such divisions for the first time into the countries which he united with wessex as it is impossible to conceive any anglo-saxon state to have existed entirely without them the form and nature of the institution long known in the english law under the name of frank pledge may be compendiously described in the words of the laws called edward the confessors according to that document another piece the greatest of all there is whereby all are maintained in firmer state to wit in the establishment of a guarantee which the english call frith borgus with the exception of the men of york who call it ten men and tail that is the number of ten men and it consists in this that in all the villes throughout the kingdom all men are bound to be in guarantee by ten so that if one of the ten men offend the other nine may hold him to write but if he should flee and they allege that they could not have him to write then should be given them by the king's justice of space of at least thirty days and one and if they could find him they might bring him to justice but for himself let him out of his own restore the damage he had done or if the offence be so grave let justice be done upon his body but if within the aforesaid term he could not be found since in every frith or boar there was one headman whom they called frith borg evid then this headman should take two of the best men of his frith boar and the headman of each of the three frithborg's most nearly neighbouring to his own and likewise two of the best in each if he can have them and so with the eleven others he shall if he can clear both himself and his frithbore both of the offence and flight of the foresaid malefactor which if he cannot do he shall restore the damage down out of the property of the doer so long as this shall last and out of his own and that of this frithbore and they shall make amends to the justice according as it shall be by law adjudged them and moreover the oath which they could not complete with the venue the nine themselves shall make viz that they had no part in the offence and if at any time they can recover him they shall bring him to the justice if they can or tell the justice where he is thus the object of the gills or tithings was that each man should be in pledge or surety bore as well as to his fellow-man as to the state for the maintenance of the public peace that he should enjoy protection for life honour and property himself and be compelled to respect the life honour and property of others that he should have a fixed and settled dwelling where he could be found when required where the public dues could be levied and the public services demanded of him lastly that if guilty of actions that compromise the public weal or trenched upon the rights and well-being of others 
there might be persons especially appointed to bring him to justice and if injured by other supporters to pursue his claim and exact compensation for his wrong all these points seem to have been very well secured by the establishment of the tithings to whom the community looked as responsible for the conduct of every individual comprised within them and coupled with the family obligations which still remained in force in particular cases they amply answered the purpose of a mutual guarantee between all classes of men the system possessed the advantage of being necessarily regulated by neighbourhood and it was free from some disadvantages which might have attended an exclusive reliance upon kinmanship the frith borgus not having the bond of blood between them which might have induced an improper partiality in favour of one of their members and as they stood under responsibility for every act of a guildsman being interested in preventing an undue interference on the part of his family we thus see that the guildsmen were not only bound to present their fellows before the court of the freemen when specially summoned thereto but that they found their own advantage in exercising a kind of police surveillance over them all if a crime were committed the guild were to hold the criminal to his answer to clear him if they could conscientiously do so by making oath in his favour to aid in payment of his fine if found guilty and if by flying from justice he admitted his crime they were to purge themselves on oath from all guilty knowledge of the act and all participation in his flight failing which they were themselves to suffer mulct in proportion to his offence on the other hand they were to receive at least a portion of the compensation for his death or of such other sums as passed from hand to hand during the progress of an anglo-saxon suit being his neighbours the vis natum vicinage or venue they were his natural compurgators or witnesses and consequently being examined on oath in some sense the jurati or jurors upon whose verdict his weal or woe depended and thus the importance of character so frequently appealed to even in our modern jurisprudence was carried to the highest extent we may reasonably conclude that the close intercourse thus created was improved to private and social purposes and that these guilds like the much larger associations of the same name in after times knew how to combine pleasure with business the citizens of london hint at a monthly symposium or treat with but filling when the tithing men met together to settle the affairs of their respective hundreds a trait not yet extinct in the civic or indeed the national character there can also be little doubt that the guilds even form small courts of arbitration as well as police for the settlement of such trifling disputes between members of the same guild as were not worthy of being reserved for the interference of a superior tribunal and it is also probable that the members consider themselves bound to aid in the festivities or do honour to the obsequies of any individual guild brother the london guildsmen were to distribute alms and cause religious services to be performed at the decease of a fellow and it is obvious that this sharing in a religious obligation the benefits of which were to expend even into another life must have impressed somewhat of a solemn and sacred character upon the whole institution much of what has been observed respecting the tithing applies also to the hundred this it has been seen was originally a collection of ten tithings and was presided over by a hundred elder or hundred man who exercised a jurisdiction over his circuit and its inhabitants from the concurrent practice of later periods we may conclude that this court was holden monthly for the hearing of such civil and lighter criminal causes as could not be settled in the tithing or interested more tithings than one it is not probable that the higher criminal causes could at any period be pursued in the hundred but that they were necessarily reserved for the consideration of the folk mote or shire court which met three times in the year in later legislation trial of capital offences were reserved for the skyer moat and the words of tacitus seem to imply that this was the case in his time also perhaps even such causes as involve the penalties of outlawry may have been beyond the jurisdiction of the hundred it is however less as a court of justice than as part of a system for the maintenance of peace that we are to contemplate the hundred it may be securely affirmed that where the tithing alone could not be made responsible or more tithings than one were involved in a similar difficulty as to crimes committed by their members resort was had to the responsibility of the collective hundred a principle which it is well known subsists even to this day 
at a comparatively late period we occasionally find a consolidation of hundreds into one body for judicial purposes presided over by the elderman of the shire or his karepa and forming a subsidiary court to the shire moot and after immunities or private jurisdictions had become rapidly extended it is certain that such consolidations were not unusual in the hands of great civil or ecclesiastical authorities and that they by means of their officers or jerifan held plea in several hundreds at once they thus substituted their own power for that of the alderman or the sheriff in the last instance throughout the district comprehended by their immunity either replacing the old hundred men by jerifan or bailiffs or suffering the hundreds to be still governed and administered in the way common to all such divisions by the elective officer it stands to reason that the system above described applied only to the really free it was the form of the original compact between the independent members of an independent community but as by the side of the free landholders there dwelt also unfree men of various ranks so also there existed modifications of the original compact suited to their condition those who in a more or less stringent degree were dependent could not be members of the tithing the hundred or the folk mote they stood to write among themselves in their lord's court not in the people's and in the latter they could not appear for themselves the institution therefore which provided that the lord might maintain a comitatus or following provided also that its members should all be in his mund protection and bore surety and that he should make answer for them in the courts from which they were themselves excluded it is difficult to decide whether the lords or nobles were at first comprised within the popular corporations it appears most probable that they were not that they were sufficient to their own defence and even from the earliest historical periods in possession of that immunity which released their lands from the jurisdiction of the popular tribunals in respect therefore to the guilds they may be supposed to have held an independent though not necessarily hostile position regulated indeed by the public law and if they stood to write with their men in the folk moat it was the collective power and dignity of the state with which they had to deal and not the smaller associations founded upon necessities of which they were not conscious their dependents were under their guarantee and surety as the members of every man's household his wife children and serfs were under his for them he was responsible to the community at large but he owed no suit or service to others and if he persisted in upholding wrong i fear the only corrective was to be found in the inalienable just belly which resumes its power instantly upon the violation of that tacit understanding among men that the well-being of society depends upon a regulated mutual forbearance those were not ages in which acts of self-defence or righteous retribution could be misnamed revolutions but all these remarks are intended to apply only to a state of society in which the nobles were few and independent the people strong and united where the people were in truth the aristocracy and the nobles only their chiefs the holder of an immunity having second and sakin in later times under a consolidated royalty representing the national will and in a state from which the element of the people had nearly vanished through the almost total vanishing of small independent freeholds was necessarily placed in a very different position it now remains only to bestow a few words upon the manner in which the original obligations of the family bond were gradually brought to bear upon the artificial organization upon a careful consideration of the latter it appears that its principal object was gained when either offences were prevented or the offender presented to justice the consequences of crime in all but a few accepted cases fell not upon the gegelden if they could clear themselves of participation but upon the magus or relatives the laws of ethelbert withred and holder here know nothing of gegelden with them the magus are still wholly responsible and even their intervention is noticed in three cases only ethelbert provided that in the event of manslayer flying the country the family should pay half the fear guilt of the slain again he enacts that if a married woman die without bearing children the property she brought her husband and that which he settled upon her after consummation shall return to her paternal relatives 
according to the legislation of hethel here if a man died leaving a wife and child the mother was to have the custody of the child till his tenth year but the paternal kinsmen were to administer his property under satisfactory pledge for due discharge of their duty the regulations of any allow us to enter still further into the nature of the family engagement he enacted that if a stranger came through the wood out of the highway and attempted to slink through in secret without shouting or blowing his horn he should be taken to be a thief and might be slain or forced to pay according to his presumed crime and if the slayer were then pursued for his vir guilt he might make oath that he slew him for a thief and the lord and the gegledon of the dead man should not be allowed to make oath to the contrary but if the slayer had at the time concealed the deed and it was only afterwards discovered a presumption of unfair dealing was raised against him and the kindred of the dead man were entitled to make oath of his innocence again if a stranger was slain the king was to have two parts of his rear guilt the son or relatives of the dead man might claim the third but if there were no relatives the king claimed half the count half besides a provision for a surviving child similar to that of hethel here the law of any contains no further regulation with regard to the magus of the free man for several chapters referring to serfs or who are guilty of theft rest upon the principle that his kin have renounced the magber by suffering him to remain in serfage and together with the obligations of kinsmen have relinquished their own right of avenging his injuries or making pursuit for his wrongs the duties of the magus craft or kinsmen are developed with considerable detail in the law of velford the most general regulation is that which acknowledges the right of a man to have the aid of his kindred in all those accepted cases where the custom and the law still permitted the waging of feheth or private war after the same fashion may a man fight on behalf of his born kinsman if any wrongfully attack him except indeed against his lord that we permit not other clauses provide that where a wrongdoer is taken into custody and agrees peaceably to abide the decision of the law his relatives shall have due notice if he pledge himself to a lawful act and belie himself therein let him humbly surrender his arms and his goods to his friends to hold for him and let him remain for forty days in prison in a king's tongue let him there suffer as the bishop may direct him and let his kinsman feed him if he have himself no food but if he have no kinsman or no food let the king's reeve feed him again if a man is accidentally slain while hewing wood with others his kinsmen are to have the tree and remove it from the land within thirty days otherwise it shall go to the owner of the wood the most important case of all however is that of a divided responsibility between the kinsman and the gegelden which alfred thus regulates if one that hath no paternal kindred fight and slay a man if then he have maternal relatives let them pay a third part of the war his guild brethren a third part and for a third part let him flee if he have no maternal relatives let his guild brethren pay half and for half let him flee and if any one slay such a man having no relatives let him half be paid to the king half to the guild brethren it was also the principle of alfred's law recognized but not introduced by him that no man should have the power of alienating from his megascraft booklands whose first acquirer had entailed them upon the family a principle which tends as far as human means seem capable of ensuring it to ensure its permanent maintenance the reciprocal rights and duties of the meg Burr were similarly understood by edward he enacted that if a malefactor were deserted by his relatives and they refused to make compensation for him he should be reduced to serfage but in this case his weir guilt was to abate from the kindred and ethelstan distinctly holds the megath responsible for their kinsmen he says if a thief be put into prison let him remain there forty days and then let him be ransomed for one hundred and twenty shillings and let the kindred go surety for him that he shall cease from theft for the future and if after that he steal let them pay for him with his weir guilt or replace him in prison but he goes further than this and imposes upon them the duty of finding a lord for him or exposing him to the penalty of outlawry and we have ordained respecting those lordless men of whom no law can be got that the kindred be commanded to domicile him to folk right and find him a lord in the folk moat and if then they will not or cannot produce him at the turn let him thenceforth be an outlaw and let whoso cometh at him slay him 
a provision which obviously cannot apply to free landowners who would have been included in a tithing and could not have been thus compulsorily commended to a lord where a man is slain as a thief the relatives are to clear him if they can inasmuch as they would have a right to pursue the slayer and claim the compensation for their kinsman's death again it is provided that if a lord has so many dependents that he cannot personally exercise a due supervision over them he shall appoint efficient reeves or bailiffs in his several manners to be answerable to him and if need be the bailiff shall cause relatives of any man whom he cannot trust to enter into sureties for him edmund permitted the magath uh, to avoid the consequences of their kinsman's act by refusing to abet him in his feud i imagine that this law must be taken in connection with that of edward and that it implies a total desertion of the criminal by his kindred with all its consequences viz loss of liberty to him and of his weird guilt to them the troubled time of ethelred the ill-advised supplies another attempt to secure peace by holding the relative strictly and personally responsible in his law we find it enacted if breach of the peace be committed within a town let the inhabitants of the town go in person and take the murderers alive or dead or their nearest of kin head for head if they will not let the elderman go if he will not let the king go if he will not let the whole district be in a state of war though this perhaps is less a settled rule of law than the convulsive effort of an authority striving in vain to maintain itself amid civil discords and the horrors of foreign invasion it still consecrates the old principle and returns to the true basis on which anglo-saxon society was founded namely treaties of peace and mutual guarantee between the several parties that made up the state such were the means by which the internal peace of the land was attempted to be secured and it is evident that better could hardly have been devised in a state of society where population was not very widely dispersed and where property hardly existed save in land and almost equally unmanageable cattle the summary jurisdiction of our police magistrates our recognizances and bail and binding over to keep the peace are developments rendered necessary by our altered circumstances but these are nevertheless institutions of the same nature as those on which our forefathers relied the establishment of our county courts in which justice goes forth from man to man and without original writ from the crown is another step toward the ancient principle of our jurisprudence in the old hundred a further inquiry now arises as to the basis upon which all calculations as to satisfaction between man and man were founded in other words to the system of beer gilts and its various corollaries this will form the subject of a separate chapter end of chapter nine book one chapter ten of saxons in england by john mitchell kemble this librivox recording is in the public domain feather virgilt the right of private warfare technically called fentha or feud was one which every teutonic freeman considered inalienable and which coupled with the obligations of family was directly derived from his original position as a free man it was the privilege which he possessed before he consented to enter into any political bond the common term upon which all free men could meet in an equal form of polity it was an immediate corollary from that primeval law of nature that each man may provide for his own defence and use his own energies to secure his own well-being and the quiet possession of his life his liberty and the fruits of his labour history and tradition both assure us that it did exist among the tribes of the north and it is reasonable to suppose that it must have done so especially in any case where we can conceive separate families and households to have maintained at all an independent position toward one another where no imperium yet exists society itself possesses only a use belly against its own several members and if neighbours will not be neighbourly they must be coerced into peace the great and first need of all society and the condition of its existence by alliance of the many against the few of the orderly and peaceful against the violent and lawless this right of feud 
then lies at the root of all teutonic legislation and in the anglo-saxon law especially it continues to be recognized long after an imperial power has been constituted and the general conservancy of the peace has been committed to a central authority it admits as its most general term that each free man is at liberty to defend himself his family and his friends to avenge all wrongs done to them as to himself shall seem good to sink burn kill and destroy as amply as a royal commission now authorizes the same in a professional class the recognized executors of the national will in that behalf now it is obvious that such a power exercised in its full extent must render the formation of an orderly society difficult if not impossible the first problem then is to devise means by which private vengeance may be regulated private wrong atoned the necessity of each man's doing himself right avoided and the general state of peace and security provided for for setting aside the loss to the whole community which may arise from private feud the moral sense of men may be shocked by its results an individual's own estimate of the satisfaction necessary to atone for the injury done to him may lead to the commission of a wrong on his part greater than any he hath suffered nor can the strict rule of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth be applied where the exaction of the penalty depends upon the measure of force between appellant and defender in the feeling then of the omnipotence of the state for paramount purposes over all the several individuals whose proximity to one another necessarily caused the existence between them of relations amicable or hostile the teutonic nations set themselves the task of regulating the right of feud they could not entirely abrogate it for it was the very basis of that freedom which enabled every man to enter into a contract or engagement as to the mode of its exercise but they defined and as far as possible limited its sphere and the extent of its action the natural right of every man to do himself justice to the extent of his own estimate seems early to have received so much check as could be given by the establishment of a lex talionis life for life and limb for limb the earl who captured the thane ima in the seventh century could say to him i might justly put thee to death because my kinsman fell in the battle wherein thou wert made prisoner and this principle was recognized even in the later legislation after what we may call a legal commutation of this right had been established the ordinance respecting oaths to be administered says a twelfth height man's oath stands for six churl's oaths because if a man should avenge a twelfth height man he will be fully avenged on six churls and his virgilt will be six churls virgilts the teutonic nations generally avoided the inconveniences of such a system by making the state itself the arbitrator between the parties that is by establishing a tariff at which injuries should be rated and committing to the state the duty of compelling the injured person to receive and the wrongdoer to pay the settled amount it thus engaged to act as a mediator between the conflicting interests with a view to the maintenance of the general peace it assured to the sufferer the leaguer satisfaction for his loss it engaged to his adversary that upon due payment of that legal satisfaction he should be placed under the public guarantee and saved from all the consequences of feud for doing this the state claimed also some remuneration it imposed a fine called sometimes freedom from frith peace or bannum from its proclamation bannon over and above compensation between man and man and this is obviously what tacitus means when he says they are bound to take up both the enmities and the friendships of a father or relative nor are their enmities implacable for even homicide is atoned for by a settled number of flocks or cattle and the whole house receives satisfaction a useful thing for the state for feuds are dangerous in exact proportion to freedom and again a portion of the fine goes to the king or state a part to him whose damages are to be assessed or to his relatives only where the state would not or could not as may sometimes have happened undertake this duty did the right of private warfare again resume its course and the family relations recover their pristine importance the man who presumes to fight before he has in vain appealed to all the recognized authorities for redress is liable under elfred's law 
to severe punishment except in one important case which involved the maintenance of the family itself to secure which alone the machinery of the state exists but where the offender refuses to avail himself of the means of peaceful settlement which society has provided for him the person injured may make war upon him and have the assistance of the state in so doing the most general expression of this right is found in a proverbial formula retained in the law of edward the confessor and which may be said to comprise all the law of the subject it says let amends be made to the kindred or let their war be borne whence the english had the proverb buy off the spear or bear it the mode however of applying this general right was not left to individual caprice the following regulations made by successive kings will explain very fully the practice and the theory of feud or war alfred ordains that the man who knows his foe to be home sitting fight not before he have demanded justice of him if he have power enough to beset his foe and besiege him in his house let him keep him there for seven days but not attack him if he will remain within doors if then after seven days he be willing to surrender and to give up his weapons let him be kept safe for thirty days and let notice of him be given to his kinsmen and friends but if the plaintiff have not power enough of his own to besiege his foeman let him ride to the elderman and beg aid of him and if the elderman will not aid him let him ride to the king before he fights in like manner if a man come accidentally upon his foe and without previous knowledge of his home-staying if the foe will surrender his weapons let him be kept safely for thirty days and let notice be given to his friends if he will not surrender his weapons he may lawfully be attacked but if he be willing to surrender and to deliver up his weapons and after that any one attack him let him pay weir and wound as well he may and fine and have forfeited his megship we also declare that it is lawful war for a man to fight for his lord if any one attack his lord and so also may the lord fight for his man and in like manner a man may fight for his born kinsman if any wrongfully attack him except against his own lord that we allow not and it is lawful war if a man find another with his wedded wife within closed doors or under one covering or with his daughter born in wedlock or his sister born in wedlock or his mother who was given to his father as a wedded wife the inconveniences of this state of society induced edmund about the middle of the tenth century to release the kindred from the consequences of Fetha. he thus commences his secular laws edmund the king makes known to all the people old and young that are in his dominion what i have deliberated with the council of my witan both odin and laic first how i might best promote christianity then seemed it to us first most needful that we should most firmly preserve peace and harmony among ourselves throughout all my dominion both i and all of us hold in horror the unrighteous and manifold fightings that exist among ourselves we have therefore decreed if henceforth any one slay another let him bear the feud himself unless by the assistance of his friends and within twelve months he may commence with the full word be he born as he may but if his kindred forsake him and will not pay for him it is my will that all the kindred be unfa out of feud except the actual perpetrator provided that they do not give him either food or protection but if afterwards any of the kindred harbour him he shall be liable in all that he possesses to the king and bear the feud with the kindred because they had previously forsaken him but if any of the other kindred take vengeance upon any man save the actual perpetrator let him be foe to the king and all his friends and forfeit all that he has it is probable that this right thus reserved to the kindred of deserting their guilty kinsmen was not often exercised nevertheless the subsequent laws of ethelred and canute may be considered to have been understood in connection with it and subject to its limitations the law of edward the elder about a d nine hundred to nine hundred fifteen regulates the mode of proceeding when both parties are willing to forego the feud upon the established principles of compensation he says the virguilt of a twelve hide man is twelve hundred shillings the virguilt of a twy hind man is two hundred shillings 
if any one be slain let him be paid for according to his birth and it is the law that after the slayer has given pledge for the vir guilt he should find in addition a vir bore according to the circumstances of the case that is for the vir guilt of a twelfth hind man the vir bore must consist of twelve men eight by the father's four by the mother's side when that is done let the king's protection be set up that is all of either kindred laying their hands together upon one weapon shall pledge themselves to the mediator that the king's protection shall stand in twenty-one days from that day let one hundred and twenty shillings be paid as heels fang at a twelfth hide man's fear guilt the heels fang belongs to the children brothers and paternal uncles that money belongs to no kinsman except such as are within the degrees of blood twenty-one days after the heels fang is paid let the man bot be paid twenty-one days later the fight fine in twenty-one days from this the from guilt or first instalment of the vir guilt and so forth until the whole sum be discharged at such fixed time as the witan have agreed after this they may depart with love if they desire to have full friendship and with respect to the vir guilt of a churl all that belongs in his condition shall be done in like manner as we have said respecting the twelfth hind man the law of edmund contains similar provisions the witan shall appease feud first according to folk right the slayer shall give pledge to his advocate and the advocate to the kindred of the slain that the slayer will make compensation to the kin then it is necessary that security be given to the slayer's advocate that the slayer may draw nigh in peace and himself give pledge for the vir guilt when he has given his wend for this let him further find a bare bore or security for the payment of the vir when that is done let the king's protection be set up within twenty-one days from that let the heels fang be paid within other twenty-one days the man bought and twenty-one days from that the first instalment of the vir guilt the vir guilt then or life price was the basis upon which all peaceful settlement of feud was established a sum paid either in kind or in money where money existed was placed upon the life of every free man according to his rank in the state his birth or his office a corresponding sum was settled for every wound that could be inflicted upon his person for nearly every injury that could be done to his civil rights his honour or his domestic peace and further fines were appointed according to the peculiar adventitious circumstances that might appear to aggravate or extenuate the offence from the operation of this principle no one was exempt and the king as well as the peasant was protected by a vir guilt payable to his kinsmen and his people the difference of the vir guilt is the principal distinction between different classes it defined the value of each man's oath his mund or protection and the amount of his fines or his exactions and as we have already seen it regulated the equivalent for his value and as it is obvious that the simple vir guilt of the free man is the original unit in the computation we have a strong argument were any needed that that class formed the real basis and original foundation of all teutonic society although this principle was common to all the germanic tribes very great variety exists in the amounts severally adopted to represent the value of different ranks a variety easily understood when we reflect upon the relative condition of those tribes at the period when this portion of their law was first settled a slight account of them will be useful as an introduction to the consideration of our anglo-saxon values it will be seen throughout that various circumstances have tended to introduce changes into the early and simple order salian franks ingenuus two thousand solitus one thousand sol ingenuus in host six hundred litus in host three hundred sol ingenuus in trust eighteen hundred litus in trust nine hundred sol thus if engaged in actual warfare the value of the freeman and the emancipated serf was tripled and if in the trust or immediate service of the king their respective values were multiplied nine times it is probable that the ripu arian franks adopted the same numbers angli et werini liber two hundred sol a daily noble six hundred libertus freedman eighty sol law of the saxons probably the freeman two hundred and forty shillings noble fourteen hundred and forty freedman one hundred and twenty shillings law of the bavarians the dukes nine hundred and sixty shillings the ducal family of the 
agile low things six hundred and forty the other five noble races three hundred and twenty shillings the simple free man one hundred and sixty shillings law of the alamanni primus the first rank of the nobles two hundred and forty shillings medi anus the second rank of nobles two hundred mino fletus the free man one hundred and sixty law of the burgundians noble three hundred shillings lower noble medio chris two hundred free man minor one fifty law of the frisians noble eighty shillings free man fifty three and a third freedman twenty six and two thirds shillings law of the visigoths free man between the years of twenty and fifty three hundred shillings freedman one hundred and fifty in the north one hundred silfers was the virgilt of the freeman and there is no account of the jarls the old swedish laws generally assign forty marks this is the reckoning of the upland sudermann land and east gothland laws the west gothland law has thirty-nine marks the judish fifty-four and the gudelag three marks of gold the virgilt of the clergy is slightly different among the salic franks deacon three hundred priest six hundred bishop nine hundred shillings a late addition to the ripu arian law computes clericus two hundred subdeacon four hundred deacon five hundred priest six hundred bishop nine hundred this is sufficient to give a general outline of the system it will be observed that these continental computations give no reckoning for the king beyond doubt they were for the most part settled after the royal power had become so fully developed as to cast aside all traces of its original character and nature the anglo-saxon equivalents for these computations are by no means clear nor as far as we can judge are they altogether consistent it is probable that they varied not only in the several anglo-saxon kingdoms but were also subject to change at various periods as the relative value of life and produce altered the kentish law which names only the earl and churl as the two classes of freemen does not give us the exact amount of their beer guilds but it supplies us with some data by which perhaps an approximation may be made to it in ethelbert's law the king's mund bird or protection is valued at fifty shillings earls or nobles at twelve and the churls or simple freemans at six thus the three classes stand in the relation of fifty twelve and six or taking the churl as unity their respective values are eight and a third to two and one that is churl to earl one to two churl to king one to eight and a third earl to king one to four and one six now the medum liad guilt of the churl is stated to be one hundred shillings and if grim and thorpe were right and translated this the half vir guilt we should have the very improbable sums of two hundred four hundred and one thousand six hundred and sixty six and a third kentish shillings maduma however does not signify half but middling moderate the enactment in ethelbert's law amounts in fact to this if a man slay another he is to pay his virgil but not so if the slayer happen to be the king's armourer or messenger in that case he is to pay only a moderated virgil of one hundred shillings it was an exemption in favour of two most important officers of the royal household and shows partly the growing encroachment of prerogative partly the value set upon the talents of the officers themselves the common vare guilt then was above one hundred and i think it can be shown that it was below two hundred shillings the case of the vare guilt paid for a king though rare is by no means unexampled in the year six eighty seven mool ethelward a scion of the royal race of wessex invaded kent and having incautiously suffered himself to be surprised by the country people was burnt to death in a house where he had taken refuge with a few comrades seven years later the men of kent made compensation to any for mool's death the sum given is very variously stated william of malmesbury says it was thirty thousand mancuses which calculated at eight mancuses to the pound would be three thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds and this is the sum mentioned by florence of worcester afterward the oldest latin chronicler but still removed four century from the time makes it amount to thirty thousand solidi or shillings each of which is to be calculated at sixteen pence some manuscripts of the saxon chronicle read thirty thousand pounds others thirty pounds now however contradictory all these statements may at first sight appear and there can be no doubt that some of them are ridiculously exaggerated 
it is not impossible to reconcile and explain them every one of the authorities i have cited except florence who has evidently calculated his sum upon what he believed to be the value of the mancus reads thirty thousand of some coin or other one will have them pounds another shillings another mancuses etc now they are all wrong in their denomination and all equally right in their number and for this very obvious reason the originals from which they derived their information did mention the number and did not mention the denomination each author put the question to himself thirty thousand what and answered it by supplying the supposed omission which the coin most familiar to himself but there cannot be the least doubt that the saxon original read thirty thousand and nothing else and this is not only actually the reading of some manuscripts of the chronicle but most likely the cause of the error which lies in the other copies incautious transcribers having been misled by the resemblance between the saxon letters and mistaken the contraction for thirty pounds it is the custom of the anglo-saxon tongue in describing measures of land or sums of money to use the numerals only leaving the commonest units to be supplied by the reader thus if land were intended thirty thousand would denote the number of hides and where money is intended at least in kent thirty thousand skets this then i believe to have been the sum paid to any and the regular personal virgilt of a kentish king let us now apply this sum to elucidate the value of the other kentish virgilts from a comparison of the compensation appointed for injuries done to the nails of the fingers and toes mr thorpe the late mr allen and i concluded that the value of a kentish shilling was twenty skets but thirty thousand skets would be fifteen hundred such shillings and assuming this to be the royal virgilt we shall find the earls to be three hundred and sixty the churls one hundred and eighty shillings which amounts are exactly thirty times the value of the several mund birds in the first volume of mr thorpe's anglo-saxon laws at page one hundred and eighty six there is a document which professes to give the values of different classes in northumberland its date is uncertain though it appears to have been generally assigned to the commencement of the tenth century i confess that i can hardly reconcile myself to so early a date and think it altogether a suspicious authority it tells us as follows one the north people's royal guilt is thirty thousand thrymuses fifteen thousand thrymuses are for the virgilt and fifteen thousand for the royal dignity the vir belongs to the kindred the kinbot to the people to an archbishop's and an ethling's virgilt is fifteen thousand thrymuses three a bishop's and an elderman's eight thousand thrymuses four a holes and a king's high reeves four thousand thrymuses five a mass thanes and a secular thanes two thousand thrymuses six a churl's virgilt is two hundred and sixty six thrymuses that is two hundred shillings by mercy and law seven and if a welshman thrives so well that he have a height of land and can bring forth the king's tax then is his rear guilt one hundred and twenty shillings and if he thrive not save to half a height then let his beer be eighty shillings eight and if he have not any land but yet is free let him be paid for with seventy shillings nine and if a churlish man thrive so well that he have five hides of land for the kings at where and any one slay him let him be paid for with two thousand thrymuses ten and though he thrive so that he have a helm and coat of mail and a sword ornamented with gold if he have not that land he is notwithstanding a churl eleven and if his son and his son's son so thrive that they have so much land after him the offspring shall be of gesethkund noble race at two thousand twelve and if they have not that nor to that amount can thrive let them be paid for as churlish another and perhaps more trustworthy document printed at page one hundred and ninety of the same volume gives us the following values as current in mercia a churl's virgilt is by mercy and law two hundred shillings a thane's virgilt is six times as much that is twelve hundred shillings then is a king's simple virgilt six thane's vir by mercy and law that is thirty thousand scats and that is altogether one hundred and twenty pounds so much is the virgilt in the folk right by mercy and law and for the royal dignity such another sum is due as compensation for kinegilt the vir belongs to the kindred of the kinabot to the people
a passage already cited in this chapter gives the virgils of the free man and noble in wessex as respectively two hundred and twelve hundred silingas whence those classes are called twy hind and twelve hind these denominations correspond to the old and usual churl and earl and as the original expression for all classes of society was be it churl be it earl canute could use as perfectly equivalent be it twy hind be it twelve hind but in wessex a third class is mentioned whose virgilt was half that of the twelve hind and three times that of the churl they are called six hind men of six hundred it is difficult to say whether they are the original nobles three times as valuable as the freeman and whether the twelve hind are an exclusive class of magnates raised above them during the progressive development of the royal power or whether on the contrary the twelve hind and twy hind are the original divisions and the six hind a middle class of ministerials which sprang up when churls had entered the service of the crown and thus became raised above their fellow freemen i incline to the latter opinion partly from the apparent absence of the six hind class in mercia partly from the apposition noticed above and the omission of the six hind altogether from the passage in edward's law which regulates the payments for the other two classes there is no statement of a royal beer gilt in wessex but from what has been said of the composition made for mill it may be inferred that it was thirty thousand sciatas or one hundred and twenty pounds like that of mercia the total inconsistency of these several values will be apparent the ratio of the king and noble to the churl in the different states varies as follows north to king to churl one hundred and thirteen to one nearly mercia king to churl seventy two to one wessex king to churl seventy two to one kent king to churl seventeen and two ninths to one northumberland noble first class churl fifty six to one nearly second class churl thirty and a half to one nearly third class churl fifteen and a fourth to one nearly fourth class churl seven and a half to one nearly mercia noble churl six to one wessex noble first class churl six to one second class churl three to one kent noble churl two to one now this variety which is totally irrespective of the real value of the shillings seems to involve this part of the subject in impenetrable darkness all that we can permit ourselves to guess is that circumstances had in process of time altered the original relations between the classes but in different ratios in the different kingdoms this however is not all the difficulty we have to contend with the complication arising from the fact that the silling the currency in which all the southern calculations are nominally made really differed in value in the several states and thus when we attempt to compare one freeman with another we find their respective prices to be in mercia eight hundred and thirty three and a third scats in kent three thousand six hundred however the details were arranged the principle itself is clear enough and we must now be content to remain in ignorance of the means adopted to reconcile conflicting interests measured by a standard so imperfect but the virgilt or price of the whole man was not all that the law professed to regulate when once the principle had been admitted that this might be fixed at a certain sum it was an easy corollary not only that the sum in question should limit the amount of responsibility to the state but that a terror for all injuries should be settled in the laws of ethelbert and alfred we find very detailed assessments of the damage which could be done to a man by injuries either of his person his property or his honour many of these are amusing and strange enough and highly indicative of the rude state of society for which they were adapted but it seems unnecessary to pursue the details they deal with they may serve to turn a period about teutonic barbarism or to point a moral about human fallibility but the circumstances under which they were rational and convenient arrangements have passed away and they are now of little interest as historical records and of none with a view to future utility End of chapter ten book one chapter eleven of saxons in england by john mitchell kemble this librivox recording is in the public domain folkland Falkland, lenland 
it was a wise insight into the accidents of increasing population which limited the amount of the original ethel or allodial estate by leaving as it were a large fund to be drawn upon as occasion might serve the principle that every free man must be settled on land was maintained without condemning society to a stationary condition as to numbers the land thus left of which the usufruct under certain conditions was enjoyed by the free men was called folkland terra publica ager publicus it was distinguished from the ethel by not becoming absolute property in the hands of individuals consequently by not being hereditary the dominium utile might be granted the dominium directum remained in the state which was a perpetual fifi for certain trusts and uses and hence folkland was subject to rents of divers kind and reversion the folkland could also be applied to reward great public services in which case estates of a load or ethel were carved out of it and presented to him whom the community desired to honour the service which wolf and effer did by slaying ongenthal was rewarded with a grant of land and rings the clearest view of the nature and object of folkland is given us by beta who complains that it is diverted from its proper purpose which is to be granted as a support to those whose arms would defend the country under pretence of erecting monasteries which are a disgrace to their profession the following are his extremely important words and since there are both very numerous and very extensive tracts which to adopt the common saying are of use neither to god nor man seeing indeed that in them there is neither maintained a regular life according to god's law nor are they possessed by the soldiers or comatists of secular persons who might defend our race from the barbarians if any one to meet the want of our time should establish an episcopal see in those places he will be proved not to incur the guilt of prevarication but rather to perform an act of virtue and again he continues by which example it behooves also your holiness in conjunction with our religious king to abrogate the irreligious deeds and writings of our predecessors and to provide for the general advantage of our kingdom either in reference to god or to the world lest in our days either through the cessation of religion the love and fear of an inspector at home should be abandoned or on the other hand the supply of our secular militia decreasing we should not have those who might defend our boundaries from the incursions of barbarians for what is disgraceful to say persons who have not the least claim to the monastic character as you yourself best know have got so many of these spots into their power under the name of monasteries that there is really now no place at all where the sons of nobles or veteran soldiers can receive a grant and thus idle and unmarried being grown up to manhood they live on in no profession of chastity and on this account they either cross the sea and desert the country which they ought to serve with their arms or what is even more criminal and shameless having no profession of chastity they give themselves up to luxury and fornication and abstain not even from the virgins consecrated to god the evils of a course which by preventing the possibility of marriage tends to the general neglect of morality are as obvious in this state of society as in those where the indefinite partition of estates reduces all the members of the higher classes to a state of poverty a fact perfectly familiar in countries where the resources of trade are not permitted to mitigate the mischief of subdivision the folkland then in england was the national stock it is probable that the same thing occurred in other teutonic states and that the folkland there also formed a reserve from which endowments of individuals home-born or foreign and of religious houses were made we cannot now tell the exact terms upon which the usufruct of the folkland was permitted to individual holders much of it was probably distributed in severalty to be enjoyed by the grantee during his life and then to revert to the donor the state as the holders of such lands were most probably not included in the marks like the owners of allodial property they may have formed the proper basis of the original killed skippus and have been more immediately subject to the jurisdiction of the scourge mote 
for it is impossible to believe that their condition was one of such perfect freedom as that of the original allodial owners a portion also of the folkland may long have subsisted as common land subject to the general rights of all in this respect it must have resembled the public land of the romans only that the true roman burghers or patricians being comparatively few while the other claimants were many and self-defence therefore commanded the utmost caution in admitting them to isotely the struggles between the patrician and plebeian orders necessarily assumed in rome a character of exasperation and hostility which was wanting in england but it does not appear that in this country the tribes of the guisses could have made any claim to the folkland of the mercians or that those of the welsh would have found favour with any saxon community in whatever form the usufruct may have been granted it was accompanied by various settled burthens in the first place were the inevitable charges from which no land was ever relieved namely military service alluded to by beta and no doubt in early times performed in person the repair of roads bridges and fortifications but besides these there were dues payable to the king and the gareffa watch and ward on various occasions aid in the royal hunting convoy of messengers going and coming on the public service from one royal ville to another harbouring of the king his messengers and huntsmen lastly provision for his hawks hounds and horses in addition to these there were heavy payments in kind which were to be delivered at the royal villes to each of which various districts were apparently made appurtenant for this purpose and on which stores so duly delivered the king and his household in some degree depended for subsistence these were comprised under the name syringus fiorum or firma regis it is from the occasional exemptions granted by the authority of the king and his witan that we learn what burthens the folkland was subject to it may therefore be advantageous to cite a few examples which will make the details clear between seven ninety one and seven ninety six eighty hides of land at westbury and hanbury were relieved by offer from the dues to kings dukes and their subordinates except these payments that is to say the gayful at westbury sixty hides two tons full of bright ale and a comb full of smooth ale and a comb full of welsh ale and seven oxen and six weathers and forty cheeses and six langthero and thirty ambers of rough corn and four ambers of meal to the royal ville in eight sixty three an estate at marsham was to pay by the year twenty staters of cheese forty lambs forty fleeces and two days pastus or fiorum which last might be commuted for thirty silver shillings argentia in eight seventy seven bishop tunbert with the consent of his chapter appropriated lands at nursling to the use of the refectory his charter says he grants it as he could not do this by his own authority he probably only means to record that they had been so freed by the witena gemote in eight eighty three twenty years later a monastery is freed from all which the monks were still bound to pay to the king's hand as sinning fiorum both in bright ale beer honey oxen swine and sheep in short from all the gayful much or little known or unknown that belongs to the lord of the nation the dues from the monastery at taunton were as follows a fiorum of one knight for the king and eight dogs and one dog-keeper and nine knights keep for the king's falconers and carriage with wagons and horses for whatever he would have taken to curry or wilton and if strangers came from other parts they were to have guidance to the nearest royal ville upon their road the payments reserved upon twenty hides at titchburn which edward in nine o one to nine o nine granted to den of wolf of winchester for three lives were probably the old royal gay foal. they were now transferred to the church as double commons for founders day they amounted to twelve sexters of beer twelve of sweetened welsh ale twenty ambers of bright ale two hundred large and one hundred small loaves two oxen fresh or salted six weathers four swine four slitches and twenty cheeses but if the day of payment should fall in lent an equivalent of fish might be paid instead of flesh many 
of the instances we meet with both in england and upon the continent are those of churches or monasteries this is natural inasmuch as the clergy were most likely to obtain and record these exemptions but how it may be asked did it happen that such exemptions were necessary it seems to me that when christianity was introduced and folkland was granted for the erection or the endowment of a church the burthens were not always discharged and that the piety of later times was occasionally appealed to to remedy the carelessness or alter the policy of early founders folkland may be considered the original and general name of all estates save the halot sores or allod of the first markmen the whole country was divided into folklands containing one or more hides subject to fulcrit or the public law and hence having no privilege or immunity of any sort in many instances where beta uses terra unis and similar expressions he can only mean to denote separate and distinct portions of folkland and the words of alfred's translation imply the same thing the power of disposal over this land lay in the nation itself or the state that is in the king and his watan but in what way or by what ceremonies it was conferred we no longer know still there is great probability that it was done by some of those well-known symbols which survived both at home and abroad in the familiar forms of livery of sison by the straw the rod or yard the cespus iridus and the like we may however distinctly assert that it was not given by book or charter inasmuch as this form was reserved to pass the states under very different circumstances the very fact that folkland was not the object of a charter causes our information respecting it to be meagre it is merely incidentally and fortuitously that it is mentioned in those documents from which we derive so much valuable insight into the antiquities of saxon england but even from them we may infer that it was not hereditary towards the end of the ninth century alfred who appears to have been elderman or duke of surrey devised his lands by will he left almost all his property to his daughter and to his son ethelwald perhaps an illegitimate child he gave only three hides of hereditary land Bokland expressing however his hope that the king would permit his son to hold the folkland he himself had held but as this was uncertain in order to meet the case of a disappointment he directed that if the king refused this his daughter should choose which she would give her brother of two hereditary estates which he had devised to her again shortly before the conquest we find abbot wolfbold thus informing Giza, bishop of wells egelnoff the abbot tofig the sheriff and all the thanes in somerset edward the king my lord gave me the land at corfestige which my father held and the four farms at eswick and the fields of meadowland thereunto belonging and in wood and field so much that i have pasture for my cattle and the cattle of my men and all as free in every respect as the king's own demean to give or sell during my day or after my day to whomsoever it best pleases me in both these cases it is clear that the land was holden as a benefice that the tenant had only a life interest which wolfold however succeeded in converting into a fee as the state were the grantors so also there appears to have been no restriction as to the persons of the grantees of course this does not include serfs or others below the degree of free men although an emancipated serf may sometimes have been provided with an estate of folkland by general donation but there is no reason to doubt that every other class might obtain grants of folkland those of a duke and of various bishops have been mentioned wolfhold's father was probably at least a thane but even the king himself could and did hold land of this description the boundary of an estate is said to run to the king's folkland at a very early period however it became a practice to carve hereditary estates out of the folkland which thus became the private property of the individual and could by him be given sold or devised at his pleasure by which the reversion to the state was defeated and the common stock in so far diminished it was also usual to release such land from all the dues which had previously been rendered from it and to make it absolutely free with the exception of the three services which were inevitably incident to all landed procession these estates were always granted by book or charter and hence bore the name of Bokland, and it is questionable whether the two descriptions did not at a very early period comprise all the land in england as the families of the first allodial possessors died out and their possessions either reverted to the state or became alienated under circumstances which included them in the category of Bokland. 
we learn that the pretext upon which these conversions of folkland into bokeland were made at first was the erection and endowment of a religious house upon the land by the grantee and we also learn that sometimes the conversion was made the thane presented with the estate but the church or monastery not constructed soon after the introduction of christianity into northumberland it appears indeed to have been customary to grant much greater privileges and immunities to church lands than were found advisable at a later period or then seem to have been permitted in the provinces south of the humber it stands to reason that there could be no reversion in lands granted to a corporation hence Vokland, which had been presented to a church assumed what may be called a hereditary character and could only lapse by total destruction of the particular body a circumstance which could obviously never be contemplated but which did actually occur during the civil wars internal dissensions and foreign invasions which gradually changed the face of the whole country but the lands which the northumbrian princes devoted to pious purposes were most likely relieved from all burthens whatsoever we have conclusive evidence that even military service was excused in that district before the time of beta in all probability it was not suspected how much the defences of the country might become impaired by grants of the kind the passages already cited from beta's epistle to egbert may be adduced in corroboration of these assertions but we have more direct evidence in his history Asuwu, on his conversion placed his daughter ian fled in the convent presided over by hild and with her he gave twelve estates most likely folkland each state comprising ten hides those twelve boaklands he freed from earthly warfare and earthly service to be employed in heavenly warfare it is very clear that the duties of military service were removed in this case and that religious warfare was to be the destination of those that held the lands similarly when benedict biscop decided upon devoting himself to a monastic life he surrendered his lands to the king these must obviously have been folkland the retaining of which he considered impossible under the circumstances and which not being his own he could not take with him into a monastery and these words of beta clearly show how we are to understand what he says of oswu's grant to whitby the gaining of a hereditary character for lands and especially the relief from heavy dues were advantages which might speedily arouse the avarice and stimulate the invention even of barbarians accordingly those who could gain access to the ear of the king and his baton bought or begged or extorted grants of privileged land which they either converted entirely into private estates or upon which they erected monasteries nominally such and over these which they filled with irregular and often profligate monks they assumed the jurisdiction of abbots with such little advantage to the service of religion that we have seen beta describe them as a public scandal and recommend even the desperate remedy of cancelling by royal and episcopal authority the privilegia or charters on which their immunities reposed to the growing prevalence of this fraud we probably owe it that at least in wessex the custom arose of confiscating land on which the conditions of the grant had not been fulfilled thus Ine called in the lands which skissa had granted to heen the abbot and kill the abbess his sister because no religious buildings had been erected thereon that is as i understand it folkland they had been and folkland they again became but even this did not meet all the exigencies of the case and it therefore probably became necessary even in bokeland granted to the church to reserve the military and other services which the clergy could cause to be performed by their own dependent cultivators or tenants even if they were not compelled to serve themselves a point which is by no means clear a majority of the documents contained in the codex diplomaticus e y saxonici are conversions of folkland into bokeland or confirmations of such conversions they almost universally contain a clause declaring or proclaiming such is the technical word for this important public act by which prince and king elderman and sheriff were at once made strangers to the land the estate free from every burthen save the inevitable three a clause giving the fullest hereditary possession and the power to dispose of it by will at the testator's pleasure and finally a clause stating that this is done by the authority of the king with the advice consent and license of his rattan or counsellors they remain therefore to the last important public acts and are i believe universally to be considered acts of the assembled witena gemote or great council of the nation 
and as by their authority folkland could be converted into bokeland so it appears could the reverse take place and a change in the nature of the two estates is recorded where the king gave five plough lands of folkland for five of bokeland and then made the folkland bokeland the bokeland folkland in this general spoliation it is to be supposed that the kings would not omit to share accordingly we find them causing estates to be booked to them by their baton which estates when thus become their private and heritable property they devise and deal with at their pleasure and indeed as the king's consent was necessary to all such conversions he was much better able to obtain that of his baton in his own case than bishops thanes or others were in their cases these generally found themselves compelled to pay handsomely for the favour they required with respect to ecclesiastical lands we frequently find a loss of very large estates submitted to in order to secure freedom to what remained there are also a few instances in which lands having descended encumbered with payments the owners engage some powerful noble or ecclesiastic to obtain their freedom that is to persuade the baton into abolishing the charges the gratuity offered to the member whose influence was to carry these ancient private acts of parliament is often very considerable towards the closing period of the anglo-saxon polity i should imagine that nearly every acre of land in england had become bokeland and that as in consequence of this there was no more room for the expansion of a free population the condition of the free men became depressed while the estates of the lords increased in number and extent in this way the curlers or free cultivators gradually vanished yielding to the ever-growing force of the noble class accepting a dependent position upon their bokeland and standing to write in their courts instead of their own old county commodus while the lords themselves ran riot dealt with their once free neighbours at their own discretion and filled the land with civil dissensions which not even the terrors of a foreign invasion could still nothing can be more clear than that the universal breaking up of society in the time of ethelred had its source in the ruin of the old free organization of the country the successes of sweggen and Canut, and even of william the norman had much deeper causes than the mere gain or loss of one or more battles a nation never falls till the citadel of its moral being has been betrayed and become untenable northern invasions will not account for the state of brigandage which ethelred and his baton deplore in so many of their laws the ruin of the free cultivators and the overgrowth of the lords are much more likely causes at the same time it is even conceivable that but for the invasions of the ninth and tenth centuries the result which i have described might have come upon us more suddenly the sword and the torch plague pestilence and famine are very effectual checks to the growth of population and sufficient for a long time to adjust the balance between the land and those it has to feed an estate of bokeland might be subject to conditions it was perhaps not always easy to obtain from the baton all that avarice desired accordingly we sometimes find limitations in grants to a certain number of lives with remainders and reversions and it was both law and custom not only that the first acquirer might impose what conditions he pleased upon the descent of the estate but that to all time his expressed will in that respect should bind those who derived their title from him alfred requires his baton who are the guarantees and administrators of his will to see that he has not violated the disposition of his ancestors by leaving lands to women which had been entailed on the male line and vice versa and we have cases of grants solemnly avoided for like want of conformity more questionable in point of principle is the right attempted to be set up by some of these purchasers to bar as sheet and forfeiture of the land upon felony of their heirs or devices it is to be presumed that a tenant of folkland was permitted to let the same upon condition no doubt that he conveyed no estate superior to his own the holders must have been allowed to place poor settlers upon their estates whose rents and services and labour in kind would be important to their own subsistence of course in folkland no limitation could be thought of it was the absolute inheritable property of the purchaser and he could in general dispose of it as freely and as if it were a load itself but there seems no reason to doubt that much the same course was adopted in both descriptions of estate the folkland being held beyond question for term of life at every period of which our history takes cognizance whatever may have been the case at first a portion called the inland or dominum demean 
was reserved for the lord's homestead house and farms and the dwellings of his serfs essens lets and other unfree and poor dependents this was cultivated for him by their industry and he repaid their services by protection food clothing and small perquisites all of which now pass under the general name of wages on the upland and in the forest sometimes his own sometimes subject only to his rights of common they tended his sheep oxen and steeds at the fold or his swine in the mast lying out during the appointed season of the year or within the circuit of his own enclosures they exercised such simple manufactures as the necessities of the household required the spinner and weaver the glove or shoemaker the smith and carpenter were all parts of the family the butter and cheese bread and bacon were made at home the beer was brewed and the honey collected by the household the remainder of the land the owner leased on various conditions to men who had no land demanding in return for that commodity indispensable in a country which has not yet learnt to manufacture rents paid in kind in labour and even in money this labour rent yet called robo in slavonic countries as well as the other dues naturally varied in various districts partly with the importance of land to the cultivator and the value of its produce to the owner and at last political motives may have had some weight when the number and condition of a man's dependence might affect his own influence and position in the state but in general we shall be justified in saying that land was very valuable and the conditions on which it was to be obtained harsh and onerous such land whether in large or in small portions whether at least on long or short terms large or small rents was called by the common name of lent or loan it was considered to be lent and where the lane was on folkland it is obvious that no certain time could be assigned and that the after-tenant could have only a tenancy at will in any case it was reasonable that misconduct in the holder which would have entailed upon him the forfeiture of his own real property should not be permitted to interfere with the rights of the reversioner lend land therefore could not be taken from the owner for the crime of the tenant in the year nine hundred a certain helmstan was guilty of theft and the sheriff seized all his chattels to the king and ord laugh entered upon the land because it was his land that helmstan sat on that he could not forfeit a similar principle prevailed in grants for lives especially where ecclesiastical corporations were the granters and reversioners and which though to a certain extent they conveyed estates of bokeland gave strictly speaking lend or beneficiary tenures but as the clergy were not always quite sure of meeting with fair treatment we find them not unfrequently introducing into their instruments a provision that no forfeiture shall be valid against their rights this from the great strictness with which the provisions of a book or charter were always construed and in general from the fear of violating what had been confirmed by the signature of the cross and the threat of eternal punishment may have had some effect in such cases it may be presumed that the guilt of the grantee entirely cancelled the grant the remaining lives if any losing the advantage which they had derived through the grantee forfeiture really taking effect but for the benefit of the grantor not the civil power the tenant of lenland who by his services acquired the good will of the lord might hope to have his tenure improved if not into an absolute possession of bokeland yet into one for his own or more lives in a translation of st augustine of hippo's soliquia attributed like so many other things to alfred of wessex there occurs this passage but it pleaseth every man when he hath built himself some cottage upon his lord's land with his assistant for a while to take up his rest thereon and hunt and fowl and fish and in divers ways provide for himself upon the land by both sea and land until the time when by his lord's compassion he can earn a bokeland and eternal inheritance and instances occur in more formal documents in nine seventy seven oswald archbishop of york and bishop of worcester made a grant of three hides at tendingdom for three lives to edric his thane with reversion to worcester now there are three hides of this land which archbishop oswald booketh to edric his thane both near town and from town even as he before held them as land land in another grant of the same prelate between nine seventy two to nine ninety two made to his client elfsidge of a dwelling in worcester city for three lives he adds also we write or book to him the croft appurtenant to that tenement which lies to the east of wolfsig's croft 
that he may hold it in as large measure for Bokeland as he before held it for Lenland. In nine seventy seven the same convent at Worcester booked three hides for three lives to the monk Winsig, even as his father had held them, and in nine seventy eight to nine ninety two they gave to Goding the priest also for three lives the tenement which he himself had without the city gate in both these cases len appears to have been converted into a state for successive lives where there was len there could properly be no book because the possession of the charter itself was prima facie evidence indeed nearly conclusive evidence in favour of the holder hence where from any circumstance the books were withheld the tenant had only a len this was the case with helmstan's estates mentioned above he had deposited his charters with ordlaff as a security on an occasion when this duke helped him to make oath to some property on helmstan's felony ordlaff seized the land to himself and the document from which we learn this is obviously his appeal to alfred's son and successor against an attempt to disturb helmstan's original title under a judgment given by alfred nor was it unusual for books to be thus retained as securities by which the tenant having only a len could be evicted if not at pleasure at least by legal process and the same remarks apply to a very common mode of disposing of estates where the clergy were grantees either to avoid litigation with justly exasperated heirs or to escape from the commands of various synods the clergy used to take deeds of gift from living tenants impounding the books of course and leaving the life interest only to the owner such an estate in technical latin was named praestaria but it was obviously a len and was generally charged with recognitory payments it may not be uninteresting before i close this chapter to give some examples of the gaffel or rent paid upon lands whether held for lives or as more strictly land land they are extremely valuable from the insight they give into the details of social life and the daily habits of our forefathers twenty hides of land at sempringham were leased by peterborough to wolfred for two lives on a condition of his getting his freedom and that of sleaford both in lincolnshire upon this estate the following yearly rent was reserved first to the monastery two tons of bright ale two oxen fit for slaughter two mitan or measures of welsh ale and six hundred loaves secondly to the abbot's private estate one horse thirty shillings of silver or half a pound one night's past us fifteen matan of bright and five of welsh ale fifteen sesters of mild ale a little earlier oswulf a duke in kent devised lands to christ church canterbury which he charged with annual doles to the poor upon his anniversary forty hides at stan hempstead were to find one hundred and twenty loaves of wheat thirty loaves of fine wheat one fat ox and four sheep two flitches of bacon five geese ten hens and ten pounds of cheese if it fell on a fast day however there was to be instead of the meat a whey of cheese and fish butter eggs ad libitum moreover thirty ambers of good welsh ale on the footing of fifteen matan and one mitta of honey perhaps to make into a drink or two of wine from his land at burnham were to issue one thousand loaves and one thousand raised loaves or cakes and the monks themselves were to find one hundred and twenty more of the latter Very hard gave to jugga or geoc of land to canterbury the rent of one at lambaham was forty pences ways of cheese or an equivalent in lambs and wool the other at northwood rendered one hundred and twenty measures which the english call ambers of salt loof in eight thirty two charged the inheritors and assigns of her land at mundlingham with the following yearly payment to canterbury for ever that is to say sixty ambers of malt one hundred and fifty loaves fifty white loaves one hundred and twenty alms loaves one ox one hog and four weathers two ways of bacon and cheese one mitta of honey ten geese and twenty hens in eight thirty five abba a reeve in kent charged his heirs with a yearly payment to folkestone of fifty ambers of malt six ambers of groats ruda three ways of bacon and cheese four hundred loaves one ox and six sheep besides an allowance or stipend in money to the priests and ere geth his wife further burthened her land at challoch with payments to canterbury amounting to thirty ambers of ale three hundred loaves fifty of them white one way of bacon and cheese one old ox four weathers and one hog 
or six weather six geese and ten hens one sister of honey one of butter and one of salt and if her anniversary should fall in winter she added thirty wax lights in nine o two bishop denewolf leased fifteen hides of church land at elbesburn to his relative born wolf for forty five shillings a year with liberty to born wolf's children to continue the lease one shilling sixty of which went to the pound is so very small a rent for ten acres that we must either suppose the land to have been unusually bad or burn wolf's connection with the bishop much in his favour he was also to aid in syric boat and pay the syric skit about the same time then a wolf leased forty hides at alisford to one alfred at the old rent of three pounds per annum or four shillings and a half per hide he was however also to pay church shot the amount of which is not stated and to do church shot work and find men to the bishops reaping and hunting between nine o one and nine o nine king edward booked twenty hides of land to bishop dunnerwolf the payments reserved have been already mentioned instead of going to the king as guyful or rent they were to be expended in an anniversary feast on founder's day i have already stated that this may be the old charge on folk land it was a grant from the monks to the bishop probably negotiated by edward all parties were satisfied the monks probably got from the land as much as they could expect from any other tenant or what if folk land they would themselves have had to pay the bishop got the land into his own hands to dispense of at his pleasure and the king was rewarded for intervention with all the benefits to be derived on his anniversary from the prayers of the grateful fathers at winchester at the close of the ninth century where firth bishop of worcester claimed land under the following circumstances millred a previous bishop had granted an estate in sopbury on condition that it was to be always held by a clergyman and never by a layman and that if no clergyman could be found in the grantee's family it should revert to the see by degrees the family of the grantee established themselves in the possession but without performing the condition at length where firth impleted their chief edneth who admitted the wrong and promised to find a clergyman the family however all refused to enter into holy orders had not then obtained the intercession of ethelred duke of mercia the lady ethel fled and ethel nod duke of somerset and by their persuasion where frith in defiance of his predecessor's charter sold the land to Ednoth for forty mancuses reserving a yearly rent of fifteen shillings and a vestment or perhaps some kind of hanging to be delivered at the episcopal manor of tetbury eldworth bishop of worcester leased forty acres of land in a fishery for three lives to leo Fenneth, on condition that they delivered yearly fifteen salmon and those good ones too during the bishop's residence in worcester on ash wednesday edric Gaffled, Gaffled, that is paid yearly rent or gaffle for two hides with half a pound or thirty shillings and a gare a word i do not understand in eight thirty five the abbess sinnaware gave land to hun bert a duke on condition that he paid a gablum or gaffle or rent of three hundred shillings in lead yearly to christchurch canterbury the careless or dependent freemen who were settled upon the land of hurstborn in the days of alfred had the following rents to pay many of these are labour rents many rise out of the land itself these are part of the produce from each hide at the autumnal equinox forty pence further they were to pay six church mitten of ale and three cesters or horse loads of white wheat out of their own time they were to plough three acres and sow them with their own seed to house the produce to pay three pounds of gaffle barley to mow half an acre of gaffle mead and stack the hay to split four father four loads of gaffo wood and stack it to make sixteen rods of gaffo hedging at easter they were further to pay two ewes and lambs two young sheep being held equivalent to one old one these they were to wash and shear out of their own time lastly every week they were to do any work which might be required of them except during the three weeks at christmas easter and gang days the following customs and payments are recorded in various manners in Diddenham, there are thirty hides nine of these are inland demean twenty-one are let in strat are twelve hides twenty-seven yards of gaffel land and on the severn there are thirty kit wares in middleton are five hides fourteen yards of gaffel land fourteen kit 
wirus on the severn and two hay wirus on the way at kingston there are five hides thirteen yards of gaffaland and one hide above the ditch which is now also gaffaland and that without the ham is still in part inland in part let out on rent to the ship whalers to kingston belong twenty-one kit wirus on the severn and twelve on the way in bishop stun are three hides and fifteen sit wirus on the way in la Cowet are three hides two heck wirus on the way and two sit wirus throughout that land each yard land pays twelve pence and four alms pence at every weir within the thirty hides every second fish belongs to the landlord besides every uncommon fish worth having sturgeon or porpoise herring or sea-fish and no one may sell any fish for money when the lord is on the land until he have had notice of the same in Didenham, the services are very heavy the geniat must work on the land or off the land as he is commanded and ride and carry lead load and drive drove and do many things beside the gibber must do his rights he must plough half an acre for week work and himself pay the seed in good condition into the lord's barn for church shot at all events from his own barn towards verbolt forty large trees or one load of rods or eight geosu build three ebon close a field enclosure fifteen rods or let him ditch fifteen and let him ditch one rod of burg enclosure reap an acre and a half mow half an acre work at other works ever according to their nature let him pay sixpence after easter half a sester of honey at lamas six sesters of malt at martimus one clue of good net yarn in the same land it is customary that he who hath seven swine shall give three and so forth always the tenth and nevertheless pay for common of masting if mass there be unquestionably these are heavy dues and much aggravated by the circumstances of the estate or yard land being but small the tenant born free and some of the services uncertain i shall conclude this chapter with a few lines the genayat right is various according to the custom of the land in some places he must pay lang and a grass swine yearly ride and carry lead load work and feed his lord reap and mow hew deer hedge and hold sete build and enclose the burr or mansion make new roads to the farm pay church shot and alms fee hold headward and horseward go on errand far or near whithersoever he is directed this is comparatively free and it is only to be regretted that we do not know what amount of land in general could be obtained at such a rent we next come to the castellan whom alfred in a passage already cited states to be on land land and who are obviously poor freemen suffered to settle on the lord's estate the cot settlers right is according to the custom in some places he must work for the lord every monday throughout the year or three days every week in harvest he need pay no langafole he ought to have five acres more if it be the custom and if it be less it is all too little for his service is often called upon he must pay his hearth penny on holy thursday as it behooves every free man to do and he must acquit his lords inland on summons at seaward and at the king's deer hedge and at such things as are in his competence and let him pay his church shot at martinmas the customs of the geber are very various in some places they are heavy but in some moderate in some places it is usual that he shall do two days week work whatever work may be commanded him every week throughout the year and three days week work in harvest and three from candlemas to easter if he carries he need not work himself as long as his horse is out he must pay at michaelmas ten gaffold pence and at martinmas twenty-three sesters of barley and two hens at easter one young sheep or two pence and he shall lie out from martinmas till easter at the lord's fold and from the time when the plough is first put in till martinmas he shall plough one acre every week and make ready the seed in the lord's barn moreover three acres on request and two of grass ploughing if he require more grass let him earn it on such conditions as he may for his rent ploughing he shall plough three acres and sow them from his own barn and pay his hearth penny and two and two shall feed one stag hound and each gabour shall give six loaves to the in swan that is the swain or swineherd of the demesne when he drives his herds to the mast in the same land where these conditions prevail the gabour has a right towards first stocking his land to receive two oxen one cow and six sheep and seven acres in his yard of land ready stone 
after the first year let him do all the customs which belong to him and he is to be supplied with tools for his work and furniture for his house when he dies let his lord look after what he leaves this land law prevails in some lands but as i have said in some places it is heavier in others lighter seeing that the customs of all lands are not alike in some places the gabur must pay honey gaffle in some meat gaffle in some ale gaffle let him that holds the shire take heed to know always what is the old arrangement about the land and what the custom of the country i can only add the expression of my opinion that a careful study of the condition of the peasantry in the eastern parts of europe will assist in throwing much light upon these ancient social arrangements in this country hard as in some respects the condition of the dependent free man appears it must be borne in mind that the possession of land was indispensably necessary to life unless he was to become an absolute serf in a country that has little more manufacture than the simple necessities of individual households require no wealth of raw material and consequently little commerce where households rejoice in a sort of self-supporting self-sufficient autonomy and the means of internal communication are imperfect land and its produce are the only wealth land is the only means whereby to live but the saxon peasant knew his position it was a hard one but he bore it he worked early and late but he worked cheerfully and amidst all his toils there is no evidence of his ever having shot at his landlord from behind a stone wall or a hedge End of chapter eleven book one chapter twelve part one of saxons in england by john mitchell campbell this librivox recording is in the public domain heathendom an account of the saxons which should entirely exclude the peculiarities of their heathendom would be deficient in an important degree religion and law are too nearly allied particularly in early periods for us to neglect either in the consideration of national institutions the immediate dependence of one upon the other we may not be able to show in satisfactory detail but we may be assured that the judicial forms are always in near connection with the cult and that this is especially the case at times when the judicial and priestly functions are in the hands of the same class the saxons were not without a system of religion long before they heard of christianity nor should we be justified in asserting that religion to have been without moral influence upon the individual man in his family and social relations who shall dare to say high-thoughted barbarian did not derive comfort in affliction or support in difficulty from the belief that the gods watched over him that he did not bend in gratitude for the blessings they conferred that he was not guided and directed in the daily business of life by the conviction of his responsibility to higher powers than any which he recognized in the world around him there has been and yet is religion without the pale of christianity however dim and meagre and unsatisfactory that religion may appear to us whom the mercy of god has blessed with the true light of the gospel long before their conversion all the germanic nations had established polities and states upon an enduring basis upon principles which still form the groundwork and stablest foundation of the greatest empires of the world upon principles which far from being abrogated by christianity harmonize with its purest precept they who think states accidental and would eliminate providence from the world may attempt to reconcile this truth with their doctrine of barbarism to us be it permitted to believe that in the scheme of all an all-wise and all-pervading mercy one condition here below may be the fitting preparation for a higher and that even paganism itself may sometimes be only as the twilight through which the first rays of the morning sun are dimly descried in their progress to the horizon without religion never was yet state founded which could endure for ages the permanence of our own is the most convincing proof of the strong foundations on which the massive fabric from the first was reared the business of this chapter is with the heathendom of the saxons not that portion of it which yet subsists among us in many of our most cherished superstitions some of which long lurked in the ritual of the unreformed church and may yet lurk in the habits and belief of many protestants 
but that which was the acknowledged creed of the saxon as it was of other germanic populations which once had priests and altars a ritual and ceremonies temples and sacrifices and all the pomp and power of a church establishment the proper subjects of mythological inquiry are the gods and godlike heroes it is through the latter for the most part forms of the gods themselves that a race connects itself with the former among the nations of our race royalty is indeed e jure do we know for the ruling families are indirect genealogical descent from divinity and the possession of woden's blood was the indispensable condition of kingship in our peculiar system the vague records of tuisco the earth-born god and man the origin and founders of the race have vanished the mystical cosmogony of scandinavia has left no traces among us but we have nevertheless a mythological scheme which probably yielded neither in completeness nor imaginative power to those of the german or the norwegian in the following pages i propose to take into consideration first the gods and goddesses properly so called secondly the monsters or titanic powers of our old creed thirdly the intermediate and as it were ministerial beings and lastly the god-born and heroic personages of the epopoeia the prudence or the contempt of the earliest saxon christians has left but sparing record of what augustine and his brother missionaries overthrew incidental notices indeed are all that remain in any part of teutonic europe and on the continent as well as in england it is only by the collation of minute and isolated facts often preserved to us in popular superstitions legends and even nursery tales that we can render probable the prevalence of a religious belief identical in its most characteristic features with that which we know to have been entertained in scandinavia yet whatsoever we can thus recover proves that in all main points the faith of the island saxons was that of their continental brethren it will readily be supposed that the task of demonstrating this is not easy the early period at which christianity triumphed in england adds to the difficulties which naturally beset the subject norway sweden and denmark had entered into public relations with the rest of europe long before the downfall of their ancient creed here the fall of heathendom and the commencement of history were contemporaneous we too had no iceland to offer a refuge to those who fled from the violent course of a conversion preached sword in hand and coupled with the loss of political independence still the progress of the new faith seems to have been on the whole easy and continuous amongst us and though apostasy was frequent history either had no serious struggle to record or as wisely and prudently concealed it in dealing with this subject we can expect but little aid from the usual sources of information the early chroniclers who lived in times when heathendom was even less extinct than it is now and before it had learnt to hide itself under borrowed names would have shrunk with horror from the mention of what to them was an execrable impiety many of them could have possessed no knowledge of details which to us would be invaluable and no desire to become acquainted with them the whole business of their life on the contrary was to destroy the very remembrance of that such things had been to avoid everything that could recall the past or remind their half-converted neophytes of the creed which they and their forefathers had held it is obvious that under such circumstances the greater and more powerful the god the more dangerous would he continue to be the more sedulously would all mention of him be avoided by those who had relinquished his service or overthrown his altars but though this may be the case with the principal deities there are others whose power though unacknowledged is likely to be more permanent long after the former renunciation of a public and national paganism the family and household gods retained a certain habitual influence and continue often under other names nay perhaps engrafted on another creed to inform the daily life of a people who are still unconsciously acted upon by ancient national feelings a spell or a popular superstition may yet recall some traces of the old belief even as the heathen temple when purified with holy water and dedicated in another name retained the holiness which had at first been attached to the site of its foundation what paulus diaconus jonas of babio jornandus adam of bremen alcuin widow kent and the monks of st gall assert of other german races beta asserts of the anglo-saxons also 
fees that they worshipped idols idola simulacra de orum and this he affirms not only upon the authority of his general informants and of unbroken tradition but of gregory himself upon the same authority also he tells us that the heathen were wont to sacrifice many oxen to their gods to beta himself we owe the information that heretha and estra two saxon goddesses gave their names to two of the months that at a certain season cattle were vowed and at another season cakes were offered to the gods from him also we learn that upon the death of saborth in essex his sons restored the worship of idols in that kingdom that edwini of northumberland offered thanks to his deities for the safe delivery of his queen that red walt of east anglia sacrificed victims to his gods that on occasion of a severe pestilence the people of essex apostatized and returned to their ancient worship till reconverted by jeroman under whose teachings they destroyed or deserted the fanes and altars they had made that incantations and spells were used against sickness that certain runic charms were believed capable of breaking the bonds of the captive that eosentbert of kent was the first to completely put down heathendom in his kingdom and destroyed the idols lastly that at the court of edwini of northumberland there was a chief priest and as we may naturally infer from this an organized heathen hierarchy the penitentials of the church and the acts of the Wattina Gemotes are full of prohibitions directed against the open or secret practice of heathendom from them we learn that even till the time of canute the worship and tree worship the sanctification of places spells filters and witchcraft were still common enough to call for legislative interference and the heavy doom of banishment proclaimed against their upholders proves how deeply rooted such pagan customs were in the minds of the people still in the ecclesiastical history of beta in the various works which in later times were founded upon it and continued it in the penitentials and confessionals of the church in the acts of the secular assemblies we look in vain for the sacred names in which the fanes were consecrated or for even the slightest hint of the attributes of the gods whose idols or made images had been set up excepting the cursory mention of the two female deities already noticed and one or two almost equally rapid allusions in later chronicles we are left almost entirely without direct information respecting the tenets of the saxon pantheon there are however other authorities founded on traditions more ancient than beta himself from which we derive more copious if not more definite accounts first among these are the genealogies of the anglo-saxon kings these contain a multitude of the ancient gods reduced indeed into family relations and entered in the grades of a pedigree but still capable of identification with the deities of the north and of germany in this relation we find woden beldag geat wig and freya the days of the week also did dedicated to gods supply us further with the names of tu Thanur, Frick, and Seter, and the names of places in all parts of england attest the wide dispersion of their worship these as well as the names of plants are the admitted signs by which we recognize the appellations of the teutonic gods one woden in old norse othen in old german wotan the royal family of every anglo-saxon kingdom without exception traces its descent from woden through some one or other of those heroes or demigods who are familiar to us in the german and scandinavian traditions but the divinity of woden is abundantly clear he is both in form and in fact identical with the norse othen and the german wotan the supreme god of all the northern races whose divinity none will attempt to dispute nor was this his character unknown to our early chroniclers malmesbury speaking of hengist and horse says they were the great-great-grandsons of that most ancient woden from whom the royal families of almost all the barbarous nations derive their lineage whom the nations of the angles madly believing to be a god have consecrated unto him the fourth day of the week and the sixth unto his wife freya by a sacrilege which lasts even unto this day matthew of westminster and geoffrey of monmouth repeat this with characteristic variations both adding apparently in the words of tacitus ethelward an anglo-saxon norbelman of royal blood and thus himself a descendant of woden had previously stated the same thing after the fashion of his own age the tenth century he says of hengist and horse 
that they were descended from woden according to him woden was worshipped as the giver of victory and as the god of warlike valor and such is the description given by adam of bremen of the same god at upsala in sweden for the heathen woden wrought the sin of idolatry but the glorious almighty god the spacious skies and an early missionary is described to have thus taught his hearers is the god of power and fire to woden was dedicated the fourth or midday of the week and it still retains his name this among other circumstances tend to the identification of him with mercurius the old norse runa tala thater which introduces Othin, declaring himself to be the inventor of runes is confirmed by the assertion of the dialogue of salomon and saturn which is to the question who invented letters answers i tell thee mercury the giant that is woden the god and this is further evidence of resemblance a metrical homily in various collections bearing the attractive title de falsus dies supplies us with further proof of this identification not only with woden but with the norse Othin. a man there was called mercury during life who was very fraudulent and deceitful in deeds and eke loved thefts and deception him the heathen made a powerful god for themselves and by the roadsides made him offerings and upon high hills brought him sacrifice this god was honourable among all the heathen and he is called odin by another name in danish the fourth day they gave for their advantage to the aforesaid mercury their great god thus we have mercurius woden and Othin sufficiently identified a careful investigation of the inner spirit of greek mythology has led some very competent judges to see a form of hermes in odysseus this view derives some corroboration from the teutonic side of the question and the relation in which woden stands to mercurius even tacitus had learnt that ulixes had visited germany and there founded a town which he called Askebergium and without insisting on the probability that Askebergium grew out of a german and Seoperk, or a scandinavian Asgard, it seems not unreasonable to suppose that some tales of woden had reached the ears of the roman which seemed to him to resemble the history of odysseus and his wanderings such a tale we yet possess in the adventures of thorkill on his journey to utgard de loki narrated by saxo grammaticus which bears a remarkable likeness to some parts of the odyssey and when we consider saxo's very extraordinary mode of rationalizing ancient mythological traditions we shall admit at least the probability of an earlier version of the tale which would be much more consonant with the suggestion of tacitus although this earlier form has unfortunately not survived woden is like odysseus preeminently the wanderer he is gangrider Granglary, the restless moving deity even the cloak hood or hat in which Othin is always clad reminds us both of the patasus of hermes and the broad hat which odysseus generally wears on ancient gems and pottery that woden was worshipped at wegbega jaletum and that he was the peculiar patron of boundaries again recalls to us this function of hermes when we hear that offerings were brought to him upon the lofty hills we are reminded that there was a mountain hermes too though little known and perhaps as little known as his mountain brother answers to the warlike victory-giving deity of our forefathers in his favourite form from the godlike or heroic sons of woden descend all the races qualified to reign and some of those whose names are found in the anglo-saxon genealogies may be easily recognised in the mythological legends of the continent in some one or other of his forms he is the eponymous of tribes and races thus as geat or rather gate he was the founder of the gates through Jewess of the jewesses through skilled of the skildings at the norse skoldunger through brand of the brandigus perhaps through batwa of the batavians it seems indeed not wholly improbable that every name in the merely mythical portion of the genealogies represents some particular tribe under the distinctive appellation of its tutelar god or hero and that we may thus be led in some degree to a knowledge of the several populations which coalesce to form the various kingdoms legends describing the adventures of woden either in a godlike or heroic form were probably not wanting here or in germany it is only in scandinavia that a portion of these have been preserved unless the tales of gayat and Sketh to be hereafter noticed are in reality to be referred to him 
equally probable is it that he had in this country temples images and religious rites traces of which we find upon the continent and that trees animals and places were consecrated to him so numerous indeed are the latter so common in every part of england are names of places compounded with his name that we must admit his worship to have been current throughout the island it seems impossible to doubt that in every quarter there were localities usually rising ground either dedicated to him or supposed to be under his especial protection and thus that he was here as in germany the supreme god whom the saxons franks and alamans concurred in worshipping the following names of places may all be unhesitatingly attributed to this cause and they attest the general recognition and wide dispersion of woden's influence wanborough formerly wodensborough in surrey latitude fifty one degrees fourteen minutes north longitude thirty eight minutes west placed upon the watershed which throws down streams to north and south and running from east to west divides the county surrey into two nearly equal portions once perhaps two petty kingdoms the range of hills now called the hog's back it is a little to the north of the ridge nearly on the summit the springs of water are peculiarly pure and never freeze in all probability it has been in turn a sacred site for every religion that has been received in britain wanborough formerly woden's bar in wiltshire latitude fifty one degrees thirty three minutes north longitude one degree forty two minutes west about three and a half miles southeast of swindon placed upon the watershed which throws down the ice to the north and kennet to the south wodenesborough formerly wodenesborough in kent latitude fifty one degrees sixteen minutes north longitude one degree twenty nine minutes east throwing down various small streams to north and south into the stour and the sea wanston probably wodenestan in hampshire latitude fifty one degrees ten minutes north longitude one degree twenty minutes west from which small streams descend to north and south into the test and itchen wambrook probably wodensbrock in dorsetshire wampool probably wadnespole in cumberland wansford probably wodensford in northamptonshire wansford in the east riding of yorkshire wanstead probably wodensted an old roman station in essex wanstrow formerly wodenstrow in somerset wanborough or warnborough formerly wodensborough two parishes in hampshire wimbury formerly wodensborough in devonshire wonersh probably wodenshires a parish at the foot of the hogs back a few miles from wanborough wans dyke formerly woden's dyke an ancient dyke or fortification perhaps the boundary between different kingdoms it extended in a direction from east to west through more than one of our southern counties it remains are visible three or four miles west southwest of malmesbury and wiltshire and it crosses the northern part of somerset from the neighbourhood of bath to portshead on the bristol channel where it ends in latitude fifty one degrees twenty nine minutes north longitude two degrees forty seven minutes west in addition to these references which might be made far more numerous if necessary we have many instances in the boundaries of charters of trees stones and posts set up in woden's name and apparently with the view of giving a religious sanction to the divisions of land in this as in other respects we find a resemblance to hermes it is also to be borne in mind that many hills or other natural objects may in fact have been dedicated to the sky though bearing more general names as osborough god's shill and so forth one of the names of odin in the old norse mythology is osk which by an etymological law is equivalent to the german wunsch the anglo-saxon wisk and the english wish grimm has shown in the most convincing manner that wunsch may be considered as a name of wutan in germany and it is probable that wusk or wisk may have had a similar power here among the names in the mythical genealogies we find wisk freya the lord of the wish and i am even inclined to the belief that oisk equivalent to esk the founder of the kentish line of kings may be a judish name of woden in this form esk or in an earlier form oski that is wunsch wisk in devonshire to this day all magical or supernatural dealings go under the common name of wishness can this have any reference to woden's name wisk so again a bad or unfortunate day is a wished day perhaps a diabolical heathen accursed day 
there are several places which appear to be compounded with this name among them wishanger wishangra or woden's meadow one about four miles southwest of wanborough in surrey and another near gloucester wisley wisclea also in surrey wisborough probably wiskbar in sussex wishford probably wiskford in wiltshire to thunor in old norse thor in old german donar the recognition of thonar in england was probably not very general at first the settlement of danes and norwegians in the ninth and following centuries may have extended it in the northern districts but though his name is not found in the genealogies of the kings there was an antecedent probability some traces of his worship would be found among the saxons thunar is one of the gods whom the saxons of the continent were called upon to renounce and a total abnegation of his authority was not to be looked for even among a race who considered woden as the supreme god that the fifth day of the week was called by his name is well known thursday is thunris deg dius jovis and he is the proper representative of jupiter inasmuch as he must be considered in the light of the thundering god an elemental deity powerful over the storms as well as the fertilizing rains his peculiar weapon the mace or hammer seems to denote the violent crashing thunderbolt and the norse myth represents it as continually used against the giants or elemental gods of the primal world in a composition whose antiquity it is impossible to ascertain we may still discover an allusion to this point in the christian ragna rock or twilight of the gods it was believed that a personal conflict would take place between the divinity and the devil the emissary and child of satan in the course of this conflict it is said the thunder will thresh it with the fiery axe inclined to a similar allusion in the exeter book where the lightning is called regna gistus wapen the weapon of afghan thor the carborn god thunder the names of places which retain a record of thunar are not very numerous but some are found among them thundersfield dunresfeld in surrey thundersley thunreslea in essex near saffron walden thundersley thunreslea also in essex near raleigh and others in hampshire near wanborough in surrey is thursley which may have been a thunreslea also it is unlikely that it was ever thorislea from thor the norse form of thunar but it might have been thurslea the meadow of the giant or monster very near thursday is a hill called thunder hill probably thunrus hill a similar uncertainty hangs over thurley in bedfordshire thurlow in essex thursby in cumberland thursfield in staffordshire and thursford in norfolk the name of thunar was to the best of my knowledge never borne by any man among the anglo-saxons which is in some degree an evidence of its high divinity the only apparent exception to this assertion is found in an early tale which bears throughout such strong marks of a mythical character as to render it probable that some legend of thunor was current in england especially as its locality is among the judish inhabitants of kent according to this account egbert the son of Egbert, the fourth christian king of kent had excluded his cousins from the throne and fearing their popularity determined on removing them by violence the thane thunor divined and executed the intentions of his master under the king's own throne were the bodies concealed but a light from heaven which played about the spot revealed the crime the king paid to their sister the vir guilt of the slain princes a hind let loose to find the bounties of the grant which was to make compensation for the murder forty-eight hides of land thus became the property of dom neva and the repentant king erected upon them a monastery the assassin thunor however added to his guilt a still higher atrocity of sneering at the king's repentance and its fruits the earth suddenly opened beneath his feet and swallowed him while the church placed the names of his victims ethelred and ethelbert on the list of its martyrs any comment upon this as a historical transaction would be perfectly superfluous but it may possibly contain some allusion of a mythological nature for it seems that the very fact of thuner's not being a god generally worshipped in england would render him likely to form the foundation of heroic stories i will not absolutely say that the dragon slaughter of beowulf is a direct reference to the myth of thunor though this is possible 
another hero of anglo-saxon tradition bears the name of the wandering wolf he slew five-and-twenty dragons at daybreak on degred and fell dead from their poison as thor does after slaying midgard's orm and beowulf after his victory over the fire drake the wolf however is a sacred beast of woden and these names of wandering wolf merk wolf etc may have some reference to him especially as we learn from grimm that in some parts of denmark the wild huntsman who is unquestionably woden bears the name of the flying markolf the heathen character of the whole relation is proved by the fact of the famous sailor on the sea the wandering wolf being represented as the friend of nibrand probably nimrod one of the names by which thunar is known in germany is hamar which was perhaps originally derived from his weapon this has become almost synonymous with devil perhaps the same allusion lurks in one or two names of places in england in the immediate neighbourhood of thursley in surrey and at a short distance from thunderhill are some ponds known by the name of the hammer ponds it is remarkable that within two or three miles of thursley and the hammer ponds three singular natural mounds which form most conspicuous objects upon a very wild and desert heath should bear the name of the devil's jumps while at a short distance a deep valley is known by that of the devil's punch bowl probably at some early period the devil's cup thunderous cup or the hammer cup the word hammerden occurs in the boundaries of charters and other places recall the same name thus hammeringham in lincoln hammerton in huntingdon homertown in middlesex hardly hammersmith in middlesex hammerton green in yorkshire hammerton kirk in yorkshire hammerwick in staffordshire to we the old norse tire and old german zoo the third day of the week bears among us the name of the god to the old norse tire in like manner we find him also giving his name to places in the neighbourhood so often referred to in this chapter and which seems to have been a very pantheon of paganism not far from thursley or from wanborough we find tuesley which i have no scruple to pronounce the ancient teus leo teus leo seems to denote the same name and it is probable that even a race acknowledged this god as its founder the tewingus who gave their name to tewing in hearts tewis mare seems to be the mare or lake of two and in another charter we have also two's thorn which goes far towards substantiating the german form zoo the anglo-saxon glossaries are perfectly accurate when they give the rendering mars for two and tewis steg is rightly dies martis it cannot be doubted that our forefathers worshipped this god as a supreme giver of victory and especially a god of battle in some parts of scandinavia and germany whether or not in england appears doubtful in the mythology of the north he is the bravest of the gods the one who did not scruple to place his hand in the mouth of the wolf fenris when he demanded a pledge that the gods would unbind the chain they had forged for him and on their breach of faith tyr paid the penalty the roman historian tells of the hermunduri having vowed to sacrifice the beaten caddy to mercury and mars by which vow the whole of the horses and men belonging to the defeated force were devoted to slaughter jornandes says the same of the goths and procopius tells the same of the scandinavians norse traditions although they acknowledge othin as the giver of victory are still very explicit as to tyr he is particularly vig agag Beth, deus praeliorum and an especial grantor of success in battle perhaps the ten hectare may be added to the number of those who paid an especial honour to tyr in german zoo since tacitus makes them say so where it is not at all necessary to suppose woden is meant and grimm has good reason to number the suavi among the worshippers of zoo the anglo-saxon runic alphabet which in several letters recalls the names or attributes of the ancient gods uses tear for t the german runes wanting a z equals t apply su there is however another rune similar in shape to the runic t but having the power of ea this bears the name of ear but sometimes also in manuscripts that of tear there are etymological grounds on which the word tear gloria must be connected with two and we are hence led to the supposition that ear may have been another name for that god this gains a great importance when we bear in mind that in some parts of south germany the third day of the week is called not zistag but ertag eretag erectag 
for which we should indeed have expected aristag and when we find in saxon westphalia an undeniably heathen spot called Erisburg, mons martis now mersburg that is Erisburg, the hill of Erse, zu or mars now the anglo-saxon poem on the runic character has something to tell of a severe it says of him ear is a terror to every man when fast and flesh the corpse beginneth to become cold and pale to seek the earth for a consort joy faileth pleasure departeth engagements cease it is clear that ear spica arista will not explain this and we may believe that our forefathers contemplated the personal intervention of some deity whose contact was death this may have been to or ear especially in the battlefield and here he would be equivalent to the characters likewise in homer more than this we shall hardly succeed in rescuing but there yet remains a name to consider which may possibly have tended to banish the more heathen one of two among all the expressions which the anglo-saxons used to denote a violent death none is more frequent than vig fornam or vig gescod in which there is an obvious personality vig war ravished away the doom here no doubt war was represented as personally intervening and slaying as in other similar cases we find the feminines hild guth which are of the same import and the masculines svilt deeth morse the abstract sense which also lay in the word vig and enabled it to be used without offence to christian ears may have been a reason for its general adoption in cases where at an earlier period two would have been preferred old glossaries give us the rendering wig mars as held bellona it is therefore not at all improbable that these words were purposely selected to express what otherwise must have been referred to a god of perilous influence wig was a more general and therefore less dangerous name than two to recall to the memory of a people prone to apostasy that the latter survived in the name of a weekday serves only to show that it was too deeply grounded to be got rid of perhaps its very familiarity in that particular relation rendered it safe to retain the name of any deity as was done by five out of the seven days but christianity was tolerant of heathen names in other than heathen functions and in the genealogy of the kings of wessex wig is the father of jewess the eponymous of the race i have already expressed my belief that this name represented either woden or two and think it very likely that it was the latter inasmuch as the paganism of the jewesses seems to have been remarkable beyond that of other anglo-saxon tribes we find that two enters into the composition of the names of a few plants on the other hand it is never found in the composition of proper names any more than tyr although now tyr bert and tyr wolf would seem quite as legitimate compounds as edbert sigbert edwolf sigwolf freya in old norse freyr in old german fro the god whom the norse mythology celebrates under the name of freyr must have borne among us the name of freya it is probably that he enjoyed a more extensive worship in all parts of europe than we can positively demonstrate at present we are only enabled to assert that the principal seat of his worship was at upsala among the swedes in general there is not much trace in the north of phallic gods but an exception must be made at once in the case of friar one of the most beautiful poems of the edda tells how Freya, a language for desire of the beautiful girder it was for her love that he lost the sword the absence of which brings destruction upon him in the twilight of the gods the strongest evidence of his peculiar character is found in the passage already cited from adam of bremen and what he says of the shape under which freya was represented at upsala the fertilizing rains the life-bringing sunshine the blessings of fruitfulness and peace were the peculiar gifts of freya and from adam of bremen again we learn that he was the god of marriage in his car he travelled through the land accompanied by a choir of young and blooming priestesses and wherever he came plenty and peace abounded the beast sacred to freyr was the boar and it is not improbable that various customs and superstitions connected with this animal may have had originally to do with his worship it is not going too far to assert that the boar's head which yet forms the ornament of our festive tables especially at christmas may have been inherited from heathen days and that the vows made upon it in the middle ages may have had their sanction in ancient paganism but it is as an amulet that we most frequently meet with the boar in anglo-saxon tacitus 
says that there is a relation between freya and the mater deorum now the anglo-saxon poems consider a boar's form or figure so essential a portion of the helmet that they use the word eo for aper for that part of the armour he commanded them to bring in the boar that is helmet the ornament of the head the helmet lofty in battle and still more closely with reference to the virtues of this sign the forms of boars they seemed above the cheeks to bear adorned with gold various and hardened in the fire it held the guard of life but the white helmet guarded the head adorned with treasure set about with lordly sounds as it in days of yore the armourer made wondrously produced set it about with shapes of boars but afterwards neither brand nor war knife might penetrate it grim citing this passage goes so far as even to render freya rosnam by frothonus cygnus and thus connects it at once with freya and we may admit at all events the great plausibility of the suggestion but though distinct proof of freya's worship in england cannot be supplied during the saxon period we have very clear evidence of it still subsisting in the thirteenth century it appears that this priest retained his benefice until his death which happened in a brawl about a year later than the events described above and it is very remarkable that the scandal seems to have been less at the rites themselves than at their being administered by a person of so high a clerical dignity grim identified frere or frowo with liber it will be observed that his train of reasoning is confirmed by the name of liber pater given in the chronicler's recital the union of the needfire with these priapic rites renders it proper to devote a few words to this particular superstition the needfire needfire new german north fewer was called from the mode of its production confrictione de lingness and though probably common to the celts as well as teutons was long and well known to all the germanic races at a certain period all the fires in the village were to be relighted from the virgin flame produced by the rubbing together of wood and in the highlands of scotland and ireland it was usual to drive the cattle through it by way of lustration and as a preservative against disease but there was another curious ceremony connected with the lighting of fires on st john's eve probably from the context on the twenty third of june a general reference for this may be made to grimm's mythology under the general heads of north fewer beale time and johannes fewer an ancient marginal note has bonfires intending to explain the word by the bones burnt on such occasions grimm seems to refer this to the cult of balder or beldag with which he connects the name baltane but taking all the circumstances into consideration i am inclined to attribute it rather to freya if not even to a female form of the same godhead frigja the aphrodite of the north freya seems to have been a god of boundaries probably as the giver of fertility and increase he gradually became looked upon as a patron of the fields on two occasions his name occurs in such boundaries and once in a manner which proves some tree to have been dedicated to him in a charter of the year nine fifty nine we find these words that is freya's tree and in a similar document of the same century we have a boundary running of thone frigdag there is a place yet called Thorpe in yorkshire here frigdag appears to be a formation precisely similar to baldag swefdag and wegdag and to mean only freya himself baldag in old norse balder in old german paltak the appearance of baldag among woden's sons in the anglo-saxon genealogies would naturally lead us to the belief that our forefathers worshipped that god whom the edda and other legends of the north term balder the father of brand and the phoebus apollo of scandinavia yet beyond these genealogies we have very little evidence of his existence it is true that the word baldor very frequently occurs in anglo-saxon poetry as a peculiar appellative of kings nay even as a name of god himself and that it is as far as we know indeclinable a sign of its high in antiquity this word may then probably have obtained a general signification which at first did not belong to it and been retained to represent a king when it had ceased to represent a god there are a few places in which the name of balder can yet be traced thus baldersby in yorkshire balderston in lancashire balderishlea and balderus birth in wiltshire 
of these the two first may very likely have arisen from danish or norwegian influence while the last is altogether uncertain save in the genealogies the name baldeg does not occur at all but there is another name under which the anglo-saxons may possibly have known this god and that is pol or pal End of chapter twelve part one